Chapter One of Rose Mather, A Tale. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Celine Major. Rose Mather, A Tale by Mary Jane Holmes. One the war meeting the long disputed point as to whether the south was in earnest or not was settled and through the northern states the tidings flew that sumter had fallen and the war had commenced with the first gun which boomed across the waters of charleston bay it was ushered in and they who had cried peace peace found at last there was no peace then and not till then did the nation rise from its lethargic slumber and shake off the delusion with which it had so long been bound political differences were forgotten republicans and democrats struck the friendly hand pulse beat to pulse heart throbbed to heart and the watchword everywhere was the union forever throughout the length and breadth of the land were true loyal hearts and as at roderick dhu's command the highlanders sprang to view from every clump of heather on the wild moors of scotland so when the war cry came up from sumter our own highlanders arose a mighty host responsive to the call some from new england's templed hills with hands inured to toil and hearts as strong and true as flint some from the empire some the keystone state and others from the prairies of the distant west it mattered not what place had given them birth it mattered little whether the green mountains of vermont the granite hills of new hampshire or the shadowy forests of wisconsin had sheltered their childhood's home united in one cause they rallied round the stars and stripes and went forth to meet not a foreign foe but alas to raise a brother's arm against another brother's arm in that most dreadful of all anarchies a national civil war in the usually quiet village of rockland the utmost interest was felt and though there as elsewhere were many whose hearts beat as warmly for their southern friends as when the sun shone on a nation at peace all felt the necessity of action and when at last the evening came in which the first war meeting of that place was to be held a dense and promiscuous crowd wended its way to the old brick church whose hallowed walls echoed to the sound of fife and drum strange music for the house of god but more acceptable in that dark hour than songs of praise sung by vain and thoughtless lips in the centre of the church the men were mostly congregated while the seats nearest the door were occupied by the women the wives and mothers and sisters who had come with aching hearts to see their brothers sons and husbands give their signatures to what seemed their sure death warrant conspicuous among these was widow sims whose old-fashioned leghorn with its faded green veil was visible at all public gatherings its broad frill of lace shading a pair of sharp grey eyes and a rather peculiar face it was very white now and the thin lips were firmly compressed as the widow tried to look resolute and unconcerned when two of her sons went forward their faces glowing with youthful enthusiasm as they heard the president repeat their names john sims eli sims the widow involuntarily said it after him her mother's heart whispering within her isaac won't go he's too young i can't give isaac up and her eye wandered to where her youngest boy was sitting twirling his old cloth cap and occasionally exchanging a word with the young man next to him william baker who together with his brother arose to follow john and eli sims scarcely however had they risen to their feet when a woman occupying the same seat with widow sims uttered a cry more like the moaning howl of some wild beast than like a human sound no harry no bill no no and the bony arms were flung wildly toward the two young men who with a dogged indignant glance at her fell back among the crowd where they could not be seen muttering something not very complimentary to the old woman as they called her but the old woman did not hear it and if she had it would have made no difference it mattered not to her that they had ever been the veriest pests in the whole village the planners of every grade of mischief the robbers of barns and plunderers of orchards they were her boys and she didn't want them shot so she continued to moan and cry muttering incoherently about the rich treading down the poor and wondering why judge warner didn't send his own white-fingered sons if he thought going to war was so nice i wouldn't make such a fuss let what would happen to me said the widow sims casting a half contemptuous glance upon the weeping woman whom she evidently considered far beneath her and adding 
they had not sight better be shot than hung as an aside to the young woman just behind her sweet annie graham who was holding fast to her husband's hand as if she would thus keep him in spite of the speaker's eloquent appeals and the whispers of his companions who were urging him to join the company forming so rapidly before the altar there was a terrible struggle going on in annie graham's breast duty to her country and love for her husband waging a mighty conflict the former telling her that if the right would triumph somebody's husband must go and the wife heart crying out yes somebody's husband must go i know but not mine not george very tenderly george graham's strong arm encircled the girlish form and when he saw how fast the tears came to the great dreamy eyes of blue and thought how frail was the wife of little more than a year he bent down until his chin rested on her pale brown hair and whispered softly to her don't annie darling you know i will never go unless you think i ought and give your free consent had george graham wished he could not have chosen a more powerful argument than the words unless you think i ought annie repeated them to herself again and again until consciousness of all else around her was forgotten in that one question of duty she heard no longer the second speaker whose burning eloquence was stirring up hitherto reluctant young men to place their names beside others already pledged to their country's cause leaning forward so that her forehead rested on the railing in front she tried to pray but flesh and strength were weak and the prayer ended always with the unuttered cry i cannot let george go while the fingers twined more and more closely around the broad warm hand which sought a while to reassure her and then was withdrawn from her grasp as george arose and politely offered his seat to a lady who had just arrived and who after glancing an instant at his coat accepted his civility as a matter of course but withheld the thanks she would have accorded to one whom she considered her equal spreading out her wide skirt of rich blue silk so that it nearly covered poor annie she threw her crimson scarf across the railing in front hitting widow sims and so diverting the attention of mrs baker that the latter ceased her crying while the widow turned with an expression half curious half indignant annie too attracted by the heavy fringe and softly blended colours of the scarf a part of which had fallen upon her lap as the widow shook it from her shoulder with a jerk stole a glance at the newcomer in whom she recognised the bride the beauty the envied belle of rockland rose mather from boston and wife of the wealthy and aristocratic william mather who three months before had ended the strife between the rockland ladies as to what fair hand should spend his gold and drive his iron greys by bringing to his elegant mansion a fairy little creature with whose exquisite beauty even the most fastidious could not find fault childish in proportions and perfect in form and feature she would have been handsome without the aid of the dancing brown eyes and chestnut curls which shaded her girlish brow rose knew she was pretty knew she was stylish knew she was fascinating knew she was just then the rage and as such could do and say what she pleased sweeping back her chestnut hair with her snowy hand she gave one rapid glance at the sea of heads around her and then in a half petulant tone exclaimed to her companion i don't believe will is here i can't see him anywhere didn't you know he had enlisted asked a young man who had made his way through the crowd and joined her for an instant the bright colour faded from rose mather's cheek but it quickly returned as she read in mr wentworth's eye a contradiction of his words will enlisted she repeated such people as will don't go to war it's a very different class such for instance as that one going up to sign upon my word it's the boy who saws our wood and she pointed at the youth offering himself up that just such people as rose mather radiant in silks and diamonds and lace might rest in peace at home knowing nothing of war and its attendant horrors save what came to her through the daily prints widow sims heard the remark and with a swelling heart turned toward the boy who sawed rose mather's wood for she knew who it was and it did not need the loud whisper of mrs baker to tell her that it was her boy the youngest of the three the one she loved the best the baby who kept the milk of human kindness from turning quite sour within her breast by his many acts of filial love and his gentle caressing ways how could she give him up her darling her idol the one so like his father dead ere he was born who would comfort her as he had done who would give her the good-night kiss timidly stealthily lest the older ones should see and laugh at his girlish weakness 
who would bring his weekly earnings and empty them slyly into her lap who would find her place in the prayer-book on sunday and pound her clothes on monday long before it was light who would split the nice fine kindlings for the morning fire or bring the cool fresh water in the summer from the farther well and who when her head was aching sadly would make the cup of tea she liked so much homely offices many of them it is true but they made up the sum of that mother's happiness and it is not strange that for a moment the iron will gave way and the poor widow wept over her cruel bereavement not noisily as mrs baker had done but silently bitterly her body trembling nervously and her whole attitude indicative of keen unaffected anguish rose did not know the relationship existing between the widow and the boy who sawed her wood but her better nature was touched always at the sight of distress and for several minutes she did not speak except to tell mr wentworth how much brother tom had paid for the crimson scarf one end of which he was twirling around his wrist to annie it seemed an enormous sum and a little overawed with her close proximity to one who could sport so expensive an article of dress she involuntarily tried to move away and avoid if possible being noticed by the brilliant bell she might have spared herself the trouble for rose was too much absorbed with the group of admirers gathering around her to heed the shrinking figure at her side and after a time as widow sims recovered her composure she resumed her gay badinage bringing in will with every other breath and showing how completely her heart was bound up in her husband notwithstanding the evident satisfaction with which she received the flattering compliments of the gentleman who since her arrival at rockland had made it a point to admire and flirt with the little boston belle laughing loudly at speeches which from one less piquant and attractive would have been pronounced decidedly silly and meaningless rose was not well posted with regard to the object of that meeting she knew that sumter or charleston had been fired upon she hardly could tell which for she was far too sleepy when will read the news to comprehend clearly what it was all about and she had skipped every word which brother tom had written about it in his last letter the one in which she enclosed five hundred dollars for the silver tea-set she saw in rochester and wanted so badly rose was an accomplished musician a tolerable proficient in both french and german and had skimmed nearly all the higher branches but like many fashionably educated young ladies her knowledge of geography comprised a confused medley of cities towns and villages scattered promiscuously over the face of the earth but which was where she could not pretend to tell and were it not that brother tom had spent three winters in charleston leaving at last his fair-haired wife sleeping there beneath the southern sky she would scarcely have known whether the waters of the atlantic or of baffin's bay washed the shore of the palmetto state and still rose was not a fool in the ordinary acceptation of the term she knew as much or more than half the petted bells of modern society and could say smart foolish things with so pretty an air of childishness that even those of her own sex who were at first most prejudiced against her confessed that she was certainly very captivating and possessed the art of making everybody like her even if she hadn't common sense on this occasion she chatted on in her usual style provoking from george graham more than one good-humoured smile at remarks which evinced so much ignorance of the matter then agitating the entire community will wouldn't go to the war of course she said supposing there were one which she greatly doubted northern men particularly those of rockland were so hateful toward the south she didn't believe boston people wore that way at all at least brother tom was not and he knew he had lived in charleston and described them as very nice folks indeed she knew they were herself for she always met them at newport and liked them so much she didn't credit one word of what the papers said she presumed mr anderson provoked them tom knew him personally you have another brother besides tom won't he join the army asked mr wentworth a smile curling the corners of his mouth rose sighed involuntarily for on the subject of that other brother she was a little sore and the mention of him always gave her pain he was not like brother tom the eldest the pride of the carleton family he was jimmy handsome rollicking mischievous jimmy to those who loved him best while to the boston people who knew him best he was that young scapegrace jim carleton destined for the gallows or some other ignominious end a prediction which seemed likely to be verified at the time when he nearly broke a comrade's head for calling him a liar and so was expelled from college covered with disgrace something of this was known to mr wentworth and he asked the question he did just to see what rose would say 
but if he thought she would attempt to conceal anything pertaining to herself or any one else for that matter he was mistaken rose was too truthful for anything like duplicity and she frankly answered we don't know where jimmy is they turned him out of college and then he ran away it's more than a year since we heard from him he was in southern virginia then mother thinks he's dead or he would surely write to some of us and a tear glittered in rose's eyes as she thought of recreant jimmy sleeping elsewhere than in the family vault at beautiful mount auburn rose could not however be unhappy long over what was a mere speculation and after a few moments she resumed the subject of her husband's volunteering she knew he wouldn't if he did vote for lincoln she was not one bit concerned for no man who loved his wife as he ought would want to go and leave her and the little lady stroked her luxuriant curls coquettishly spreading out still wider her silken robe which now completely covered the plain shilling calico of poor annie whose heart for a moment beat almost to bursting as she asked herself if it were true that no man who loved his wife as he ought would want to go and leave her in a moment however she repelled the assertion as false for george had given too many proofs of his devotion for her to doubt him now even though he had expressed a desire to join the army then she wished she was at home where she could not hear what rose mather said and she was about proposing to george that they should leave when mr mather himself appeared and she concluded to remain he was a haughty-looking man very fond of his little wife on whose shoulder he laid his hand caressingly as he asked what she thought of war now i just think it is horrid and rose's fat hand stole up to meet her husband's mr wentworth tried to make me think you had volunteered but i knew better the idea of your going off with such frights why will you can't begin to guess what a queer-looking set they are there was our milkman and the boy who saws our wood and canal drivers and peddlers and mechanics and rose did not finish the sentence for something in her husband's expression stopped her he had caught the quick uplifting of annie graham's head had noted the indignant flashing of her blue eye the kindling spot on her cheek and glancing at george he saw at once how rose's thoughtless words must have wounded her he had seen the disgusted expression of widow sims as she flounced out in the aisle and knowing that the boy who sawed wood was her son he felt sorry that his wife should have been so indiscreet still he could not be angry at the sparkling little creature chatting so like a parrot but he felt impelled to say you should not judge people by their dress or occupation the boy who saws our wood has a heart larger than many who make far more pretensions rose tried to pout at what she knew to have been intended as a reprimand but in the excitement of the jam as they passed out of the church she forgot it entirely only once uttering an impatient ejaculation as some one inadvertently stepped upon her sweeping skirt and so held her for a moment producing the sensation which nearly every woman experiences when she feels a sudden backward pull as if skirt and waist were parting company with the hasty exclamation who is stepping on me i'd like to know she turned just in time to hear annie graham's politely spoken words of apology i beg your pardon madam they pushed me so behind that i could not help it it isn't the least bit of matter returned rose disarmed at once of all resentment by annie's ladylike manner and the expression of the face on which traces of tears were still lingering who is that will she whispered as they emerged into the moonlight and george graham's tall form was plainly discernible together with that of his wife will told her who it was and rose rejoined he has volunteered i most know poor isn't he not very rich most certainly was mr mather's reply then i guess he's going to the war was rose's mental comment as if poverty were the sole accomplishment necessary for a soldier to possess a conclusion to which older and wiser heads than hers seemed at one time to have arrived annie graham heard both question and answer and with emotions not particularly pleasant she whispered to herself rose mather shall see that one man at least will not go even if he is a mechanic and poor and clinging closer to george's arm she walked on in silence thinking bitter thoughts of the little lady who delighted with having will on one side of her and mr wentworth his partner on the other tripped gaily on laughing as lightly as if on the country's horizon there were no dark threatening cloud which might yet overshadow her in its gloomy folds and leave her heart as desolate as that of the widow sims or the wailing mother of harry and bill End of chapter one
Chapter Two of Rose Mather: A Tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two, Rose and Annie. Rose Mather's home was a beautiful place, containing everything which love could devise or money purchase, and Rose was very happy there, dancing like a sunbeam through the handsome rooms of which she was the mistress, and singing as gaily as her pet canary in its gilded cage by the door. No shadow of sorrow or care had ever crossed her pathway, and the eighteen summers of her short life had come and gone like so many pleasant memories, bringing with them one successive round of joys, leaving no blight behind and bearing with them alas no thanks for the good bestowed for rose was far too thoughtless to think that the providence which shielded her so tenderly might have dealt more sharply with her but the shadow was creeping on apace and rose was conscious that the war meeting had awakened within her a new and uncomfortable train of thought like many others she had a habit of believing that nothing very bad could happen to her and so let what might occur she was sure her husband would be spared still in spite of her gaiety an undefined something haunted her all the way from the church and even when alone with her husband in her tasteful sitting-room with the bright gaslight falling cheerily around her and adding a fresh lustre to the elegant furniture she could not shake it off nor guess what it was that ailed her at last however it came to her suggested by the sight of her husband's evening paper and laying her curly head upon his knee she gave vent to her restlessness in the expression i wish there wouldn't be any war what is it all for tell me please it was the first interest she had evinced in the matter and glad to talk with any one upon the subject which was beginning to occupy so much of his own thoughts mr mather drew her into his lap and endeavoured as far as possible to explain to her what it was all for much of what he said however was greek to rose who only gained a vague idea that the north was contending for a bit of cloth such as she had often seen floating over the dome of the old state house in boston and with the remark that men's lives were far more valuable than all the stars and stripes in the world she fell away to sleep leaving her husband in the midst of an argument not quite clear to himself for like his wife he could not then see exactly what the war was for still inasmuch as there was war he would not play the coward's part nor shrink from the post of duty if his country should need his services but this rose did not know and secure in the belief that whatever might happen will would never go she soon resumed her wonted cheerfulness and if she said anything of the war it was sure to startle her hearers with some remark quite unworthy of a new england daughter she did wish they would stop having so many meetings she said or if they must have them she wished they'd get brother tom to come and set them right he had lived in charleston he could tell them how kind the people were to marry his sick wife and were it not that twas beneath him to lecture she'd surely write for him to come rose mather was growing unpopular by her foolish speeches and when at last she was asked to join with other ladies of the town in making articles of clothing for the volunteers she added the last drop to the brimming bucket by tossing back her chestnut tresses and guessing she shouldn't blister her hands over that coarse stuff she couldn't sew much anyway and as for making bandages and lint the very idea was sickening she'd give them fifty cents if they wanted but she positively couldn't do more than that for she must have a new pair of lavender kids she had worn the old ones three or four times and will preached economy every day with a frown of impatience the matron who had been deputed to ask help for rose took the fifty cents and with feelings anything but complimentary to the silly little lady went back to the hall where scores of women were busily employed in behalf of the company some of whom would never return to tell how much good even the homely housewife with its pins and needles and thread had done them when far away where no mother or sister hand could reach them nor yet how the thought that perhaps a dear one's fingers had torn the soft linen band or scraped the tender lint applied to some gaping wound had helped to ease the pain and cheer the homesick heart it was surely a work of mercy in which our noble women were then engaged and if from the group collected in rockland hall there was much loud murmuring at rose mather's want of sense or heart it arose not so much from ill-nature as from astonishment that she could be so callous and indifferent to an object of so much importance wait till her husband goes and she won't mince along so daintily taking all that pains to show her pal moral when it isn't one bit muddy 
muttered the widow sims pointing out to those near the window the lady in question tripping down the street in quest of lavender kids perhaps or more likely bound for her husband's office where now that everybody worked all day long at the hall she spent much of her time it was so lonely at home with nobody to call i hope he'll be drafted and have to go upon my word continued the widow whose heart was very sore with thinking of the three seats at her fireside so soon to be vacated by her darling boys eli john and isaac yes i do hope he'll be drafted don't you mrs graham and she turned toward annie who was rolling up bandages of linen and weaving in with every coil a prayer that the poor soldier whose lot it should be to need that band might return again to the loved ones at home or else be fitted for that better home where war is unknown annie shook her head but made no answer there was no bitterness now in her heart against rose mather she had prayed that all away and only hoped the anguish which had come to her making her brain giddy and her heart faint might never be borne by another if that could be george had volunteered was to be second lieutenant and annie oh who shall tell of the gloom which had fallen so darkly around the cottage she had called hers for one brief year it was a neat cosy dwelling and to annie it never seemed so cheerful as on that memorable night of the war meeting when she had lighted the lamp and sat down with george upon the chintz-covered lounge he had helped her to make when first she was a bride it is true the carpet was not of velvet like that rose mather trod upon neither was there in all the house one inch of rosewood or of marble but there was domestic love pure and deep as any rose ever experienced and there was something better far than that a patient trusting faith in one who can shed light upon the dreariest home and make the heaviest trial seem like naught it was this trusting faith which made annie graham the sweet gentle being she was shedding its influence over her whole life and softening down a disposition which otherwise might have been haughty and resentful annie was naturally high-spirited and proud and rose's remarks concerning volunteers in general and george in particular had stung her to the quick but with the indignant mood there came another impulse and ere the cottage had been reached the bitter feeling had gone leaving nothing but sorrow that it had ever been there like rose she wished there would be no war but wishing was of no avail and long after george graham was asleep and dreaming it may be of glories won on battlefields annie lay awake questioning within herself whether she ought by word or deed to prevent her husband's going if he felt as he seemed to feel that it was as much his duty as that of others to join in his country's defence annie was no great reasoner logically all her decisions were made to turn upon the simple question of right and wrong and on this occasion she found it hard to tell so evenly the balance seemed adjusted more than once she stole from her pillow and going out into the fresh night air knelt in the moonlight and asked for guidance to choose the right even though that right should take her husband from her if i knew he would not die it would not be so hard to give him up she murmured as sickening visions of fields strewn with the dead and hospitals filled with the dying came over her and for an instant her brain reeled with the thought of george dying thus and leaving her no hope of meeting him again for george's faith was not like hers anon however something whispered to her that the god she loved was on the field of carnage and in the camp and in the hospital and everywhere as much as there in rockland that prayers innumerable would follow the brave volunteers and that the evil she so much feared might be the means of working the great good she so desired and thus it was that annie came to a decision stealing back to her husband's side she bent over him as he lay sleeping and with a heart which throbbed to its very core though the lip uttered no sound she gave him to his country asking if it could be that he might come back again but if it were ordered otherwise god's will be done there was no shrinking after that sacrifice was made though when the morning came the death-white face and the dark circle beneath the eyes told of a weary vigil such as many and many a woman kept both north and south during the dark hours of the rebellion but save the death-white face and heavy eyes there was no token of the inner struggle as with a desperate effort at self-command annie wound her arms around her husband's neck and whispered to him you may go i give my free consent and george who cared far more to go than he had dared express kissed the lips which tried so hard to smile little dreaming what it cost his brave young wife to tell him what she had to one of his temperament there was no danger to be feared for himself 
the bullet which might strike down a brother at his side would be turned away from him others would of course be killed but he should escape unharmed in the language of one speaker whose eloquent appeal had done much to fire his youthful enthusiasm he was not going to be shot but to shoot somebody this was his idea and ere the clinging arms had unclasped themselves from his neck his imagination leaped forward to the future and in fancy george graham wore if not a colonel's at least a captain's uniform and the cottage on the hill which annie so much admired and for the purpose of which a few hundreds were already saved was his bought with the money he would earn the deed should be drawn in her name too he said and he pictured her to himself coming down the walk to meet him with the rose blush on her cheek just as she looked the first time he ever saw her something of this he told her and annie tried to smile and think it all might be but her heart that morning was far too heavy to be lighted by a picture of what seemed so improbable still george's hopeful confidence did much to reassure her and when a few days after she started for the hall she purposely took a longer walk for the sake of passing the cottage on the hill thinking as she leaned over the low iron fence how she would arrange the flower beds more tastefully than they were now arranged and teach the drooping vines to twine more gracefully around the slender columns supporting the piazza in front she would have seats too willow twisted chairs beneath the trees where she and george could sit at twilight and watch the shadows creeping across the hollow where the old cottage was and up the opposite hill where the cupola of rose mather's home was plainly visible blazing in the april sunshine it was a very pleasant castle which annie built and for a time the load of pain which since george volunteered had lain so heavy at her heart was gone but it returned again when as she passed a turn in the road her eye wandered down to the hollow and that other cottage standing there so brown and small and looking already so desolate because she knew that ere many days were over she should wait in vain for the loved footsteps coming down the road should miss the pleasant cheery laugh the teasing joke and words of love which made the world all sunshine the cottage on the hill became a worthless thing as poor annie forced back her tears and with quickened steps hurried on to join the group of ladies busy at the hall taking her seat by the window she commenced the light work imposed on her that of tearing and winding bandages for those who might be wounded maybe there'll never be no fight but it's well enough to be prepared was the soothing remark of the kind-hearted woman who gave the work to annie noting as she did so how the lip quivered and the cheek paled at the very idea what if george should need them kept suggesting itself to her as she worked industriously on hoping that if he did some one of the rolls she was winding might come to him or better yet if he could only have the bit of soft linen she had brought herself a piece of her own clothing and bearing on it her maiden name annie howard he would be sure to know it she said it was written so plainly with indelible ink and it would make him feel so glad but there might be other annie howards it was not an uncommon name was suggested next to her as she tore the linen in strips and quick as thought her hand sought the pocket of her dress for the pencil which she knew was there glancing around to see that no one observed her she touched the pencil to her lips and wrote after the name it's your annie george try to believe i'm there rockland april eighteen sixty one there were big tear-drops on that bit of linen but annie brushed them away and went on with her rolling just as widow sims called her attention to rose mather as mentioned several pages back annie could not account for it to herself but ever since rose's arrival at rockland she had felt a strange inexplicable interest in the fashionable bell an interest prompted by something more than mere curiosity and now that there was an opportunity of seeing her without being herself seen she straightened up and smoothing the soft braids of her pale brown hair waited for the entrance of the little lady who with her pink hat set jauntily on her chestnut curls and her rich fur collar buttoned gracefully over her handsome cloth cloak tripped into the room doing much by her sunny smile and pleasant manner to disarm the ladies of their recent prejudice against her she was nothing but a child they reflected a spoiled petted child she would improve as she grew older and come more in contact with the sharp corners of the world so those who had the honour of her acquaintance received her with the familiar deference if we may be allowed the expression which had always marked their manner toward william mather's bride rose was too much accustomed to society to be at all disconcerted by the hundred pair of eyes turned scrutinizingly toward her indeed she rather enjoyed being looked at and she tossed the coarse garments about with a pretty playfulness saying that 
since the ladies had called upon her she had thought better of it and made up her mind to martyr herself one afternoon at least and benefit the soldiers to be sure there wasn't much she could do she might hold yarn for somebody to wind she supposed but she couldn't knit and she didn't want to sew on such ugly scratchy stuff as those flannel shirts but if someone would thread her needle and fix it all right she'd try what she could do on a pair of drawers for a time no one seemed inclined to volunteer her services and widow sim's shears clicked spitefully loud as they cut through the cotton flannel at last however mrs baker who had more than once officiated as washerwoman at the mather mansion came forward and arranged some work for rose who untying the strings of her pink hat and adjusting her tiny gold thimble laboured on until she had succeeded in sewing up and joining together a long leg with one some inches shorter which had happened to be lying near loud was the shout which a discovery of this mistake called forth nor was it at all abated when rose demurely asked if it would not answer for some soldier who should chance to have a limb shot off just below the knee the little simpleton muttered the widow while mrs baker pointed out to the discomfited lady that one division of the drawers was right side out and the other wrong there was no alternative save to rip the entire thing and with glowing cheeks rose began the task of undoing what she had done incidentally letting out as she worked that will might have known better than to send her there she shouldn't have come at all if he had not insisted telling her people would call her a secessionist unless she did something to benefit the soldiers she didn't care what they called her she knew she was a democrat or used to be before she was married but now that will was a republican she hardly knew what she was anyway she was not a secessionist and she wasn't particularly interested in the war either why should she be will was not going nor brother tom nor any of her friends but somebody's friends are going somebody's will somebody's tom as dear to them as yours are to you came in a rebuking tone from a straightforward outspoken woman who knew from sad experience that somebody's tom was going yes i know said rose a shadow for an instant crossing her bright face and it's dreadful too will says everything will be so much higher and it will be so dull at saratoga and newport next summer without the southern people one might as well stay at home the war might have been avoided too by a little mutual forbearance from both parties until matters could be amicably adjusted for brother tom said so in his letter last night and a heap more which i can't remember here rose paused quite exhausted with the effort she had made to repeat the opinion of brother tom she had read all his last letter fully endorsing as much of it as she understood and after a little while she went on wasn't it horrid though their firing into the massachusetts boys and they were from right round boston too tom saw them when they started they were fine-looking men he says and will thinks i ought to be proud that i'm a bay state girl and so i am but it isn't as if my friends had gone tom is a democrat i know but it's quite another kind that joined the army widow sims could keep silent no longer and brandishing her polished shears by way of adding emphasis to what she said she began and s'posin tis folks as poor as poverty struck hain't they feelin's i'd like to know hain't they got bodies and souls and mothers and wives and sisters and s'posin tis democrats more shame for t'other side that helped get up the muss where be they now them chaps that wore the big black capes and did much toward puttin lincoln in that chair why don't they help to keep em settin there and not stand back with their hands tucked in their trousers pockets both my boys eli and john voted t'other ticket and isaac would but he wasn't twenty-one they've all jined and i won't say i'm sorry if there's anything i hate it's a sneak it makes me so mad and the big shears again clicked savagely as widow sims resumed her work after having thus delivered her opinion of the black republicans besides having in her own words given that puckerin miss mather's a piece of her mind obtuse as rose was on many points she saw there was some homely truth in what the widow had said but this did not impress her so much as the fact that she had evidently given offence and she was about trying to extricate herself from the dilemma when george graham appeared ostensibly to bring some trivial message to the president of the society but really to see if his wife were there and speak to her some kind word of encouragement rose recognized him as the young man she had seen at the war meeting and the moment he left the hall she broke out impetuously isn't he handsome 
so tall so broad-shouldered and such a splendid mark for a bullet i most know he will be shot hush came warningly from several individuals but came too late the mischief was done ere rose could collect her thoughts a group of frightened women had gathered around poor annie who had fainted what's the matter do tell cried rose standing on tiptoe and clutching at the dress of widow sims who angrily retorted i should suppose you'd ask it's enough to make the poor critter faint clear away to hear a body talk about her husband's being a fast right mark for a bullet with all her thoughtlessness rose had the kindest heart in the world and forcing her way through the crowd she knelt by the white-faced annie and taking the drooping head in her lap pushed back the thick braids of hair noticing with her quick eye for the beautiful how soft and luxuriant they were how pure was the complexion how perfect were the features how small and delicate the fingers and how graceful was the slender neck i'm so sorry i wish i'd stayed at home i am so sorry she kept repeating and when at last annie returned to consciousness rose mathers was the first voice she heard rose's the first face she saw with an involuntary shudder she closed her eyes wearily while rose anxiously asked of those about her how they should get her home oh jake she suddenly exclaimed as towering above the female head she saw her coloured coachman looking for her and remembered that her husband was to call and take her out to ride oh jake lift this lady up careful as you can and put her in our carriage is will there well no matter he'll just have to get out stand back won't you and let jake come she continued authoritatively to the group of ladies who half amused and half surprised at this new phase in rose mather's character made way for burly jake who lifted annie's light form as if it had been a feather's weight and bore it down the stairs followed by rose who with one breath told annie not to be a bit afraid for jake certainly would not drop her and with the next asked jake if he were positive and sure he was strong enough not to let her fall lazily reclining upon the cushions of his carriage william mather was smoking his havana and admiring the sleek coat of his iron greys when rose appeared and seizing him by the arm peremptorily ordered him to alight and help jake lift the lady in i don't know who tis but it's somebody i made faint away with my silly talk she replied in answer to mr mather's question who have you there you made faint away he repeated as he found himself rather unceremoniously landed upon the flagging stones his havana rolling at his feet and his wife preparing to follow annie whom jake had placed inside yes i talked about her husband's being a splendid mark for a bullet and all that without ever thinking she was his wife he looked so tall and big and nice that i couldn't help thinking his head would come above all the rest in a fight but i don't believe it will there jake we are ready now drive on said rose while poor annie groaned afresh at this doubtful consolation drive war asked jake i don't know whar they lives to be sure nor i either returned rose turning inquiringly to her husband who gave the information adding as he glanced down the street mr graham himself is coming i see i think rose you had best give your place to him rose who was fond of adventures wanted sadly to go with annie but george when he came up seemed so concerned and asked so many questions that she deemed it best to leave it for his wife to make the necessary explanations merely saying as she stepped upon the walk i am so sorry mr graham i really did not mean anything wrong in saying i knew you'd be shot for you are so rose your dress is rubbing the wheel interrupted mr mather by way of diverting rose from repeating the act for which she was expressing sorrow no it ain't rubbing the wheel either it isn't anywhere near it said rose wondering what will could mean while george taking a seat by annie smiled at what he saw to be a ruse bent upon reconciliation rose pressed up to the carriage and said to annie you won't be angry at me always will you i shouldn't have thought of it only he does look so go on jake mr mather called out cutting short rose's speech and the next moment annie was driving down the street in rose mather's carriage and behind the iron greys an honour she had never dreamed in store for her when she saw the stylish turnout passing the door of her cottage in the hollow End of chapter two chapter three of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain three the departure 
the thirteenth regiment was ordered to elmira and the day had arrived for the departure of the volunteers bright was the sun and cloudless the sky which shone on rockland that spring day but cloudless sky nor warm spring sun could comfort the hearts about to part with their treasures some for ever and some to meet again but when or where or how none could tell save him who holds the secret of the future there were mothers who had never felt a pang so keen or a pain so sore as when with hearts too full of anguish for the dry red eyes to weep they watched their sons pass from the threshold of the door and knew that when the golden sunlight falling so brightly around them was purple in the west they would look in vain for that returning step and listen in vain for tones which were the first perhaps to stir the deep fountains of maternal love fathers too were there with heads bent down to hide the tears they deemed it weak to shed as they gave the farewell blessing to their boy praying that god might be over and around him both when the deafening battle war was sounding in his ear and when in the stilly night he wrapped his blanket about him and laid him down to rest sometimes with the southern stars shining upon him and sometimes with the southern rain falling on his unsheltered head for all these vicissitudes must come to a soldier on the field wives and sisters too there were who shuddered as they thought how the dear ones to whom they said good-bye would miss the comforts they were leaving miss the downy pillow the soft warm bed made with loving hands and the luxuries of home never prized one half so much as now when they were to be exchanged for a life within the camp and there were maidens from whose cheeks the roses faded as they gave the parting kiss and promised to be faithful even though the manly form the lover bore away should come back to them all maimed and crushed and crippled with the toil of war far better so than not to come at all at least so annie graham thought as winding her arms around her husband's neck she whispered to him if the body you bring back has my george's heart within it i shall love you just the same as i do now and with her fair head lying on his bosom annie wept piteously not till then had she realized what it was to let him go she had become somewhat accustomed to thinking of it accustomed to seeing him pass in and out dressed in his stylish uniform which made him look so handsome and then she had hoped the regiment would not be ordered for a long long time never perhaps but now that dream was over the dreaded hour had come and for a moment annie felt herself too weak to meet it through the livelong night she had prayed or if perchance sleep for a moment shut the swollen lids the lips had moved in prayer that her husband might come back to her again or failing to do so that he might grasp even at the eleventh hour the christian's faith and so go to the christian's home where they could meet once more she had given him her little bible all pencil marked and worn with daily usage the one she read when first the spirit taught her the meaning of its great mysteries and george had promised he would read it every day had said that when he went to battle he would place it next his heart a talisman to shield him from the bullets of the foe and annie smiling through her tears pointed him again to the only one who could stand between him and death asking that when he was far away he would remember what she said and pray to the god she honoured it's time now darling he said at last as he heard in the distance the beat of the drum but the clinging arms refused to leave his neck and the quivering lips pressed so constantly to his murmured wait a little minute more tis the last you know again the drum-beat was heard mingled with the shrill notes of the fife the soldiers were marching down the street and he must go but oh who can tell of the love the pain the grief the tears mingled with that parting or the agony it cost poor annie to take her arms from his neck to feel him putting her away to hear him going from the room across the threshold down the walk through the gate and know that he was gone as a child in peril instinctively turns to the mother who it knows has never failed to succour so annie turned to god and with a moaning cry for help sank on her knees just where george had left her burying her face in the lounge she prayed that he who heareth even the raven's cry would care for her husband and bring him home again if that could be so absorbed was she as not to hear the gate's sharp click nor the footstep coming up the walk impelled by something he could not resist george had paused just by the garden fence and yielding to the impulse which said he must see annie's face once more he stole softly to the open door and stood gazing at her as she knelt her hands clasped together and her face hidden from his view as she prayed for him will the kind father keep my george from peril if it can be but if oh god how can i say it if he must die 
teach him the road to heaven that was what she said and george listening to her felt as if it were an angel's presence in which he stood he could not disturb her she was in safer hands than his and he would rather leave her thus would rather think of her when far away just as he saw her last kneeling in her desolation and praying for him it will help to make me a better man he said and brushing aside the great tears swimming in his eyes he left his angel annie and went on his way to battle just off from rocklands main street and in a cottage more humble than that of george graham the sun shone on another parting on widow sims giving up her boys and straining every nerve to look composed and keep back the maternal love throbbing so madly at her heart rigid as if cut in stone were the lines upon her forehead and around her mouth as she bustled about doing everything exactly as it should be done and coming often to where isaac sat trying to look unconcerned and whistling dixie as he pulled on the soft warm pair of socks she had sat up nights to knit him eli and john had some too snugly tucked away in their bundle but isaac's were different she had ravelled her own lamb's wool stockings for the material composing his for isaac's feet were tender there were marks of kilblains on them they would become sore and swollen from the weary march and his mother would not be there with soothing lint and ointment made from the blue poke berries great pains had the widow taken with her breakfast that morning preparing each son's favourite dish and bringing out the six china cups and damask cloth part of her grandmother's bridal dower it was a very tempting table and john and eli tried to eat exchanging meaning smiles when they saw their mother put in isaac's cup the biggest lump of sugar and the largest share of cream they did not care for they too loved the fair-haired smooth-faced boy sipping the yellow coffee he could not drink for the mysterious bunches rising so fast in his throat the breakfast was over now isaac was trying on his socks while eli and john knowing their mother would rather be alone when she said good-bye to her baby prepared to start talking quite loud and keeping up stout courage till the last moment came when both the tall six-foot young men put their arms around the widow's neck and faltered a faint good-bye mother good-bye there were no tears in the mother's eyes nor in the son's but in the breast of each there was a whirlpool of raging waters hurting far more than if they had been suffered to overflow in torrents eli was the first to go for john lingered a moment there was something he would say something which made him blush and stammer mother he began i saw susan last night we went to squire harding's together and and well tain't no use opposing it now susan and i are one and if i shouldn't come back be good to her for my sake susan's a nice girl mother and on the brown bearded cheek there was a tear wrung out by thoughts of only last night's bride susan ruggles whose family the widow did not like and had set herself against there was no help now and a sudden start was all the widow's answer she was not angry john knew and satisfied with this he joined his brother in the yard where he was cutting his name upon the beech tree thrice the widow called them back failing each time to remember what she wanted to say it was something sure and the hard hands worked nervously twisting up the gingham apron into a roll smoothing it out again and working at the strings until eli and john passed from the yard and left her standing there watching them as they walked down the road they were a grand-looking couple she thought as she saw how well they kept step they were to march together to the depot she knew and nobody in town could turn out a finer span but who would go with isaac stub his brothers called him she hoped it might be judge warner's son it would be such an honour and that brought her back to the fact that isaac was waiting for her inside that the hardest part of all was yet to come the bidding him good-bye he was not in the chair where she had left him sitting but was standing by the window and raising often to his eyes his cotton handkerchief he heard his mother come in and turning toward her he said with a sobbing laugh i wish the plaguey thing was over she thought he meant the war and answered that it would be in a few months perhaps i don't mean that i mean the telling you good-bye mother oh mother and the warm-hearted boy clasped his mother to his bosom crying like a child if i've ever been mean to you he said his voice choked with tears if i've ever been mean to you or done a hateful thing you'll forget it when i'm gone i never meant to be bad and the time i made that face and called you an old fool when i was a little boy you don't know how sorry i felt 
nor how long i cried in the trundle bed after you were asleep you'll forget it won't you when i am gone never to come back maybe will you mother say would she could she remember aught against her youngest born save that he had ever been to her the best the dearest most obedient child in the world no she could not and so she told him caressing his light brown hair and showering upon it the kisses which the compressed lips could no longer restrain the fountain of love was broken and the widow's tears dropped like rain on the upturned face of her boy suddenly there came to their ears the same drum-beat which had sounded so like a funeral knell to annie graham isaac must go but not till one act more was done mother he whispered half hesitatingly it will make me a better soldier if you say the lord's prayer with me just as you used to do with your hand upon my head i'll kneel down if you like and the boy of eighteen wearing a soldier's dress did kneel down nor felt shame as the shaky hand rested once more on his bowed head while his mother said with him the prayer learned years ago kneeling as he knelt now surely to the angels looking on there was charge given concerning that young boy charged to see that no murderous bullet came near him even though they should fall round him thick and fast as summer hail it would seem that some such thought as this intruded itself upon the widow sims for where the swelling pain had been there came a gentle peace god would care for isaac he would send him home in safety and so the bitterness of that parting was more than half taken away again the drum beat just as annie heard it another pressure of the hand another burning kiss another good-bye mother don't fret too much about us and then the last of the widow's boys was gone turn we now to the shanty-like building down by the mill where the mother of harry and bill rocked to and fro upon the unmade bed and rent the air with her dismal howls hoping thus to win at least one tender word from the two youths voraciously devouring the breakfast she like widow sims had been at so much pains to prepare watching even through her tears to see if they want going to leave her one atom of the steak she had spent her yesterday's earnings to buy no they didn't harry took the last piece growling angrily at bill who kinder-hearted than his brother suggested that hal shouldn't be a pig but leave something for the old woman leave it yourself was harry's gruff response and turning to his mother he told her not to make a fool of herself when she knew she was glad to be rid of them at any rate if she were not the whole village were adding by way of consolation that he should probably end his days in state prison if he stayed at home and he had better be shot in a fair fight as there was some credit in that around harry baker's childhood there clustered no remembrance of prayers said at the mother's knee or of bible stories told in the dusky twilight and though reared in new england within sight of the church spire he had rarely been inside the house of god and this it was which made the difference between that scene and the one transpiring in the house of widow sims all the animal passions in harry baker's case were brought to full perfection unsubdued by any softer influence and rising from the table after filling his stomach almost to bursting he swaggered across the room and opening his bundle began to comment upon the different articles he having been too drunk to notice them when given to him on the previous night what in thunder is this for he exclaimed holding up the calico housewife and letting buttons scissors and thread drop upon the floor plaguy pretty implements of war these and he began to enumerate the articles fine-tooth comb black as the ace of spades good enough idea that ain't used one since i can remember and he passed it through his shaggy hair whose appearance fully verified the truth of his assertion half a paper of pins why didn't the stingy critters give us more an old brass thimble too here mother i'll give you that to remember me by and he tossed it into her lap the drawers then took his attention the identical pair rose mather made and though they were better than any he had ever worn he laughed at them derisively trying them on he succeeded in making quite a long rip in one of the seams for rose's stitches were none the shortest then with a flourish he kicked them off uttering an oath as he felt a sharp scratch from the needle which rose had broken and failed to extricate the woollen shirt came next but any remarks he might have made upon that were prevented by his catching sight of the little brown book which lay at the bottom of the bundle hurrah bill if it ain't a testament with harry baker inside rich by george wonder if they s'posed i'd read it let us see what it says come on to me all ye that labour 
mother that means you scrubbin and workin you know keep the pesky thing i enlisted to lick the southerners not to sing hymns and psalms and he threw the sacred book across the floor just as the first drum-beat sounded that's the signal he exclaimed and hastily rolling up the shirt and drawers he started for the door carelessly saying come bill take your testament and come along good-bye old lady you needn't wear black if i'm killed twon't pay i guess oh harry harry wait wait billy boy do wait give your old marm one kiss and the poor woman tottered toward harry who savagely repulsed her saying he wasn't going to have her slobberin over him you billy then you'll let me kiss you won't you and she turned toward bill who hesitated a moment but harry was in the way bill was afraid of harry's jeers and so he too refused while the wailing cries rose louder oh billy do just once and i've been so good to you just once do billy shan't do it was bill's reply as he followed harry who as a farewell parting had hurled a stone at a cow across the street set the dog on his mother's kitten stepped on the old cat's tail and then left the yard slamming after him the rickety gate his mother had tried in vain to have him fix before he went billy however waited there was something more human in his nature than in his brother's he had not thrown his testament away and the sight of it in his bundle had touched a tender cord making him half resolved to read it watching his brother till he was out of sight he went back to where his mother sat moaning dolefully oh that i should raise sich boys that i should raise sich boys mother he said and mrs baker's heart fairly leaped at the sound for there was genuine sympathy in the tone mother now that hal has gone i don't mind kissin you or lettin you kiss me if you want to the doleful moan was a perfect scream as the shrivelled arms clasped bill while the joyful mother kissed the rough but not ill-humoured face there now don't screech so like an owl he said releasing himself from her and adding as he glanced at a huge silver watch won by gambling maybe seein i've a few minutes to spare i'll drive a nail or so into that confounded gate and i don't know but while i'm about it i'll split you an armful of wood i had or to have cut up the hole on it i s'pose but when hell is round i can't do nothin it was strange how many little things bill did do in these few minutes he had to spare things which added greatly to his mother's comfort and saved her several shillings beside making a soft warm spot in a heart which knew not many such glancing at the tall clock brought from new england when mrs baker first moved to rockland bill remarked the darn thing has stopped again i or to have isle did i s'pose it would kind of been company for you here in it tick ay bum if i hain't a mind to give you this old turnip and again he drew out the silver watch you'll lay a bed all day without no time like enough i'll nab one from some tarnal rebel who knows and with his favourite expression nuff said bill laid the watch upon the table his mother moaning all the while billy boy billy boy i never sought so much store by you before how can i let you go stay billy do or else run away the first chance you get will you billy boy not by a jugful was the emphatic response i ain't none of that kind i'll be shot like a dog before i'll run the baker name shall never be disgraced by my desertin it's more like hal to do that but don't howl so i'm kinder puttin on the tender you know cause i'm goin away i should be ugly as ever if i's to stay to hum so stop your snivelin and having driven the last nail into a broken chair bill gathered up his bundle and with the single remark nuff said darted through the open door and was off ere his mother fairly comprehended it there was a great crowd out that morning to see the company off fathers mothers wives and sisters those who had friends in the company and those who had none the mather carriage was there and from its window rose's childish face looked out now irradiated with smiles as its owner bowed to some acquaintance and again shadowed with sympathy as the cries of some bereaved one were heard amid the throng widow sims too was there drawn thither by a desire to see if isaac did march with charley warner as she hoped he would notwithstanding that he had told her he was probably too short she didn't believe that 
he was taller than he looked and inasmuch as charlie was the most aristocratic of the company she did hope isaac would go with him so there she stood waiting not far from mrs baker who had dried her eyes and come for a last look at her boys onward the soldiers came slowly steadily onward the regular tread of their feet and the measured beat of the drum making solemn music as they came and sending a chill to many a heart for twas no gala day no fourth of july no old-fashioned general training they were there to celebrate every drum-beat was the note of war and they who kept time to it were going forth to battle onward onward still they came george graham's splendid figure towering above the rest and eliciting more than one flattering compliment from the lookers-on there were john and eli side by side john eagerly scanning the female forms which lined the walk for a sight of last night's bride and eli looking for his mother if perchance she should be there she was there and what to john was better yet she stood with her hand on susan's shoulder showing that thus early she was trying to mother her that's him that's john and susan's voice faltered as she pointed him out to the widow whose heart gave one great spasm of pain as she saw him and then grew suddenly still with wrath and indignation for alas her isaac who was to have gone with charlie warner son of rockland's judge was marching with william baker bill who had been to the workhouse twice to say nothing of the times he had stolen her rare ripes and early melons she had not looked for anything like this and could scarcely believe her senses yet there they were right before her eyes isaac and bill the former hoping his mother would not see him and the latter trying not to see his mother who was quite as much delighted to see him with isaac sims as the widow would have been had isaac been with charlie warner just in front mrs baker had followed her sons to the hall had heard the reasons for the captain's decision and she called out in a loud exultant tone miss sims miss sims do you see your ike with billy cap'n johnson would have put him with charlie warner if he hadn't fell short two inches look kinder nice together don't they only ike stoops a trifle pears to me it didn't peer so to widow sims but then her eyes were blurred so that she could not see distinctly for strange to say the sharpest pang of all was the knowing that isaac so pure so gentle so girl-like must be a companion for reckless swearing gambling bill and for a time she could not quite forgive her youngest born that he had not just been two inches taller blind ignorant widow sims the hour will come when on her bended knees she'll thank the overruling hand which kept her boy from growing just two inches taller onward still onward they moved until they turned the corner and paused before the depot a little apart from the rest george graham stood wishing that the cars would come and building airy castles of what would be when he returned covered with laurels as he was sure to do if only opportunities were offered he would distinguish himself he thought with many a brave deed so that the papers would talk of him as a gallant hero and when he came back to rockland the people would come out to meet him a denser crowd than was assembled now their faces would not then be so sad for they would come to do him honour and in fancy he heard the stirring notes of the martial music and saw the smile of joy steal over the weather-beaten features of the leader of the band the man with the jammed white hat as he piped that welcome home there would be carriages there too more than now and maybe there would be a carriage expressly for him and the dreamer saw the long procession moving down the street saw the little boys on the walk the women at the doors and heard the peal of the village bells it would be grand he thought if he could have a crown just as the roman victors used to do it would please annie so much to see him thus triumphant she would not come up to the depot he knew she would rather be alone when she met him while he too would prefer that all those people should not be looking on when he kissed his little wife just then the train appeared and the confusion became greater as the crowd drew nearer together and the man with the jammed white hat who was to fight george's welcome home redoubled his exertions and tried his best to drown his own emotions in the harsh sounds he made but above the fife's shrill scream above the bass drum's beat and above the engine's hiss was heard the sound of wailing as one by one the rockland volunteers stepped aboard the train bill was the last to go for as a parting act he had fired the old cannon which almost from time immemorial had heralded to rockland sleeping citizens that twelve o'clock had struck and it was independence day 
some said it was no good omen that the worn-out gun burst in twain from the heavy charge with which bill had seen fit to load it but bill cared not for omens and with three cheers and a tiger for uncle sam he jumped upon the platform just as the final all aboard was shouted there was a ringing of the bell a sudden puffing of the engine a straining of machinery a sweeping backward of the wreaths of smoke and then where so lately one hundred soldiers had been there was nothing left save an open space of frozen ground and iron rails as cold and empty as the hearts of those who watched until the last curling ring of vapour died amid the eastern woods and then went sadly back to the homes left so desolate End of chapter three chapter four of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain four will and brother tom letter from brother tom i am so glad it's an age since he wrote and i've been dying to hear from home dear old tom and dropping parasol in one place gloves in another and shawl in another rose mather who had just come in from shopping seized the letter her husband handed her and seating herself upon an ottoman near the window began to read without observing that it was dated at washington instead of boston as usual gradually however there came a shadow over her face and her husband saw the tears gathering slowly in her eyes and dropping upon the letter she had been dying to get what is it rose mr mather asked as a sob met his ear oh will and rose cried outright i didn't believe tom would do that i thought people like him never went to war i most know he'll be killed oh dear dear what shall i do and rose hid her face in the lap of her husband who fondly caressed her chestnut hair as he replied you'll bear it like a brave new england woman we need just such men as your brother tom and i never respected him one half so much as now that he has shown how truly noble he is he was greatly opposed to lincoln you know and worked hard to defeat him but now that our country is in danger he like a true patriot has thrown aside all political feeling and gone to the rescue i honour him for it and may success attend him yes interrupted rose as a new idea struck her but what will his southern friends think of him and he has got a heap of them there are the burneys and franklins from new orleans the richardsons in mobile and those nice people in charleston what will they say when they hear he has taken up arms against them and he always used to quarrel so with those stiff abolitionists in boston when they said the southerners had no right to their slaves tom insisted they had and that the north was meddling with what was none of its business and now he's turned abolitionist and joined too dear dear mr mather smiled at rose's reasoning and after a moment replied i have no idea that tom has changed his mind in the least with regard to the negroes or that he loves his southern friends one whit the less than when defending them from abuse negroes and southern proclivities have nothing to do with it a blow has been struck at the very heart of our union and tom feels it his duty to resent it it's just like this suppose you in a pet were trying to scratch your mother's eyes out and tom should try to prevent it would you think him false to you because he took the part of his mother would you not rather respect him far more than if he stood quietly by and saw you fight it out it is not very likely i should try to scratch out mother's eyes said rose half laughing at her husband's odd comparison and adding after a moment i don't see how folks can fight and love each other too mr mather didn't quite see it either and without directly replying to rose he asked by way of diverting her mind from the subject of her brother's volunteering if she noticed what tom said about the rockland company in general and george graham and isaac sims in particular this reminded rose of annie who had been ill most of the time since her husband's departure i meant to have called on mrs graham right away she said the poor creature has been so sick they say but would not let them send for george because it was his duty to stay where he was i'd like to see duty or anything else make me willing to part with you i don't believe mrs graham loves her husband as i do you or she would never consent to be left alone and rose nestled closer to her husband who could not find courage to tell her what he meant to do when he handed her tom's letter it would be too much for her to bear at once he thought as he saw how greatly she was pained because her brother had joined the army and was even then in washington to rose it was some consolation that tom was captain of his company and that his soldiers were taken from the finest families in boston 
this was far better than if he had gone as a private which of course he would not do he was too proud for that and she could never have forgiven him the disgrace still viewed in any light it was very sad for tom had been to rose more like a father than a brother he was the pride the head of the carleton family upon whom herself and mother had leaned the one since the day of her widowhood and the other since she could remember he it was who had petted and caressed and spoiled her up to the very hour when at the altar he had given her away to will he it was too who had been the arbiter of all the childish differences which had arisen between herself and jimmy teasing naughty jimmy wandering now no one knew where if indeed he were alive and at the thought of jimmy with his saucy eyes and handsome face her tears flowed afresh what if he were living and should join the army like tom it would be more than she could bear and for a long time after her husband left her rose sat weeping over the picture she drew of both her brothers slain on some bloody battlefield the shadow of war was beginning to enfold her and brought with it a new and strange sympathy for those who like herself had brothers in the army again remembering annie graham she sprang up exclaiming to herself i'll go this very afternoon she'll be so glad to know what tom thinks of george and ere long rose was picking her way daintily through the narrow street which led to the cottage in the hollow it was superior to most of the dwellings upon that street and rose was struck at once with the air of neatness and thrift apparent in everything around it from the nicely painted fence to the little garden with its plats of flowers just budding into beauty they have seen better days i am sure or else mrs graham's social position was above her husband's was rose's mental comment as she lifted the gate latch and passed up the narrow walk catching a glimpse through the open window of a sweet pale face and of a thick stout figure flying through the opposite door as if anxious to avoid being seen poor annie had been very sick and more than once the physician who attended her had suggested sending for her husband but annie though missing him sadly and longing for him more than any one could guess always opposed it begging of widow sims who of her own accord went to nurse her not to write anything which would alarm him in the least so george ever hopeful ever looking on the sunny side thought of his blue-eyed wife as a little bit sick and nervous it might be but not dangerous at all and wrote to her kind loving cheering letters which did much to keep her courage from dying within her annie was better now was just in that state of convalescence when she found it very hard to lie all day long watching widow sims as she bustled out and in setting the chairs in a row with their six backs square against the wall and their six fronts opposite the table stand and bureau also in a row she was just wishing some one would come when the swinging of the gate and the widow's exclamation oh the land if that stuck-up thing ain't comin announced the approach of rose mather i'll make myself missin for mercy knows i don't want to hear none of your secession stuff it fairly makes my blood bile was the widow's next comment and gathering up her knitting she hurried into the kitchen leaving annie to receive her visitor alone not waiting for her knock to be answered rose entered at the open door and advanced at once into the room where annie was her fair hair pushed back from her forehead her blue eyes unusually brilliant and her face scarcely less white than the pillow on which it lay rose had an eye for the beautiful and after the first words of greeting were over she broke out in her impulsive way why mrs graham how handsome you are looking just like the apple blossoms i wish your husband could see you now i'm sure he wouldn't stay there another hour i think it's cruel in him don't you the tears came at once to annie's eyes and her voice was very low as she replied george does not know how sick i have been neither do i wish to have him it would only make his burden heavier to bear and i try to care more for his comfort than my own this was a phase of unselfishness wholly new to rose and for an instant she was silent then remembering tom's letter she seated herself upon the foot of the bed and throwing aside her bonnet took the letter from her pocket telling annie as she did so that she too was now interested in the war and in every one whose friends had gone i never knew how it felt before she said and i've made a heap of silly speeches i know don't you remember that time in the hall when i talked about your husband being shot i am sorry but i do think he's more likely to be picked off than tom who is not nearly as tall you are faint ain't you she added as she saw how deathly pale annie grew while the drops of perspiration stood thickly about her lips simpleton simpleton muttered widow sims listening through the keyhole in the kitchen while annie whispered 
please don't talk that way mrs mather i know george is very tall but unless god wills it otherwise the bullets will pass by him as well as others rose saw she had done mischief again by her thoughtless way of speaking and eager to repair the wrong she bent over annie and said i am sorry i am always doing something foolish you are faint shan't i tell the servant to bring you some water she's in the kitchen i suppose and ere annie could explain rose had darted into the neat little kitchen where widow sims was stooping over the stove and kindling a fire with which to make the evening tea girl girl mrs graham wants some water hurry and bring it quick will you rose called out a little peremptorily for there was something rather suggestive of defiance in the square straight back which never moved a particle in answer to the command deaf or hateful was rose's mental comment and as it might possibly be the former she wished she knew the girl's name as that would be more apt to attract her most every irish girl is bridget she thought to herself and i guess this one is anyway she acts like the girl that used to order mother outdoors so i'll venture upon that name bridget bridget and this time the voice was decidedly authoritative in its tone but what more rose might have added was cut short by the widow who dropped the griddle with a bang and turning sharply round replied there's no bridget here and if it's me you mean i am mrs joseph sims rose had good reason for remembering mrs sims and colouring crimson she tried to apologise i beg your pardon i did not see your face i supposed everybody kept a girl and your back looked like don't make the matter any worse interrupted the widow smiling in spite of herself at rose's attempt to excuse her blunder you thought from my dress that i was a hired girl and so i was in my younger days and i don't feel none the worse for it neither miss graham's faint is she she's had time to get over it i think here's the water and filling a gourd shell she handed it to rose who in her admiration of the to her novel drinking cup came near forgetting annie but annie did not care for their encounter between the widow and rose had done her quite as much good as the water could and rose found her laughing the first really hearty laugh she had enjoyed since george went away it's just like me rose said as she resumed her seat by annie listening intently while she told how kind the widow sims had been coming every day to stay with her and only leaving her at night because annie insisted that she should i like mrs sims was rose's vehement exclamation and i am glad tom said what he did about isaac who used to saw our wood i did not tell you did i and there's something real nice about your husband too i mean to call her in while i read it and rose ran out to the woodshed where the widow was now splitting a pine for kindling the newspaper she at first had used having burned entirely out rose's manner and voice were very conciliatory as she said please mrs sims come in and listen while i read what brother tom has written about mr graham and your isaac something perfectly splendid tom has volunteered and gone to washington you know it was strange how those few words changed the widow's opinion of rose the fact that thomas carleton whom the rockland people fancied was a secessionist had joined the federal army did much toward effecting this change but not so much as the fact that he had actually noticed her boy and spoken of him in a letter miss mather ain't so bad after all she thought and striking her axe into the log she followed rose to the sitting-room listening eagerly while she read the few sentences pertaining to george and isaac they were as follows by the way will i find there's a company here from rockland fine appearing fellows too most of them are and under good discipline i am especially pleased with the second lieutenant he's a magnificent-looking man and attracts attention wherever he goes that's george you know and rose quite as much pleased as annie herself nodded toward the latter whose pale cheek flushed with pride at hearing her husband thus spoken of by rose mather's brother yes but isaac interrupted the widow whereabouts does he come in oh pretty soon i'll get to him there's more about george yet answered rose as she resumed her reading i had the pleasure of talking with him yesterday and found him very intelligent and sensible if we had more men like him success would be sure and speedy he has about him a great deal of fun and humour which go far toward keeping up the spirits of his company and some of the poor fellows need it sadly there's a young boy in the ranks isaac sims who interests me greatly oh and the widow drew a long sigh as rose continued 
I wonder he was ever suffered to come. He seems so young, so girl-like, and so gentle. Still, he does a great deal of good, Lieutenant Graham tells me, by visiting the sick and sharing with them any delicacy he happens to have. He's rather homesick, I imagine, for when I asked him if he had a mother, his chin quivered in a moment, and I saw the tears standing in his eyes. Poor boy! I can't account for the interest I feel in him. Heaven grant that if we come to open fight he may not fall a victim. Yes, yes, my boy, my darling boy! And burying her face in her hard hands, the widow sobbed aloud. I thank you, Miss Mather, for reading me that, she said and I thank your brother for writing it. Tell him so, will you? Tell him I'm nothing but a cross, sour grain, snappish old woman, but I have a mother's heart, and I bless him for speaking so kindly of my boy. Rose's tears fell fast as she folded up the letter, and Annie's kept company with them. There was a bond of sympathy now between the three, as they talked together of the soldiers, Mrs. Sims and Annie devising various methods by which they might be benefited and Rose wishing she, too, could do something for them. "'But I can't,' she said despairingly. "'I never did anybody any real good in all my life. Only bothered them.' And Rose sighed as she thought how useless and aimless was her present mode of life. "'You'll learn by and by,' said the widow in a tone unusually soft for her. Then, as if the sock she held in her lap had suggested the idea, she continued, "'Can you knit?' Rose shook her head nor your mother neither. Again Rose shook her head, feeling quite ashamed that she should lack this accomplishment. Well, the widow went on, tain't much use to learn now. Twould take a year to get one stocking done, but if when winter comes that brother of yours wants socks and mittens or the like of that, tell him I'll knit em for him. Oh, you are so kind, cried Rose, thinking to herself how she'd send Widow Sim some pineapple preserves, such as she had with dessert that day. They grew to liking each other very fast after this, and Rose stayed until the little round table was arranged for tea and rolled to Annie's bedside. There was no plate for Rose, the widow having deemed it preposterous that she should stay, but the table looked so cosy, with its tiny black teapot and its nicely buttered toast, that Rose invited herself, with such a pretty, patronizing way, that the widow failed to see the condescension it implied. It did not, however, escape Annie's observation, but she could not feel angry with the little lady touching her bone-handled knife as if she were afraid of it, and looking round in quest of the napkin she failed to find, for Widow Sims had banished napkins from the table as superfluous articles, which answered no earthly purpose save the putting an extra four cents into the pocket of the washerwoman, Harry Baker's mother. It was growing late, and the sunset shadows were already creeping into the hollow when Rose bade Annie good-bye, promising to come again ere long, and wondering as she took her homeward way, whence came the calm, quiet peace which made Annie Graham so happy, even though her husband were far away in the midst of danger and death. Rose had heard that Annie was a Christian, and so were many others whom she knew, but they were much like herself good, well-meaning people, amiable, and submissive when everything went to suit them, but let their husbands once join the army and they would make quite as much a fuss as she, who did not profess to be anything. And then, for the first time in her life, Rose wished she too could learn from Annie's teacher and so have something to sustain her in case her husband should go. But he wouldn't go, and if he did, all the religion in the world could not make her resigned and the tears sprang to Rose's eyes as she hurried up the handsome walk to the piazza where Will sat smoking his cigar in the hazy twilight. She told him where she had been, and then sitting upon his knee told him of Annie, wishing she could be like her, and asking if he did not wish so too. Will made no direct reply. His thoughts were evidently elsewhere, and after a few minutes he said, hesitatingly, Would it break my darling's heart if I should join Tom at Washington? There was a cry of horror and Rose hid her face in her husband's bosom. "'Oh, Will, Will, you shan't, you can't, you mustn't and won't. I didn't know you ever thought of such a cruel thing. Don't you love me any more? I'll try to do better, I certainly will.' And Rose nestled closer to him, holding his hands just as Annie Graham had once held her husband's. "'You could not be much better, neither could I love you more than I do now, Rosa darling,' Mr. Mather replied, kissing her childish brow. But, Rosa, be reasonable once, and listen while I tell you how, ever since the fall of Sumter, I have thought the time would come when I should be needed, 
resolving to that when it came it should not find me a second sardanapalus the sudden lifting of rose's head and her look of perplexed inquiry showed that notwithstanding the fanciful ornament styled a diploma lying in her writing-desk sardanapalus had not the honour of being numbered among her acquaintances but her heart was too full to ask an explanation and her husband continued besides that there was a mutual understanding between tom and myself that if one went the other would and he has gone nobly laying aside all the party prejudice which for a time influenced his conduct our country needs more men yes yes gasped rose but more have gone there's scarcely a boy left in town and it's just so everywhere mr mather smiled as he replied i know the boys have gone boys whose fair beardless faces should put to shame a strong full-grown man like me and another class too have gone our labouring young men leaving behind them poverty and little helpless children whereas i have nothing of that kind for an excuse oh i wish i had a dozen children if that would keep you cried rose the insane idea flashing upon her that she would at once adopt a score or more of those she had seen playing in the muddy hollow that afternoon mr mather smiled and continued suppose you try and accustom yourself to the idea of living a while without me i shall not die until my appointed time and shall undoubtedly come back again don't you see no rose didn't her heart was too full of pain to see how going to war was just as sure a method of prolonging one's life as staying at home and she sobbed passionately one moment accusing her husband of not loving her as he used to and the next begging of him to abandon his wild project mr mather was a man of firm decision and long before he broached the subject to his wife his mind had been made up that his country called for him not for somebody else but for him personally that if the rebellion were to be crushed out men of wealth and influence must help to crush it not alone by remaining at home and urging others on though this were an important part but by actually joining in the combat and by their presence cheering and inspiring others and mr mather was going too had in fact already made arrangements to that effect and neither the tears nor entreaties of his young wife could avail to change his purpose but he did not tell her so that night he would rather come to it gradually taking a different course from that which george graham had pursued for where george had left the decision wholly to his wife mr mather had taken it wholly upon himself making it first and telling rose afterwards it was better so he thought and having said all to her that he wished to say on that occasion he tried to divert her mind into another channel but rose was not to be diverted it had come upon her like a thunderbolt the thing she so much dreaded and she wept bitterly seeing in the future which only a few hours before looked so bright and joyous nothing but impenetrable gloom for she could read her husband tolerably well and she intuitively felt that she had lost him that he was going from her never to come back she knew she should be a widow before she was nineteen and the host of summer dresses she meant to buy when she went back to boston changed into a widow's sombre weeds as rose saw herself arrayed in the habiliments of mourning what a fright she looked to herself in the widow's cap with which her vivid imagination disfigured her chestnut hair and she shuddered afresh as she thought how hideous she was in black poor simple little rose and yet we say again rose was not a fool nor yet an unnatural character there are many many like her some who will recognize themselves in this story and more who will not gay impulsive pleasure-seeking creatures whom fashionable education and too indulgent parents have done their utmost to spoil but who still possess many traits of excellence needing only adverse circumstances to mould and hammer them into the genuine coin of true-hearted womanhood such a one was rose reared by a fond mother petted by an older brother and teased by a younger flattered by friend and foe and latterly caressed and worshipped by a husband rose had come to think far too much of her own importance as mrs rose mather nay miss rose carleton of boston an acknowledged belle and leader of the ton there was a wide difference between rose and annie graham for while the latter in her sweet unselfishness thought only of her husband's welfare both here and hereafter rose's first impulse was a dread shrinking from being alone 
and her second terror lest the years of her youth now spread out so invitingly before her should be passed in secluded widowhood with nothing from the gay world without wherewith to feed her vanity and love for admiration still beneath rose's light exterior there was hidden a mine of tenderness and love a heart which when roused to action was capable of greater more heroic deeds than would at first seem possible and that heart was rousing too was gradually waking into life but not all at once and the tears which rose shed the whole night through were wrung out more from selfishness perhaps than from any higher feeling it would be so stupid living there alone in rockland if she could only go to washington with will it would not be half so bad but she could not for she waked will up from sound sleep to ask him if she might and he answered no falling away again to sleep and leaving rose to wakefulness and tears unmingled with any prayer that the cloud gathering so fast around her might some time break in blessings on her head it was scarcely light next morning when rose determining to prevail redoubled her entreaties for her husband to abandon the decision he now candidly acknowledged but she could not he was going to the war and going as a private rose almost fainted when he told her this and for a time refused to be comforted she might learn to bear it she said if he were an officer but to go as a common soldier like those she worked for at the hall was more than she could bear it was in vain that mr mather told her how only a few could be officers and that he was content to serve his country in any capacity leaving the more lucrative situations to those who needed them more he did not tell her he had declined a post of honour for the sake of one who seemed to him more worthy of it he would rather this should reach her from some other source and ere the day was over it did for in a small town like rockland it did not take long for every other one to know that william mather had enlisted as a private soldier when he might have been colonel of a regiment had he not given place to another because that other had depending on him a bedridden mother a crazy wife and six little helpless children how fast william mather rose in the estimation of those who never having known him intimately had looked upon him as a cold haughty man whose loyalty was somewhat doubtful and how proud rose felt even in the midst of her tears as she heard on every side her husband's praise even the widow sims ventured to the mather mansion telling her how glad she was and offering to do what she could for the volunteer while annie unable to do anything for herself could only pray that god would bring mr mather back safely to the child-wife who was so bowed down with grief how annie longed to see her and if possible impart to her some portion of the hopeful trust which kept her own soul from fainting beneath its burden of anxious uncertainty but the days passed on and rose came no more to the cottage in the hollow love for her husband had triumphed over every other feeling and rousing from her state of inertness she busied herself in doing or rather trying to do a thousand little things which she fancied might add to willie's comfort she called him willie now as if that name were dearer tenderer than will and the strong man every time he heard it felt a sore pang there was something so plaintive in the tone as if she were speaking of the dead it was a most beautiful summer day when at last he left her and rosa's heart was well nigh bursting with its load of pain it was all in vain that she said her usual form of prayer never more meaningless than now when her thoughts were so wholly absorbed with something else she did not pray in faith but because it was a habit of her childhood a something she rarely omitted unless in too great a hurry no wonder then that she rose up from her devotion quite as grief-stricken as when she first knelt down god does not often answer what is mere lip service and rose was yet a stranger to the prayer which stirs the heart and carries power with it the parting was terrible and mr mather more than half repented when he saw how tightly she clung to his neck begging him to take her with him or at least to send for her very soon what shall i do when you are gone what can i do she sobbed and her husband answered you can work for me darling work for all the soldiers it will help divert your mind i can't i can't was rose's answer i don't know how to work oh willie willie i wish there wasn't any war willie wished so too but there was no time now for regrets for a rumbling in the distance and a rising wreath of smoke on the western plain warned him not to tarry longer if he would go that day one more burning kiss one more fond pressure of the wife he loved so much a few more whispered words of hope and then another rockland volunteer had gone 
gone without daring to look backward to the little form lying just the same as he put it from him and yet not just the same he had felt it quivering with anguish when he took his arms away but the trembling quivering motion was over now and the form he had caressed lay motionless and still all unconscious of the dreary pain throbbing in the heart and all unmindful of the loud hurrah which greeted william mather as he stepped upon the platform of the car and waved his hat to those assembled there to see him off rose who had meant at the very last to be so heroic so brave so worthy the wife of a soldier had fainted End of chapter 4chapter five of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain five jimmy there were loving words being breathed into rose's ear when she came back to consciousness and there was something familiar in the touch of the hand bathing her brow and smoothing her tangled hair but rose was too weak and sick to notice who it was caring for her so tenderly until she heard the voice saying to her is my daughter better and then she threw herself with a wild scream of joy into the arms which had cradled her babyhood sobbing piteously oh mother mother willie has gone to the war willie has gone to the war it was very strange rose thought that her mother's tears should flow so fast and her face wear so sad an expression just because of will who was nothing but her son-in-law then it occurred to her that tom might be the occasion of her sadness but when she spoke of him asking why her mother had not prevailed on him to stay at home mrs carleton answered promptly i never loved him one half so well as on that night when he told me he had volunteered he would be unworthy of the carleton blood he bears were he to hesitate a moment and the eye of the brave new england matron kindled as she added if i had twenty sons i would rather all should die on the federal battlefield than have one turn traitor to his country oh jimmy jimmy my poor misguided boy it was a piteous cry which came from the depths of that mother's aching heart a cry so full of anguish that rose was startled and asked in much alarm what it was about jimmy had she heard from him and was he really dead no rose and in the mother's voice there was a hard bitter tone no not dead but better so than what he is oh i would so much rather he had died when a little innocent child than lived to bear the name he bears what name mother what has jimmy done do tell me you frighten me you look so white and rose clung closer to her mother who with quivering lip and faltering voice told her how her recreant runaway jimmy had joined the confederate army under beauregard and was probably then marching on to washington to meet her other son in deadly conflict it might be his hand the very one perhaps to speed the fratricidal bullet which should shed a brother's life blood no wonder that her heart grew faint when she thought of her boy as a rebel ay a rebel of ten times deeper dye than if he had been born of southern blood and reared on southern soil for the roof-tree which sheltered his childhood was almost beneath the shadow of bunker hill's monument and many an hour had he sported at its base playing directly above the graves of those brave men who fell that awful day when the fierce thunders of war shook the hills of boston and echoed across the smoky waters of the bay far up the lofty tower too as high as he could reach his name was written with his own boyish hand and the mother had read it there since receiving the shameful letter which told of his disgrace climbing up the weary winding flight of stairs she had looked through blinding tears upon that name james madison carleton half hoping it had been erased it seemed so like a mockery to have it there on freedom's monument and know that he who bore it was a traitor to his country yet there it was just as he left it years ago and with a blush of shame the mother crossed it out just as she fain would have crossed out his sin could that have been but it could not she knew that jimmy was in the southern army and not wishing to speak of it at home where he already bore no envied name she had come for sympathy to her only daughter and it was well for both she did for it helped to divert rose's grief into a new and different channel to set her right on many points and gradually to obliterate all marks of what some had called secession tom had been her pride the brother she honoured and feared while jimmy nearer her age was more a companion of her childhood the one who teased and petted her by turns 
one day putting angle-worms in her bosom just to hear her scream and the next spending all his pocket-money to buy her the huge wax doll she saw in the shop window down on washington street and coveted so badly such were some of rose's reminiscences of jimmy and while time had softened down the horrid sensation she experienced when she felt the cold worms crawling on her neck it had not destroyed the doll the handsomest she had ever owned nor made her cease to love the teasing boy she could not feel just as her mother did about him for she had not her mother's strong patriotic feeling but her tears flowed none the less while she too half wished him lying beneath the summer grass in beautiful mount auburn how did you hear from him she asked when her first burst of grief was over and her mother replied by taking out a letter on which rose recognized her brother's handwriting he sent me this mrs carleton said and tearing open the letter she read it aloud to rose richmond virginia june 1861 dear mother pray don't think you've seen a ghost when you recognize my writing you thought me dead i suppose but there's no such good news as that i'm bullet-proof i reckon or i should have died in new orleans last summer when the yellow fever and i had such a squabble i was dreadfully sick then and half wished i had not run away for i knew you would feel badly when you heard how i died with nobody to care for me and was tumbled into the ground head sticking out as likely as any way i used to talk about you old martha said and about rose too dear little rose i actually laid down my pen just now and laughed aloud as i thought how she looked when i treated her to those worms telling her i had a necklace for her didn't she dance and didn't tom thrash me too till i saw stars well he never struck me a blow amiss though i used to think he did i was a sorry scamp mother the biggest rascal in boston but i've reformed i have upon my word and you ought to see how the people here smile upon and flatter me telling me what a nice chap i am and all that sort of thing in short mother to come at once to the point and not spend an hour in arguing as tom used to do when he took me up in the attic where he kept the gads you know in short i've been naturalized have sworn allegiance to the future southern monarchy and am as true as southern blood as you would wish to see i've got a palmetto cockade on my cap a tiny confederate flag on my sleeve and what is best of all i've joined the southern army under beauregard and shall shortly bring the war to the threshold of the capital licking the yankees there congregated like fun it's about time now mother for you to ring for margaret you'll want the camphor and make a fuss of course so while you are enjoying that diversion i'll go and practice a little with my gun you know i could never hit a barn without shooting twice but i'm improving fast and shall soon be able to pick off a yankee at a distance of a mile two o'clock p m well mother i take it for granted you are nicely tucked up in bed with the curtains drawn and a wet rag on your head as the result of what i've told you i'm sorry that you should feel so badly and wish i could see you for an hour or so as i could surely convince you we are right we have been browbeaten and trodden upon by the north until forbearance has ceased to be a virtue and now that they've thrown down the gauntlet we will meet them on their own terms i dare say that they have made you believe that we struck the first blow by firing into sumter but mother those northern papers do lie so all except the herald and a few others which occasionally come within a mile of the truth but even they have been bribed recently or something if you want the unbiased truth of the matter subscribe for the richmond examiner or better yet the charleston mercury whose editor is a new england man and of course is capable of judging right he knows what has brought on this war he'll tell you how the south carolinians generously bore the insult of the federal flag flying there defiantly in their faces until they could bear it no longer and so one day we pitched in i say we for i was there in fort moultrie and saw the fight but did not join for the brave fellows out of compliment to my having been born near bunker hill said i needn't so i mounted a cotton bale and looked on feeling i'll admit some as i used to on the fourth of july when i saw how noble old sumter played her part and once when a shell burst within ten feet of me turning things generally topsy-turvy and blowing shirt-sleeves and coat-sleeves and waistbands and boots higher than a kite i was positively guilty of hurrahing for the stars and stripes i couldn't help it to save me and yet mother i believe the north wrong and the south right but so generous a people are we that all we ask now is for you to let us alone and if the lincolnites won't do that 
why then we must stoop to fight the mudsills it's all humbug too about the negroes being on the verge of insurrection a more faithful devoted set i never saw they'll fight for their masters until they die every man of them tom will tell you that what are his politics bell and everett i dare say so there's no danger of my meeting him in battle and i'm glad of it for to tell the truth i should feel rather ticklish raising my gun against old tom maybe though he is humbugged like the rest and forms a part of that unit said to exist at the north what sort of a thing is that mother what does it look like democrats and republicans abolitionists and garrisonites all melted in one crucible and bearing abraham's image and superscription i wish i could see it must have changed mightily round boston from what they used to be when they quarrelled so some against and some for southern rights and southern people but strange things happen nowadays and it may be tom too has turned his coat and taken sides with the federals if so all i can say is tommy oh tommy beware of the day when southern bloods meet thee in battle array for a field of weak cowards rushes full on my sight and the ranks of the yankees are scattered in flight won't we rout them though i shall fight next time i've played pollywog long enough i am regularly enlisted now am a rebel as you call us at home nothing very bad about that either as i can prove to you if you'll take the trouble to hunt up my old dog-eared history of the united states where washington is styled by the british the rebel chief the south are only doing what the thirteen did in seventy six trying to shake off the tyrant's yoke it's the same thing precisely only the shoe is on the other foot and pinches mightily we did not at first intend to subjugate the north but maybe they'll provoke us to do it if they keep on now however we only want or rather did want a peaceable separation and you may as well yield to it first as last what do you intend doing with us anyway suppose you succeed in licking us hold us as a conquered province just as england holds ireland much good that will do you it will be some like keeping a mad dog chained so tightly that he cannot get away but is none the less snappish and non come at table for that no no acknowledge our independence and call home the chaps you have dragged from poor houses and state prisons lanes and ditches and sent to fight against southern gentlemen this to me is the most humiliating feature of the whole and if i must be shot or taken prisoner i hope it will be by some one worthy of my steel this last i'm writing for old tom's benefit give him my compliments and tell him nothing would please me more than to welcome him to our camp some day dear little rose perhaps she would not let a rebel kiss her and i don't know but i'd turn federal for half an hour or so for the sake of tasting her sweet lips once more i do love rose and i feel a mysterious lump in my throat every time i look at her picture taken just before i left home i never show it for somehow it would seem like profanation to have the soldiers staring at it so i wear it next my heart and when i go into battle i shall keep it there perhaps it will save my life who knows i am getting tired and must close ere long now mother please don't waste too many tears over me the time will come when you'll see we are right and if it will be any consolation i will say in conclusion that i have written a heap worse than i really believe i am not a fool i understand exactly how the matter stands but i like the southern side the best i think they are just as near right as the north and i am going to stick to them through thick and thin we shall have a battle before long and this may be the last time i'll ever write to you i've been a bad boy mother and troubled you so much but if i'm shot you will forget all that and only remember how with all my faults i loved you still you and tom and little rose more than you ever guessed by the way i believe i'll send you a lock of my hair cut just over my left ear where you used to think it curled so nicely perhaps it will enhance its value if you know i severed it with a bowie knife such as i now carry with me tell rose i'll send her a calico dress by and by it will be the most costly present i can make her if the blockade is carried out but it won't be that old bull across the sea will be goring you with his horns first you know then you'll have a sweet time up there beset before and behind and possibly annexed to canada but i don't want to make you feel any bluer than you are probably feeling so good-bye good-bye your affectionate rebel james m carleton p s 
i shall send this to washington by a chap who is going to desert you know and join the federals with a pitiful story about having been pressed into the rebel service telling them too how poor and weak and demoralized we are how a handful of troops can lick us and so draw them into our web as a spider tempts a fly don't you see they offered me that honour knowing that a son of george carleton twice m c from massachusetts and now defunct would be above suspicion and would thus gather a heap of items but hang me if i could turn spy on any terms so i respectfully declined you see i am quite a somebody owing to my having had sense enough to wait until i was twenty-one ere i ran away and so bringing a part of my property with me money makes the mare go here as elsewhere but i'm about running out i wish you could send me a few thousand can't you and this was jimmy's letter over which the mother had wept far bitterer tears than any she shed when her eldest-born bade her his last farewell giving to her just as jimmy had done a lock of his brown hair she had it with her now and she laid them both on rosa's hand the dark brown lock and the short black silken curl which twined itself around rosa's finger as if it loved the snowy resting-place rosa's first impulse was to shake it off as if it had been a guilty thing but the sight of it recalled so vividly the handsome saucy face and laughing mischievous black eyes it once had helped to shade that she pressed it to her lips and whispered sadly dear jimmy i cannot hate him if i try nor see how he is greatly at fault while in her heart was the unframed prayer that god would care for the rebel boy and bring him back to them mrs carleton was proud of her family name proud of her family pride and she shrank from having it known how it had been disgraced so after rosa's first grief was over she bade her keep it a secret and rose promised readily never doubting for a moment her ability to do so rose had already borne much that morning excessive weeping for her husband added to what she had heard of jimmy took her strength away and she spent that first weary day in bed sometimes sobbing bitterly as the dread reality came over her that will was really gone and again starting up from a feverish broken sleep with the idea that it was all a dream or a horrid nightmare from which she should at last awake callers were all excluded and with a delicious feeling that she was not to be disturbed rose late in the afternoon lay watching the western sunlight dancing on the wall when a step upon the stairs was heard and in a moment widow sims appeared her sharp face softening into an expression of genuine pity when she saw how white and wan rose was looking they tried to keep me out she said that brawny cook of yours and that filigree waiting-maid but i would come up and here i am then sitting down by rose she told her annie had sent her there she's sorry for you the widow said and she sent this to tell you so and the widow handed rose a tiny note written by annie graham once rose would have resented the act as implying too much familiarity but her heart was greatly softened while had she tried her best she could not have regarded annie graham in the light of an inferior tearing open the envelope she read my dear mrs mather i am sure you will pardon the liberty i am taking my apology is that i feel so deeply for you for i understand just what you are suffering understand how wearily the hours drag on knowing as you do that with the waning daylight his step will not be heard just by the door making in your heart little throbs of joy such as no other step can make i am so sorry for you and i had hoped you at least might be spared but god in his wisdom has seen fit to order it otherwise and we know that what he does is right still it is hard to bear harder for you than for me perhaps and when this morning i heard the car signal given i knelt just where i did when my own husband went away and asked our heavenly father to bring your willie back in safety and mrs mather i am sure he will for i felt even then an answer to my prayer something which said it shall be as you ask dear mrs mather try to be comforted try to see the brighter side try to pray and be sure the darkness now enveloping you so like a pall will pass away and the sunshine be the brighter for the cloud come and see me when you feel like it and remember you have at least two friends who pray for you one at the father's right hand in heaven and one in her cottage in the hollow annie graham rose had not wept more passionately than she did now as she kissed the note and wished she were one half as good as annie graham but i am not she said and never shall be tell her to keep praying until will comes home again i will tell her returned the widow but wouldn't it be well enough to try what you can do at it yourself and not leave it all for her 
try what i can do at praying rose exclaimed i can't do anything only the few words i always say at night and they have nothing in them about will brought up like a heathen muttered the widow feeling within herself that to the names of her own sons and captain carleton william mathers must now be added when as was her daily custom she took her troubles to one who has said cast your burdens upon the lord for he careth for you we'll both remember your husband miss graham and i so don't fret yourself to death she said soothingly as rose broke into a fresh burst of tears it isn't him so much rose sobbed though that is terrible and it will kill me i most know but there's something else that ails me a great deal worse than that at least mother has made me think it is though i can't quite see how having one's brother join the rebel army is so very bad rose forgot her promise of secrecy just as her mother might have known she would the story of the carleton disgrace was told and perfectly aghast the horrified widow listened to it your brother a rebel she almost shrieked a good-for-nothing ill-begotten rebel i thought you said he was a captain of a company and mentally the widow struck from her list of names that of poor scandalized tom that very moment perspiring at every pore as he went through with his evening drill within the federal camp no no rose cried vehemently not tom i have another brother a younger one jimmy we call him did you never hear of jimmy who ran away more than a year ago never and the staunch patriot of a widow pursed up her thin lips with an expression which plainly said the carleton family had fallen greatly in her estimation in spite of all tom had said of isaac rose however was not good at reading expressions and taking it for granted the widow wanted to hear all about it she told her what she knew marvelling much at the rigid silence her auditor maintained isn't it shameful she asked when she had finished shameful yes i hope he'll be catched and hung higher than haman i'll furnish the rope to hang him was the indignant widow's reply and ere rose could quite make out what ailed her she had said good afternoon and banging the door behind her was hurrying off muttering to herself something wrong in their bringin up needn't tell me i'd like to see my boys turn and traitor the rascal and as by this time the widow had reached the shop where she was to stop for burning fluid she turned into the little store and catching up the can with a jerk spilt a part of its contents upon her clean gingham dress and then hurried off again with rapid strides toward the cottage in the hollow the carletons tom and all were below par in her opinion and kept sinking lower and lower until she reached the cottage where she gave vent to her wrath as follows a pretty how do you do up to miss martha's her brother jim has joined the cowardly sneakin low-lived contemptible rebels and is comin on to take washington the scallywag if things go on at this rate i'll join the army myself and tire and feather every one on em needn't tell me annie was no lover of gossip and knowing that the widow was terribly excited she made no reply except to pass her a letter bearing the washington postmark this had the desired effect and utterly oblivious of jimmy the widow tore open isaac's letter in which he spoke of captain carleton as being very kind to him and very popular with the soldiers i would fight for him till the very last isaac wrote he has been so good to me always noticing me with a bow when he comes into our regiment as he sometimes does and when he can speaking to me a pleasant word he knows i sought his sister's wood for i told him so it seems so mean-like to be passing myself off better than i am and you know a soldier's dress does improve a chap mightily giving him kind of a dandy air why even harry baker and bill look like gentlemen though harry gets drunk awfully and has been in the guard-house twice but as i was saying captain carleton didn't appear to think it a bit less of me though he struck me on the shoulder and laughed kind of queer when i said why i told him i sawed mrs mathers wood and the next day i saw him talking with our colonel and heard something about sergeant and isaac sims and too young to be expedient then when i met him again he asked me wasn't i twenty-one in such a way that i knew he wanted me to tell him yes but mother i thought of that prayer we said together the morning i came away lead us not into temptation and i couldn't tell a lie though the answer stuck in my throat and choked me so but i out with it at last i said no sir i was only eighteen last thanksgiving and then his face had the same look it wore when i told him i was a wood sawyer 
and so i suppose you'll be nineteen next thanksgiving he said adding you don't know what you lost by telling the truth so frankly but the moral gain is much greater than the loss you are a brave boy isaac sims and worthy of being a second george washington i do like him so much can't you send him something mother if it's nothing more than the nice cough candy you used to make or some of that poke ointment i notice he coughs occasionally and i heard him say his feet were sore i'd like to give him something just to see his handsome white teeth when he laughed and said thank you my boy oh i would almost die for captain carleton surely after reading this the widow could feel no more animosity against the carletons on account of jimmy's sin every family must have a black sheep she said to annie though where hers was she could not tell it surely was not john nor eli nor isaac so she guessed it must have been the girl baby that died before it was born and for whom she shed so many tears she shouldn't do it again she'd bet for if it had lived it would most likely have cut up some rusty or other just as jim carleton had married bill baker like as not and with this consolatory reflection the widow took up isaac's letter for a second time resolving in her own mind that she would send that captain carleton something if she set up nights to make it i'm glad my boy didn't tell a lie she whispered softly to herself as she came again to that part of the letter poor weak human nature creeping in with the same thought and suggesting how grand it would be to have him sergeant sims with the increased wages per month it would have brought this was the old adam counselling within her while the new adam said better never to be promoted than lose his integrity and with a silent prayer for the boy who would not tell a lie the widow folded up the letter and then repeated to annie the particulars of jimmy carleton in a much milder manner than she would have done an hour before so much good little acts of kindness do stretching on link after link until they reach a point from which they recoil in blessings on the doer's head thus captain carleton's friendly words to isaac sims were the direct means of saving his mother and sister from the bitter prejudice the rockland people in their then excitable state might have felt toward them had widow sims told the story of jimmy in the spirit she surely would have told it had it not been for isaac's timely letter this together with a little judicious caution from annie changed her tactics and though she that very night had several opportunities for telling how miss mathers's brother was a rebel and that miss mathers couldn't see the mighty harm in it if he was she kept it to herself speaking only of the noble tom so kind to her boy isaac End of chapter five Chapter Six and Seven of Rose Mather, A Tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Six, finding something to do for the war. The next morning, the Mather carriage containing both Mrs. Carleton and Rose drove down the hollow and stopped in front of Annie's gate. Mrs. Carleton's business was with Widow Sims, who was mixing bread in the kitchen, and who experienced considerable trepidation when told the grand Boston lady had asked for her. "'I'm pesky glad I hain't tattled about Jim,' she thought, as washing the flour from her hands and hooking her sleeves at the wrist, she entered the sitting-room and, with a low curtsy, waited to hear the lady's errand. Mrs. Carleton had come with a request that the widow should not repeat what Rose had so heedlessly told her the previous night you may think it strange that i care so much mrs carleton said and until you are placed in similar circumstances you cannot understand how i shrink from having it known that my son could fall so low or do so great injustice to his early training if the widow had possessed one particle of prejudice against the carletons this would have disarmed her entirely but she did not isaac's letter had swept that all away and she replied that jimmy's secret was as safe with her as if locked up in an iron chest i did feel blazin mad at you though for a spell she said for i thought you might have brung him up better but this cured me entirely and she handed isaac's letter to rose bidding her read it aloud noble boy you must be proud of him was mrs carleton's comment while rose ever impulsive seized upon a new idea it would be so nice for the rockland ladies to fit up a box of things and send to company r reserving a corner for tom and will she should do it anyway on her own responsibility if nobody chose to help her and she whispered to annie that george should have a large share of the delicacies she would provide 
you may send that candy to tom if you choose she said to the widow though i think cod liver oil would be better and the ointment too only it mustn't sit near my preserves for fear the two will get mixed rose had found something to do and so absorbed was she in a plan which every one approved that she forgot to cry all the time for will as she had fully intended doing up the streets and down she went sometimes walking sometimes riding but always in a flurry always excited now tumbling over dry goods boxes in quest of one large enough to hold the many articles preparing in rockland for the then ill-fed suffering soldiers of the thirteenth regiment now up at the express office bargaining about the expense which she meant to bear herself and now down at the hall adroitly smoothing over little bickerings frequently arising among the ladies assembled there concerning the articles sent in some declaring the fried apple pies brought by mrs baker should not go nor yet the round balls of dutch cheese she had saved sour milk two weeks to make just because billy relished it so much long with apple turnovers poor old mrs baker it was the best she could do and when rose saw how the tears came at the prospect of billy's losing the feast she had prepared with so much care she declared the cheese should go if she had to send it in a separate box it was just so with the widow's poke ointment some of the ladies wondering what next would be brought in and what it could be for rose knew exactly what twas for tom had corns and the despised salve was for him so that should go if nothing else but when susan ruggles sims her thoughts intent on john brought in a round of roasted veal which her mother-in-law said would be in a most lively condition by the time it reached washington rose after suggesting that it be packed in ice and put in a refrigerator yielded for once and persuaded the girl wife to carry home her veal which would most surely be spoiled ere john came to see it you can write him a nice long letter she said when she saw how disappointed susan looked you can tell him your intentions were good until we old experienced married ladies persuaded you out of them so susan with a sigh carried back her nice stuffed roast the widow muttering in an aside tone that's all them shiftless ruglesses know might as well send maggots and done with it it was a strange medley that huge box contained for every member of company r was remembered thanks to the indefatigable rose who procured a list of the names and when she found any without friends in that immediate vicinity she supplied the deficiency from her own store of luxuries of course will and tom fared the best while next to them came lieutenant graham and isaac sims rose writing a tiny note to the latter telling him how much she liked him for speaking so of tom and sending him a pair of her fine linen sheets because she couldn't think of anything else and thought these would be cool to sleep in on hot summer nights dear little rose how fast she grew in popularity the people wondering they had never seen before how good she was and imputing some portion of her present interest to the presence of her mother who had made arrangements to remain for an indefinite length of time in rockland and who far less demonstrative than her active daughter did much by her sensible advice to keep the wheel in motion and rose from overdoing the matter so zealously taken in hand the box was packed at last every chink and crevice was full mrs baker's dutch cheese and fried apple pies were there wrapped by rose mather in innumerable folds of paper tied around with yards of the strongest twine she could find and safely stowed away where they could not be harmed widow sim's ointment too and the candy she had made occupied a corner together with her daguerreotype sent to isaac and a letter to captain carleton that letter was a mammoth undertaking but the widow felt it her duty to write it groaning and sweating and consulting perry's old leather-bound dictionary for every word of which she felt at all uncertain and driving poor annie nearly distracted with asking if this were grammar and if that were too lovin'-like for a widder to send a widower not a little amused annie gave the required advice smiling in spite of herself as she read the note the widow handed her and which ran as follows my dear mr captain carleton i can't help puttin dear before your name you seem so nigh to me since isaac told how kind you was to him i'm nothin but a shrivelled dried-up widder fifty odd years old but i've got a mother's heart big enough to take you in with my other boys i know you are a nice clever man but whether you're a good one as i call good i don't know though being you come from boston i'm afraid you're a unitarian and i'll never quit prayin for you till i know that's about all i can do for i'm poor a'most as job's turkey but if there's any shirts or trousers or the like o that wants makin let me know for i don't believe your mother or sister is great at sewin 
mrs marthers ain't i know though as nice a little body as ever drawed the breath your wife is dead too they say and that comes hard again i know just how that feels for my man died eighteen years ago last october a few weeks before isaac was born i send you some intment for your feet and some bits of linen rags to bind round your toes also some red pepper candy in my likeness to isaac he'll let you see it if you want to it don't peer to me that my eyes is as dull as that or my lips so puckered up but we can't see as others see us and i ain't an atom proud heaven bless you for being kind to isaac and if an old woman's prayers and blessings is of any use you may be sure you have mine if you come to battle be so good as to oversee him won't you and get him put way back if you can excuse haste and a bad pen yours with regret mrs belinda sims this was the widow's letter sent with tom's parcel to washington where the box was greeted by the company with exclamations of joy and could those who sent it have seen the eager happy faces of each one as he found he was remembered they would have felt doubly repaid for all the trouble and annoyance it had cost them only one growl of dissatisfaction was heard and that from harry baker who with a muttered oath exclaimed as he undid his paper parcel apple turnovers by jing sour than swill and mouldier than the rot hello bill got some too i see what in fury is this dutch cheese as i'm alive make good bullets for secesh so here goes and the next moment there whizzed through the air the cheese poor old mrs baker had found so hard to smuggle in the apple pies followed next and then the reckless harry amused himself with jeering at bill who after carefully stowing away in his pocket the large strong twine rose mather had bound around the paper parcel seated himself upon the ground and was munching away at his pie not because he liked it but because his mother had sent it and billy's mother was dearer to him now than when he was at home meanwhile in another part of the camp tom carleton was opening his parcel while around him stood a group of officers some his personal friends whom he had known in boston there must be some mistake he said as he daubed his white fingers with the sticky candy but rose had packed his things in a separate box and directed it herself there could be no mistake and he continued his investigations coming next upon the widow's picture which rose had carelessly placed in his parcel it would be impossible to describe tom's look of amazement and perplexity as his eye fell upon the face which looked out upon him from its glass covering precise puckered and prim with a decided best clothes air who could it be tom asked this question aloud while his companions laughingly declared it some lady love he had left behind suggesting at last that he read the note which lay just beneath it as that might explain the mystery so tom did read it with a fellow-officer looking over his shoulder and reading too but there was too much of the anxious genuine mother tone about that letter to cause more than three or four hearty laughs at the expense of tom and the widow tom knew now for whom the picture was intended and he carried it to isaac but it was many a day ere tom carleton heard the last of mrs belinda sims numerous were the thanks sent by company r to rose for her kind thoughtfulness in setting afloat a plan which brought them so much good and rose as she received the messages wished it was all to be done again and wondered what she could find to do next one of will's letters told her at last what to do she could be kind to the soldiers if there were any in rockland she could visit their families speak to them words of comfort and supply if needful their necessities this was just what suited her and she commenced her task with a right good will startling many an awkward youth wearing a soldier's dress by accosting him in the street inquiring into his history and frequently ending the interview by offering him her soft white hand and leaving in his rougher one a piece of money which affected him less than the brightness of the brilliant eyes he remembered long after the silver was spent every soldier's wife and every soldier's mother was looked after and the mather carriage was oftener seen in the muddy hollow and by lanes in rockland than at the gates of more pretentious dwellings harry's mother and bill's and others of her standing blessed the little lady for the sunshine brought so often to their squalid homes while annie and widow sims prayed from a full heart that no evil should befall the husband or the brother of the heroic rose seven the battle 
brightly beautifully the sabbath morning broke over all the hills of the northland covering them with floods of rosy light burnishing the forest trees with sheens of gold and cresting each tall spire with colours which seemed born of paradise so radiantly bright they looked flashing from their lofty resting-place and glancing off across the valleys where the fields of waving corn and summer wheat were growing to the westward too where prairie on prairie stretches on into almost interminable space the same july sun was shining as quietly as peacefully as if in the hearts of men there burned no bitter feeling of fierce and vindictive hate no thirsting for each other's blood oh how calm how still it was that sunday morning both east and north and west and as the sun rose higher in the heavens how soothingly the bells rang out their musical chimes from new england's templed hills to the far-off shores of oregon the echoes rose and fell ceasing only when ceased the tramp of the many feet hastening up to worship god in his appointed way old and young rich and poor father and mother sister and brother husband and wife assembling together to keep the holy day that best day of the seven praying not so much for their own sins forgiven as for the loved ones gone to war the dear ones far away and little little dreaming as they prayed how the same sun stealing so softly up the church's aisle and shining on the church's wall was even then looking down on a far different scene a scene of carnage blood and death for off to the southward near where the waters of the potomac ripple past the grave of our nation's hero another concourse of people was gathered together their sunday bell the cannon's roar their sunday hymn the battle cry long before the earliest robin had trilled its matin song they had been on the move their bristling bayonets glittering in the brilliant moonlight like the december frost as with regular even tread they kept on their winding way knowing not if the pale stars watching their course so pityingly as it were would ever shine on them again onward 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 still they pressed over the hills through the ravines down the valleys across the fields till the same sun which shone so softly on their distant homes rose also over the federal fly as it has been aptly termed moving onward to the web which lay beyond so well concealed and so devoid of sound that none could guess that the treacherous woods wearing so cool so inviting a look were sheltering a mighty expectant host watching as eagerly for the advancing foe as ever ambushed spider waited for its deluded prey backward backward stretched the confederate army line after line rank after rank battalion after battalion until in numbers it more than quadrupled that handful of men steadily moving on from out their leafy covert the enemy peered exulting that the fortunes of the great republic their whilom mother were so surely within their power and pausing for a time in sheer wantonness just as a kitten sports with the mouse she has already captured and knows cannot escape onward 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 swept the federal troops their polished arms and glittering uniforms flashing in the morning sunlight just as the flag for which they fought waved in the morning breeze they were weary and worn and their lips were parched with feverish thirst for hours had passed since they had tasted food or water but not for this did they tarry there was no faltering in their ranks no faintly beating heart no wild yearning to be away no timid shrinking from what the woods now just before them might hold in store and when the whisper ran along the lines that the enemy was in view there was not felt save joy that the long suspense was ended and the fray about to commence there was a halt in the front ranks and while they stand there thus let us look once more upon those whom we have known just where the good-humoured faces of the irish regiment and the tall caps of the highlanders are perceptible the thirteenth appears in view our company marching decorously on no lagging no faltering no cowards there though almost every heart had in it some thought of home and the dear ones left behind prayers were said by lips unused to pray and who shall tell how many records of sins forgiven were that morning written in heaven bibles too were pressed to throbbing hearts and to none more closely than to george graham's broad chest he had prayed that morning in the clear moonlight and by the same moonlight he had tried to read a line in annie's well-worn bible opening to where god promises to care for the widow and the fatherless was it ominous that passage did it mean that he so strong so vigorous so full of life should bite the dust ere many hours were done he could not believe it he was too full of hope for that 
he could not die with annie at home alone so he buttoned her bible over his heart and prayed that if a bullet struck him it might be there fondly hoping that it would break its force there was a shadow on his handsome face and it communicated itself to isaac sims who was glancing so stealthily at him and guessing of what he was thinking isaac too had prayed in the moonlight and he too had thought what if i should be killed wondering if his mother ever would forget her soldier boy even though she might not weep over his nameless grave this to isaac was the hardest thought of all the boy that would not tell a lie for the sake of promotion was not afraid to die but he preferred that it should not be there amid piles of bloody slain he would rather death should come to him in the humble attic where he had lain so oft and listened to the patter of the rain on the roof above or feigned to be asleep when his mother stole noiselessly across the threshold to see if he were covered from the cold and shielded from the snow which sometimes found an entrance through a crevice in the wall tis strange when we are in danger what flights our fancy often takes gathering up the minutest details of our past life and spreading them out before us with startling distinctness so isaac with possible death in advance thought of his past life of every object connected with his home from the grass plat in the rear where his mother bleached her clothes in spring to the blue and white checked blanket hung round his attic bed to protect him from the winter storm that widow so stern so harsh so sharp to almost every one had been the tenderest of parents to him and a tear glistened on the cheek of the fair-haired boy as he remembered the only time he ever was hateful to her he had asked her forgiveness for it and she surely would not recall it when she read the letter eli or john would send bearing the fatal line mother poor isaac is dead he knew they would call him poor isaac for though they sometimes teased him as his mother's great girl baby they petted him quite as much as she only in a different way and he felt now that both would step between him and the bullet they thought would harm him eli would anyway but john perhaps would hesitate as he now loved susan best isaac was proud of his brothers and he glanced admiringly at them as they marched side by side keeping even step just as they did down main street with his mother and susan looking on one now was thinking of susan and one of his widowed mother close by isaac walked bill quiet and subdued he had not prayed that morning he never prayed but when he saw isaac kneeling on his blanket he had said to him manage to get in a word or two for me and hal we need it mercy knows and surely if ever poor mortal needed a prayer it was hal as his brother styled him half stupefied with the vile liquor he had constantly managed to get he trudged on boasting of what he could do only give him a chance and he'd lick the entire secession army he'd like to see the ball that could kill him he was good at dodging he'd show him a thing or two in the way of fight he'd take the tuck out of the southern gentleman yes he would and so he went thoughtlessly boasting on to death will mather was not there indisposition had detained him at washington and with a hearty godspeed he had sent his comrades on their way lamenting that he too could not join them and bidding his brother-in-law do some fighting for him at the head of his company captain carleton moved firm erect and dignified as if born to command he did full justice to the carleton name of which he was justly proud but his face was paler than its wont and a tinge of sadness rested upon it as his regiment halted at last in front of what was supposed to be the hidden foe thomas carleton had wept bitter tears when he laid his mary to rest beneath south carolina's sunny skies and had thought he could never be reconciled to the loss but he was half glad now that she was dead for she was born of southern blood and he would rather she should not know the errand which had brought him to virginia where first he met and loved her rather she should not know how he had come to war with her people there was another thought too which made him sad that july day the green beautiful woods standing there so silently before him probably sheltered more than one with whom he had in bygone days struck the friendly hand and bandied the friendly joke for his home was once in richmond and there were there those who once held no small place in his heart and they were dear to him yet he was not fighting against them personally he was contending only for his nation's rights his country's honour he bore no malice toward his southern brethren and like many of our staunchest bravest northern men he would even then have met them more than half way with terms of reconciliation he knew they were no race of bloodthirsty demons as some fanatics had madly termed them they were men most of them like himself 
warm-hearted impulsive men generous almost to a fault in peace but firm and terrible in war tom had lived among them had shared their hospitalities had seen them in their various phases and making allowance for the vast difference which education and habits of society make in one's opinions he saw many points wherein the north had misunderstood their actions and not made due concessions when they might have done so without yielding one iota of their honour but time for concession was over now political fanatics had stirred up the mass of the people till naught but blood could wash away the fancied wrong and they were there that sabbath morn to spill it tom however did not know that the green silent wood sheltered his brother for his mother had purposely withheld from him the fact that jimmy had joined the southern army she knew the struggle it had cost him to take up arms against the people he liked so much and she would not willingly add to his burden by telling him of jimmy's sin and it was well she did not for had he known how near he was to jimmy he could not have stood there so unmoved awaiting the first booming gun which should herald the opening of the battle it came at last a bellowing thunderous roar whose echoes shook the hills for miles as the hissing shell went ploughing through the air bursting harmlessly at last just beyond its destined mark the enemy were in no hurry to retort for a deep silence ensued broken ere long by another heavy gun which did its work more thoroughly than its predecessor had done for where several breathing souls had been there was naught left save the bleeding mutilated trunks of what were once human forms the battle had commenced sherman's brigade in which was the new york thirteenth did its part nobly overrunning in its headlong charges battery after battery and wrecking little of the shafts of death falling so thick and fast louder and more deafening grew the battle din hoarser and heavier the battle thunder denser deeper the battle smoke dimming the brightness of that sabbath morn louder shriller grew the gaelic scream fiercer rose the celtic cry wilder rang the yells of the thirteenth as its members plunged into the thickest of the fight their demoniacal shouts appalling the hearts of the foe far more than the rain of shot so vigorously kept up and causing them to flee as from a pack of fiends steady in its place george graham's giant form was seen no thought of annie now no thought of home no thought of bible buttoned over the heart thoughts only of the fray and victory not far away and where the fight was thickest the widow's boys eli and john stood firm as granite rocks the beaded sweat dropping from their burning brows begrimed with battle smoke as with unflinching nerve and hands that trembled not they took their aims seeing more than one fall before their sure fire white as the winter snow one boyish face gleamed amid the excited throng the fair hair pushed back from the girlish forehead and the scorching sun falling upon the unsheltered head for isaac's cap had been shot away and the ball which shot it lay swimming in the dark life blood of poor harry baker just behind and just two inches taller than the widow's youngest born poor harry he had done his best to keep the promise made so boastfully in all the thirteenth regiment there was not one who played a braver part than he firing off with every gun a timely joke which raised a smile even in that dreadful hour but harry's work was done and mrs baker had but one boy now for her first-born lay upon the ground so blackened and disfigured with the thick brain slowly oozing from his mangled head and the purple gore pouring from his lips that only those who saw him fall could guess that it was harry poor harry we say it again sadly reverently for rude and reckless though he was he fell fighting for his country and to all who perished thus we owe a debt of gratitude a meed of praise sacred then be the memory of those whose graves are with the slain far away beneath virginia's sky and sacred to the memory of poor harry baker his own worst enemy he lived his life's brief span and died at last a soldier's death shot plumb through the upper story won't the old woman row it though was bill's characteristic comment as the whizzing and the death shriek met his ear and the falling bleeding figure met his view spite of his jeering words there was a keen pang in billy's heart as he shrank away from the gory mass he knew had been his brother a sudden upheaving of something in his throat and a blur before his vision as he began to realize what it was to go to war but there was then no time to waste over a fallen brother the dread work must go on and with the whispered words poor hal i'll do the tender for you when we get the varmints licked 
he marked the position by signs he could not miss and then pressed closer to his comrade saying as he did so ike hell's a goner shot right through his top knot with a piece of your cap wedged in his skull if you'd been a little taller you'd been scalped instead of hal so much you get for being stub isaac shuddered involuntarily but ere he could look back the crowd behind pushed him forward and so he failed to see the ruin which but for his short stature would have come to him there were no marks upon him yet nothing save the uncovered head to tell where he had been the balls which struck others passed him by the wind they made lifting occasionally his fair hair but doing no other damage above around before behind at right at left the grape-shot fell like hail but left him all untouched and billy grown timid since poor harry's fate pressed closer to the boy who would not tell a lie as if there were safety there onward onward they pressed isaac wondering sometimes how tom carleton fared and looking again in quest of their young lieutenant graham still towering above them all in spite of rose's prediction the ball for which he was the mark had not been fired yet but it was coming an alabamian volunteer had singled out that form yelling exultingly as he saw it reel and totter like a broken reed they were well matched in size the two combatants both splendid marks as rose had said and bill baker's sure aim froze the laugh upon the alabamian's lips and sent him staggering to the ground just as isaac received his captain orders to lead the fainting wounded george to a place of comparative safety it's only my arm they've shattered george whispered glancing sadly at the disabled limb over which isaac's tears were falling will it kill me think was the next remark prompted by a thought of annie isaac did not believe it would and with all a woman's tenderness he bounded up and held his canteen to the lips of the fainting weary man whispering water boy water isaac had not like many others thrown his canteen away and he gave freely to the thirsty george who with each draught felt his pulse grow stronger while his eyes kindled with fresh zeal as the noise of the battle grew louder and seemed to be coming nearer the onslaught was terrible now cannon after cannon belched forth its terrific thunder ball after ball sped on its deadly track battery after battery opened its blazing fire shell after shell cut the summer air and burst with murderous hiss shout after shout rent the smoky sky shriek after shriek went down with the rushing wind officer after officer bit the dust rank after rank was broken up soul after soul went to the bar of god and then there came a pause the firing ceased the stifling smoke rolled gradually away and showed a dreadful sight men mutilated and torn till not a vestige of their former looks was left to tell who they had been mingled together in one frightful mass the dead and dying lay smiles wreathing the livid lips of some and frowns disfiguring others arms hands and feet heads fingers toes and clots of human hair dripping red with blood were scattered over the field parts of the living mass we saw but a few hours agone moving on so hopefully beneath the morning moonlight like leaves of the forest when autumn hath blown they lay there now their mangled remains crying loudly to heaven for vengeance on the heads of those who brought this curse upon us end of chapter six and seven Chapter Eight of Rose Mather, A Tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Eight, the retreat. The day was ours, nobly won with sweat and toil and blood, and the brave men who won it were thinking of the laurels so laboriously earned. When suddenly the entire scale was turned, and ere they knew what they were doing, the tired, jaded troops found themselves rushing headlong from the battlefield, never so much as casting a backward glance, but each striving to outrun the other and so escape from they knew not what. How that panic happened, no one can tell some charged it to the reckless conduct of a band of regulars sent back for ammunition and others upon the idle lookers-on the curious ones who had come to see the rebels whipped and who at the first intimation of defeat joined in the general stampede making the confusion worse and adding greatly to the fright of the flying multitude it was a strange retreat our soldiers made all law and order were at an end company mixed with company regiment with regiment and together they rushed headlong down the hill many in their dismay fording the creek regardless of the shot and shell sent after them by the astonished foe now really in pursuit 
some there were however who made the retreat more leisurely and among these bill baker remembering the mark he had fixed in his own mind he sought among the slain for harry finding him at last trampled and crushed by the flying troops and wholly unrecognizable by any save a brother's eye bill knew him however in a moment but there was no time now to do the tender as he had purposed doing there was danger in tarrying long and with a shudder bill bent over the mangled form and with his jack-knife severed a lock of matted blood-wet hair taking also from the pockets whatever of value they contained not from any avaricious motive but rather from a feeling that the rebel should get nothing save the body a darn sight good hal's carcass will do ye he said shaking his fist defiantly in the direction of the foe but the wust is your own this hot weather if you don't bury him decently then turning to the lifeless gore he continued poor hal i'm kinder sorry you are dead you had now and then a streak of good about you and i'm sorry we ever quarrelled i be upon my word and i wish you could hear me say so but you can't knocked into a cocked-up hat as you are poor hal if there was a spot on your face as big as a sixpence that wasn't smashed into a jelly i'd kiss you just for the old woman's sake but i swan if i can stomach it i might your hand perhaps and bending lower bill's lips touched the clammy fingers of the dead there was something in the touch which brought to bill's heart a pang similar to the one he felt when he saw his brother fall and rising to his feet he said mournfully good-bye old hal i'm going now i wish you might go too good-bye and wiping away a tear which felt much out of place on his rough cheek bill walked away saying to himself poor hal i didn't s'pose i had such a hankerin for him didn't s'pose i cared for nobody but such a day's work as this finds the soft spot in a feller's heart if he's got any poor hal mother'll nigh about raise the rough thus soliloquizing bill moved on not rapidly as others did but rather leisurely than otherwise he seemed to be benumbed and did not care much what became of himself wading the stream he trudged on now wondering what the plague they all were running for when they got the rascals lit and again anathematizing the shot which fell around him s'pose i care for you he said hitting a spent ball a kick s'pose i care if i do get killed better do that than to run then reflecting that to be shot in the back was not considered a distinguished mark of honour he hastened his lagging steps until the shelter of the wood was reached bill was very tired and feeling comparatively safe determined not to travel farther until he had had some rest hunting out a thick clump of underbrush near a stream of water where he would be sheltered from observation he crawled into its midst and was ere long sleeping soundly wholly oblivious to the strange sights and sounds around him as squad after squad of soldiers hurried by meanwhile george graham was sitting faint and weary beneath the tree when the first token of the retreat met his view see they are running isaac said grasping his sound arm in some affright let us run too you lean on me and i'll lead you safely through with a bitter groan george attempted to rise but sank back again from utter exhaustion a species of apathy had stolen over him and he would rather stay there and die he said than make the attempt to flee he did not think of annie until isaac bending down said entreatingly it will be horrid for annie to know you died when you might have got away try for annie's sake can't you yes for annie's sake he could and at the mere mention of her name the dim eye kindled and the pale cheeks glowed while the wounded man made another effort to rise he succeeded this time and with slow steps the two commenced their retreat it was a novel sight that tall muscular man towering head and shoulders above the frail boy upon whom he leaned heavily for support the generous isaac who would not leave him there alone even though he knew the danger he was incurring for himself they'll treat us decent if we're taken prisoners won't they think he asked as the possibility of such a calamity was suggested to his mind not till then had george thought of that they would not murder a wounded man he was sure but they might take him prisoner and death itself was almost preferable to days of captivity and sickening suspense away from annie the very idea roused him into life and with a superhuman effort he hastened on almost outrunning isaac until they too had reached the friendly woods where bill had already taken shelter just then a loaded wagon passed them its frightened excited occupants paying no heed to isaac's cry for help until one whose uniform showed him to be an officer sprang up exclaiming 
the strong must give place to the wounded i can find my way to washington better than that bleeding man and tom carleton seized the reins with a grasp which brought the foaming steeds nearly to their haunches the vehicle was stopped and the next instant tom had leaped upon the ground spraining his ankle severely and reeling in his first pain against the astounded isaac who cried out joyfully oh captain carleton save lieutenant graham won't you we can walk you and i tom had not the least suspicion as to whom he was befriending until then and now unmindful of his own aching foot he assisted george to the seat he had vacated and watched the party without a pang as they drove rapidly away leaving him alone with isaac we'll do the best we can my boy he said cheerily as he met the confiding inquiring look bent upon him by isaac who relieved of his former charge felt now like leaning for protection and guidance upon captain carleton alas his hopes were short-lived for a groan just then escaped from tom's white lips wrung out by the agony it caused him to step isaac saw him stagger when he sprang to the ground and comprehending the case at once he resumed his burden of care and kneeling before tom who had sunk upon the grass he rubbed the swollen limb as tenderly as rose herself could have done if we could only find some water tom said scanning the appearance of the woods and judging at last by indications which seldom failed that there must be some not very far away there where the bushes are he said pointing toward the very spot where bill lay snoring soundly and dreaming of robbing parson goodwin's orchard in company with hal there must be water there and human beings too for i hear singing don't you isaac listened till he too caught a strain of melody as sad and low as if it were a funeral dirge someone was trilling there what can it mean tom said lend me your hand my boy and i'll soon find out it was a harder task to move than he anticipated for the ankle was swelling rapidly and bearing the least weight upon it made the pain intolerable leaning on isaac's shoulder he managed to make slow progress toward the stream bubbling so deliciously among the grass and toward the music growing more and more distinct it was reached at last and the mystery was solved leaning against a tree was a confederate officer whose white face told plainer than words could tell that never again would he be seen in the pine-shadowed home he had left so unwillingly but a few months before beside him upon the grass lay a boy scarcely more than twelve years old a drummer in a company of new england volunteers both little hands shot entirely off and the bleeding stumps bound carefully up in the handkerchief of the rebel who had smothered his own dying anguish for the sake of comforting that poor child sobbing so piteously with pain i didn't s'pose any of you was so good or i shouldn't have come to fight you oh mother mother they do ache so my hands my hands he said the cry of contrition ending in a childish wail for the mother's sympathy never more to be experienced by that drummer boy a smile flitted across the officer's face as he replied had we all known each other better this war would not have been and the noble foe held the boy closer to his bleeding bosom dipping his hand in the running stream and laving the feverish brow where the drops of sweat were standing what makes you so kind to me the dying boy asked his dim eyes gazing wistfully into the face bending so sadly over him i have a boy about your size charlie we call him the stranger said and i am charlie too the child replied charlie young love and my home is in new hampshire right on the mountain side father is dead and we are poor mother and i that's why i came to the war i wanted to go to college some time do you think i'll die will i never go home again never see mother nor little sister either the soldier groaned and bent still closer to the drummer boy asking so earnestly if he must die how could he tell him yes and yet he felt he must he would not be faithful to his trust if he withheld the knowledge or failed to point that dying one to the only source of life yes charlie he answered mournfully i think you will are you afraid to die did your mother never tell you of the saviour yes yes oh yes and the little face lighted up as at the mention of a dear friend i went to sunday school and learned of jesus there i've prayed to him every night and every morning since i came from home i promised her i would mother i mean and she prays too she said so in her letter right here in my jacket pocket 
don't you want to read it the officer shook his head and charlie went on i didn't want to fight to-day because i knew it was sunday but i had to or run away will god punish me for that think will he turn me out of heaven no no oh no and the north carolinian's tears dropped like rain upon the troubled face upturned so anxiously to his god will never punish those who put their trust in jesus i do i do i do and the trembling voice grew fainter adding after a pause you are a good man i know you have been to sunday school i guess and you prayed this morning didn't you the soldier answered yes and the child continued you are dying too i most know for there's blood all over us we'll go together won't we you and i will there be war in heaven between the north and south no charlie there is naught but peace in heaven and again the white hands allayed to the feverish forehead for the soldier would fain keep that little spirit till his could join it in company and speed away to the land where trouble is unknown but it could not be for charlie's life was ebbing away the last sand was dropping from the glass closer the fair curly head nestled to its strange pillow the bleeding bosom of a foe and the lips murmured incoherently of the elm trees growing near the mountain home and the mother watching daily for tidings of her boy then the train of thought was changed and charlie heard the bell just as it pealed that morning from his own village spire how grand the music was echoing through the virginia woods and the blue eyes closed as with a whisper he asked don't you hear the old bell at home calling the folks to church it has stopped now and the children are singing before the organ glory to god on high i used to sing it with them do you know it gloria in excelsis yes yes the soldier eagerly replied glad to find they were both of the same faith that little yankee boy born among the granite hills and he a north carolinian born on southern soil then sing it charlie whispered sing it won't you maybe i'll go to sleep i don't ache any now with a mighty effort the soldier forced down his bitter grief and in a low mournful tone commenced our beautiful church chant the dying child for whom he sang faintly joining with him for a time but the sweet voice ceased ere long the curly head pressed heavier the bleeding stumps lay motionless and when the chant was ended charlie had gone to his last sleep carefully reverently the north carolinian laid the little form upon the grass and kissed the stiffened lips for the sake of the mother who might never know just how charlie died just then footsteps sounded near tom and isaac were coming and the face of the soldier darkened when he saw them as if they had been intruders upon him and his beautiful dead their appearance however disarmed him at once and with a faint smile he pointed to his companion and said he was in the federal army two hours ago he has joined god's army now poor charlie i would have done much to save him and with his hand he smoothed the golden hair on which the flecks of western sunshine lay isaac knew it was a rebel speaking to him and for an instant he experienced the same sensation he had felt in the midst of the fray but only for an instant for though he knew it was a sworn foe he knew too that twas a noble-hearted man and with a pitying glance at the dead he asked if aught could be done for the living no and the soldier smiled again my passport is sealed i am going after charlie some one of your men did his work well see and opening his coat he disclosed the frightful wound from which the dark blood was gushing then in a few words he had told them charlie's story adding in conclusion you will escape you will go home again and if you do write to charlie's mother and tell her how he died tell her not to weep for him so early saved her letter is in his pocket take it as a guide where to direct your own this he said to isaac for he saw tom was disabled isaac did as he was bidden and the letter from charlie's mother written but a week before was safely put away for future reference and then isaac did for the north carolina soldier what the north carolina soldier had done for the yankee boy he staunched the flowing blood as best he could bathed the throbbing head and held the cooling water to the dry parched lips which feebly murmured their thanks 
the stranger saw the distinction there was between his new-found friends and feeling that tom was the one to whom he must appeal he turned his glazed eyes upon him and said whose government will answer for all this yours or the one that i acknowledge both both tom replied vehemently and the stranger rejoined yes both have much to answer for one for not yielding a little more and the other for its rash impetuosity oh had we as a people know each other could we have guessed what brave kind hearts there were both north and south we should never have come to this but we believed our leaders too much trusted too implicitly in the dastardly falsehoods of a lying press and it has brought us here for myself i am willing to die in a good cause and of course i think ours is just exactly as you think of yours but who will care for my poor nelly i left in my southern home what splendid victory can repay her for the husband she will lose ere yonder sun has set or what can compensate my daughter maud or my boy charlie for their loss the north carolinian paused from exhaustion and tom essayed to comfort him bending over him and supporting the drooping head which dropped lower and lower the lips whispering of nelly of maud and charlie and of the tar river winding past their door until there seemed no longer life in that once vigorous frame he's dead isaac was about to say but the words froze on his lips for in the distance he caught sight of two other men coming towards them one strong and powerful the other slight and girlish looking tom saw them too and turning to isaac said hurriedly run my boy and leave me they will think far more of capturing an officer than a private you can escape as well as not run quick but isaac would share captain carleton's fate whatever that might be and with a deep flush on his boyish face he drew nearer to his companion and stood gazing defiantly at the rebels as they came up we have nothing to hope tom whispered but we'll sell ourselves dearly as possible and bracing himself against the tree he prepared to do battle refusing at once the bullying rebel's command surrender or die never was the firm response and while isaac engaged hand to hand with the smaller of the two tom parried skilfully each thrust of his antagonist who accused him of having murdered the north carolina officer lying near both tom and isaac had thought the stranger dead but at this accusation the white lips quivered and whispered faintly no no they were kind to me the officer and the boy for an instant the rebel's uplifted hand was stayed and it is difficult to say what the result might have been had not yet another voice called through the leafy woods no quarter to the yankee tom's cheek blanched to an unnatural whiteness as with partial lips and flashing eyes he watched the newcomer hastening to the rescue the handsome graceful stranger whose appearance riveted isaac's attention at once causing him to gaze spellbound upon the face of the advancing foe as if it were one he had seen before how handsome that young man was with his saucy laughing eyes of black his soft silken curls of hair and that air of self-assurance which bespoke a daring reckless spirit isaac could not remove his eyes from the young rebel and his late antagonist met with no resistance as he passed his arms around him and held him prisoner at last isaac did not even think of himself his thoughts were all upon the stranger at whom poor tom sat gazing half bewildered and trying once to stretch his arms toward him while the lips essayed to speak but the words he would have uttered died away as a sudden faintness stole over him when he saw that he was recognized there was a violent start a fading out of the bright colour on the rebel's cheek and isaac still watching him heard him exclaim no no not him leave him alone while at the same time he attempted to free tom from the firm grasp the enemy now had upon him with an oath the soldier shook him off then rudely bade his half senseless victim rise and follow as a prisoner of war and tom unmindful of the pain arose without a word and leaning heavily upon his captor hobbled on caring little now it would seem what fate was in reserve for him he seemed benumbed and only an occasional groan which isaac fancied was wrung out by pain told that he was conscious of anything he's lame isaac cried the hot tears raining over his face while he begged of them to stop or at least to carry poor captain carleton if they must go on i won't run away he said imploringly to his own captor feeling intuitively that this was the kinder nature don't be afraid of me 
i'll help you carry him if necessary do have some pity he's fainting see and isaac almost shrieked as poor tom sunk upon the grass utterly unable to move another step they must carry him now or leave him there and anxious for the honour a captured officer of tom carleton's evident rank in life would confer upon them the rebels availed themselves of isaac's proffered aid and the three bearing their heavy burden moved slowly on until far beyond the bushes by the stream where the other soldier sat upon the ground his laughing black eyes heavy with tears and his heart throbbing with a keener pain than he had ever known before i was wrong to let him go he said aloud three against two would surely have carried the day and that boy at his side was brave i know but it cannot be helped he is their prisoner and all that remains for me to do is see that the best of treatment comes to him until he is released but what are the dead coming back to life and the soldier started up as he caught a sound of bending twigs near by end of chapter eight chapter nine of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 9. The Rebel and the Yankee Bill Baker was awake at last, and from his hiding place had seen Captain Carlden and Isaac disappear beneath the trees in the distance. They are goners, he muttered to himself. Won't that snap dragon of a widow be mad, though, when she hears how they'd got Ike? Poor Ike! i'd help him if i could but take no use interferin now and with this reflection bill turned his attention toward the stranger watching him for several minutes first to decide his politics and second to calculate his probable strength the soldier was at least a head taller than bill who nevertheless far exceeded him in strength of muscle and power of endurance i can manage him was bill's contemptuous comment and feeling in his pocket for the strong cord rose mather had bound round his paper parcel of turnovers and cheese he prepared to spring upon his foe in the rear and take him by surprise the cracking twigs betrayed him and changing his tactics he walked directly in front of the astonished young man who with heightened colour haughtily demanded what he was doing there and whether he were a friend or foe what am i doing here bill repeated sticking his cap a little more to one side and half shutting one of his wicked grey eyes kinder peekin round to see what i can find be i friend or foe you must be green to ask that don't you recognize my regimentals made after the cut of uncle sam siled some to be sure but then i've been at a dirty job been lickin just such scamps as you now then corporal seein i answered you civil what are you doin here you won't answer me hey he continued as the stranger deigned him no other reply than a look of ineffable disdain well then if you're so afraid of your tongue s'posin we try a rassle rough and tumble you know and the one that gets beat is t'other's prisoner that's fair as these dead folks will witness and bill's glance for the first time fell upon the bodies lying near them upon charlie's childish face with the golden curls clustering around it the sight touched a tender chord in bill and forgetting for a moment his new acquaintance he bent over the drummer boy murmuring poor child your folks are to have been ashamed to let you come to war now was the rebel's time he felt intuitively that he was no match for the thick-set brawny bill safety lay alone in flight and with a sudden bound he fled like a deer nuff said dropped from bill's lips and the next instant he too was flying through the woods in pursuit of the foe it proved an unequal race and bill's strong arms ere long closed like a vice around the struggling soldier who resisted manfully until resistance was vain and then suddenly stood still while bill fastened his hands behind him with the cords unwittingly furnished by rose mather don't squirm so corporal bill said as he bound the knot securely with his knee upon the back of the stranger whom he had thrown upon his face don't squirm so like an eel and i'll be done the quicker i calculate to tie you so you can't get away and you may as well hold on got kinder delicate hands hain't you never done nothin i guess but lick niggers and shoot your betters there you may stand up now if you want to the young man struggled to his feet saying proudly what do you intend doing next sir what do i intend doin bill replied with imperturbable gravity i intend leadin you by the string inter camp and showin you up for two pence a sight what do you suppose i intended doin 
the young man made one more desperate struggle to free himself but the twine only cut into his flesh making the matter worse so he finally submitted to his fate and suffered bill to take him where he listed bill was in no hurry to get to camp he rather enjoyed being alone with his prisoner and leading him to a little thicket he made him sit down and placing one of his feet upon him he began to ask him innumerable questions what was his name where did he come from what company was he in and so on to none of which did the stranger vouchsafe a reply with a haughty look upon his handsome face he maintained a rigid silence while bill continued needn't talk unless you want to speech is free with us you know but seein you won't tell who you be maybe you wouldn't mind hearing my genealogy it'll make you feel better mabby to know my reputation and standin in society corporal did you ever hear of a yankee a real live mudsill yankee such as southern gentlemen feel above fightin with well i'm that critter what do you think of me take me as a hull the stranger groaned in disgust and bill continued them cords hurt you i guess like enough i'll ease em up a trifle if you say so i ain't hard-hearted if i be rough as a nutmeg grater shall i loosen em so's not to hurt them soft baby hands of yourn thank you sir i don't mind it in the least was the soldier's answer though all the while the coarse twine was cutting cruelly into the tender flesh this bill suspected and muttering to himself good grit if he is a rebel he went on considerable top lofty ain't you corporal and as chaps of your cloth like to meet with their equals i'll go on with my history i was born in massachusetts not over a day's ride from boston ever been to boston no answer from the stranger save a heightened colour and bill proceeded tall old town got a smashin monument out to charlestown heard on it i suppose as i take it some of you southern dogs can read wow father died in state's prison down there to charlestown and then we moved to rockland the old woman hal and me hal's lyin up there where the hottest of the fight took place and i'm here tormentin you by telling you my character i've been to the workhouse twice i have i swan once for gettin drunk and once for something else a good deal wuss how do you feel now and bill leered wickedly at the young man who seemed bent on keeping silence only the expression of his face told the extreme contempt he felt for his companion and how it did wound to the quick one of his nature to be held a prisoner by such as william baker but there was no help for it he must submit to be taken to washington by the despised bill and then oh how his heart sank within him as he thought what then was there no method of escape couldn't he get away or better yet couldn't he hire bill to let him go strange he had not thought of this before yankees were proverbially avaricious and almost every man had his price he could try at all events and unbending his dignity he inquired what bill would ask to let him go what'll i ask repeated bill placing both feet instead of one upon his prisoner i don't know let's dicker a spell and see what'll you give and where do you keep your traps in my pockets the unsuspecting soldier answered there's my watch and chain worth over three hundred dollars phew whistled bill his face lighting up instantly while hope crept into the stranger's heart a gold watch worth over three hundred let's see the critter you forget that my hands are tied the stranger suggested so they be but mine ain't and the next moment bill was holding to his ear an elegant parisian watch and asking if the stranger were positive sure it cost more than three hundred dollars i had an old pewter thing that i ginned a mother he said and this concern just comes in play it's mine you say if i'll let you cut stick and run yes sir i give you that in exchange for my liberty wall now kind of generous ain't you but i want you should fling in something to clinch the bargain a chap of your cloth is of more value than three hundred what else have you got corporal and laying the watch carefully upon the grass bill's hand a second time sought the stranger's pocket bringing out an expensive and exquisitely wrought quizzing glass well now if these ain't the curiousest spectacles he exclaimed 
i'll just see how a reb looks through em and adjusting them to his eyes bill walked demurely around his prisoner and then standing at a little distance inspected him minutely as if he had been some curious monster hanged if i can see in em but mabby they'll suit the old woman to hum he said placing the glass beside the watch and adding watch and spectacles ain't enough corporal what more have you got ain't there a ring on one of your hands yes a costly diamond was the faint response and bill ere long was trying in vain to push it over his large joints it don't fit me but i guess twill my gal when i get one he said laying that too with the watch and eyeglass a silver tobacco box and handsome cigar case followed next the stranger groaning mentally as a faint suspicion of bill's real intentions crossed his mind there remained now but one more article the dearest of all the young rebel possessed and the perspiration started from every pore as he felt the rough hand again within his pockets and he knew he could not prevent it oh no 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 not that spare me that do not open it please and the haughty tone was changed to one of earnest supplication as bill drew forth a small daguerrean case and placed his dirty thumb upon the spring something in the stranger's voice made him pause a moment but anything like delicacy of feeling was unknown to the rough bill and the next instant he was feasting his rude gaze upon the features which the rebel youth had guarded almost religiously even from his equals in camp how beautiful that girlish face was with its bright laughing eyes and soft chestnut curls falling in such profusion around the childish brow and upon the smooth white neck even bill was awed into silence while a feeling of bewilderment crept over him as if he had seen that face before and mingled with this feeling came remembrances of that last day at home when fair hands which ere he was a soldier would have scorned to touch such as he had waved him an adieu you he whistled at last ain't she pretty though you're a sweetheart i guess and he leered at the stranger who made him no reply only the lips quivered and in the dark eyes there was a gathering moisture but when bill asked may i have this too if i'll let you go the stranger answered promptly never i'll die a thousand deaths before i'll part with that liberty is not worth that price give me back the picture and i'll go with you willingly wherever you please do give it back he added in an agony of fear as bill continued gazing at it and making his remarks can't a feller look at a gal on glass if he wants to i wouldn't hurt the little critter if i could as well not so you won't give her to me nor tell me who tis neither stranger said the rebel have you no feelings of refinement nary feelin and bill shook his head but did not withdraw his eyes from the picture well then have you a wife nary wife nobody would have bill baker nor sister nary sister but a dead one that i never seen nor mother you surely have a mother and the soldier's voice shook with strong emotion you've got me there and bill's eyes turned upon his prisoner i have a mother and you ought to hear the old gal take on when she comes home from washin from miss martha's or some of the big bugs and finds hal dead drunk on the trundle bed and me not a great sight better handsome old gal one of the kind that don't wear hoops but every time she steps takes her gowned up on her heels you know the rebel groaned aloud there was no tender point upon which his captor could be touched and the tears rained over his handsome face as he begged of bill to give him at least the ambrotype it's the only thing which has prevented me from being a perfect villain he said it has kept me from the wine cup and from the gambler's den pity it hadn't kept you out of the southern army was bill's dry response and the stranger answered eagerly i wish it had i wish it had please give it back and i'll swear allegiance to the veriest minion in lincoln's train i never thought no great of a turncoat bill replied closing the case and still holding it in his hand if you're a southern dog stay so not go to barkin on both sides we don't want no traitors honest though corporal where was you born there's a kind of natural look in your face as if i'd seen it afore and bill laid the ambrotype upon the grass but with regard to his birthplace the stranger was non-committal and bill continued if i let you go you'll give me the watch willingly willingly and the spectacles 
yes oh yes and the glass bead ring yes everything but the picture don't be so fast bill rejoined i'll get to that by and by watch spectacles glass bead ring to barker box and this other thingamabob but not the picture if i'll let you go and you'll go with me to washington and be showed up like a caravan if i'll give you the picture them's the terms as i understand yes the stranger gasped a shadow of hope stealing into his heart alas how soon it was erased by bill's continuing yankees ain't generally very green we can make you southern bloods by wooden cowcumber seeds any time of the day and do you s'pose i'm going to let you off at any price no sir if you go to war you must take the chances of war i ain't a-goin to hurt you and i'll ease up them strings if you say so but corporal you're my prisoner and these traps laying his hand upon the various articles upon the grass these traps picture and all i confiscate as contraband how do you feel now and bill coolly pocketed his contrabands all save the watch which he adjusted about his neck there was a fierce storm of tears and sobs and wild entreaties and then the poor discouraged soldier was still his white face wearing again its look of cold haughty reserve and his whole manner indicative of the aversion he felt for the vulgar bill upon whom the feeling was entirely lost for though bill knew the proud southerner felt above him he could not appreciate the feelings which made the young man shrink from him as from a loathsome reptile bill had no intention of treating him cruelly and as by this time the night shadows were creeping into the woods he sought out a drier and more sheltered spot and bade his prisoner sleep while he sat by and watched it seemed preposterous that the stranger should sleep under so great excitement but human nature could endure no longer without rest and when at last the stars came out they shone down upon that tired soldier sleeping upon the grass with bill sitting near and watching as he slept there were visions of home and of the battle too it would seem mingled in the young man's dreams for he talked sometimes with his mother asking her to forgive her boy and take him back again to her love then he was pleading for another a captive it would seem asking that naught but the best of care should come to the wounded officer and then the picture flitted across his mind for he held converse with the original and bill listening to him muttered twas his gal or sister sure i'm sorry for him i vum but hanged if i'll give it up it's contraband according to war he needn't have joined the army and so the weary night wore on the deep stillness of the virginia woods broken occasionally by the shouts of riders as they passed by in search of whatever there was to find once as the shouts came near the soldier started up but ere the scream for help had passed his lips bill's hand was laid firmly upon them and bill himself whispered fiercely one yelp and i gag you with the handkerchief the old woman took from her pocket and gin me the mornin i come from home she takes snuff too the old woman does there was a gesture of disgust and then the stranger became quiet again while the shouts died away in the distance and were not heard again that night the morning broke at last and just as it was growing light bill aroused by the falling rain from the slumber into which he had inadvertently fallen awoke his prisoner and led him safely through the pickets of the enemy without encountering a human being they were a strange-looking couple and when on the following day they reached washington they attracted far more attention than the prisoner desired for he shrunk nervously from the curious gaze fixed upon him refusing to answer all questions as to his name or birthplace and appearing glad when at last he was relieved from bill's surveillance and led to his prison home End of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Rose Mather, A Tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ten, news of the battle at Rockland. Great battle at Manassas. Total rout of the Federal army. Three thousand killed and as many more taken prisoners. Fire zouaves all cut to pieces. Only three or four escape alive. New York Thirteenth completely riddled sherman's battery and hosts of guns in the hands of the rebels frightful panic at washington the capital in imminent danger general scott in convulsions the president crazy and seward threatened with softening of the brain women and children fleeing for their lives beauregard marching on with five hundred thousand men 
the baltimoreans in ecstasies and the philadelphians in despair such were some of the exaggerated reports which ran like lightning through the streets of rockland on the first arrival of the news throwing the people into a greater panic than was said to exist in washington hints of some terrible disaster the exact nature of which could not be known until the arrival of the evening papers had early in the afternoon found their way from the telegraphic station into the village creating the most intense excitement men left their places of business to talk the matter over while groups of women assembled at the street corners discussing the probabilities of the case and each hoping that her child her husband her brother had been spared prominent among these was widow sims holding fast to susan's hand and occasionally whispering a word of comfort to the poor child whose eyes were red with weeping over the possible fate of john rose mather's carriage drove up and down and from its window rose herself looked anxiously out her face indicative of the anxiety she felt to hear the worst if worse there were she knew her husband could not have been in battle for he was still in washington but she was conscious of a feeling as if some dire calamity were impending over her and among the crowd collected in the street there was none who waited more impatiently for the coming of the evening train than she she had taken annie graham to ride with her and the two presented a most striking contrast for where rose was nervous impatient and excited annie though feeling none the less concerned was quiet submissive and resigned exhibiting no outward emotion until the shrill whistle was heard across the plain when a crimson flush stole into her cheek deepening into a purple as the carriage drew up in front of the office where the throng was growing denser men pushing past each other and elbowing their way to a standpoint near the door where they could watch the first item of news and scatter it among the eager crowd the papers came at last and the damp sheets were almost torn asunder by the excited multitude me one me please and rose mather's hand was thrust from the window in time to catch a paper destined for some one farther in the rear but ere she had found the column sought she heard from those around her that the worst was realized there had been a battle our troops were utterly defeated and worse than all disgraced but the thirteenth annie whispered faintly does it speak of the thirteenth rose did not know her interest just then was centred in the massachusetts blank and in her eagerness to hear from tom she forgot for a moment that such a regiment as the new york thirteenth existed but there were others who did not forget and just as the question left annie's lips the answer came in a despairing cry which rent the air as some reckless person shouted aloud the thirteenth a total wreck not a man left of company r oh george poor annie cried and the next moment rose held the fainting form upon her lap drive home to mrs graham's i mean she said to jake who with some difficulty made his way through the crowd but not until the story so cruelly set afloat was contradicted by those who had more coolly read the sad intelligence the news was bad enough but the rockland company was not mentioned and its friends had no alternative but to wait until the telegraph wire should bring some tidings of the saved rose was the first to be remembered will did his duty faithfully a terrible battle his message ran soldiers are arriving every hour but tom has not come yet a telegram for the widow sims came next the mother's quick eye taking in at a glance that only eli's name and john's were appended to it isaac's was not there where was he then oh where she asked this question frantically refusing to read the note lest it should confirm her fears i'll read it mother let me see susan said resting the paper from her hands and reading with trembling tones eli and i are safe isaac was last seen leading lieutenant graham from the field oh what a piteous wail went up to heaven then for widow sims when she received the news was sitting in annie's door and annie was kneeling at her side george was wounded of course and if wounded dead else why had he not thought of her ere this locked in each other's arms the two stricken women wept bitterly the mother sobbing amid her tears my boy my boy while annie moaned sadly my george my husband well was it for both that ere that dark hour came they had learned to follow on even when their father's footsteps were in the sea knowing the hand which guided would never lead them wrong annie was the first to rally it might not after all be so bad she said george and isaac were prisoners perhaps but even that was preferable to death it would surely save them from danger in future battles 
the southerners would not maltreat helpless captives there were kind people south as well as north thus annie reasoned and the widow felt herself grow stronger as hope whispered of a brighter day to-morrow to annie it was brighter for it brought her news of george wounded in his right arm an inmate of the hospital and at present too weak to write this was all but it comforted the young wife he was not dead he might come home again and annie's heart overflowed with grateful thanksgiving that while so many were bereaved of their loved ones she had been mercifully spared the next mail brought her a second letter from mr mather more minute in its particulars than any which had preceded it he had obtained permission to stay with george had removed him to a private boarding-house far more comfortable than the crowded hospital and at his request he wrote to annie that her husband though badly wounded and suffering much from the terrible excitement of the battle was not thought dangerous and had strong hopes of ere long receiving his discharge and returning home where she could nurse him back to life this was annie's message read by her eagerly while the widow sims forgetting all formality in her anxiety to hear if there was aught concerning her boy looked over her shoulder her eye darting from line to line until she caught his name there was something of him and grasping annie's arm she whispered read what it says of isaac and annie read how brave tom carleton had generously given place to the poor wounded george and stayed behind him with isaac hoping to make his way to washington in safety they had not been heard from since and the widow's heart was sick as heart could be with the dread uncertainty anything was preferable to this suspense and in a state of mind bordering upon distraction she walked the floor now wringing her hands and again declaring her intention to start at once for somewhere she knew not whither or cared provided she found her child in the midst of her excitement the gate swung open and mrs baker rushed up the walk her sleeves above her elbows and her hair pushed back from her bonnetless head just as she had left her washing at a neighbour's when she received bill's letter which told of hal's sad fate and unravelled the mystery of tom carleton's silence he's took the rebels have got your ike she shrieked brandishing aloft the soiled missive and howling dismally then putting her hand into her bosom she drew forth the lock of hair and thrusting it almost into the widow's face cried out look tis harry's hair all there is left of harry that's what i get for having a boy two inches taller than ike who stood in front and would have been shot instead of harry only he was shorter read it miss graham and tossing the letter into annie's lap the wretched woman sank upon the doorstep and covering her face with her wet apron rocked back and forth while annie read aloud as follows dear mother we've met the rascals and been as genteelly licked as ever a pack of fools could ask to be how it happened nobody knows i was fightin like a tiger when all on a sudden i found us a runnin like a flock of sheep and what is the queerest of all is that while we were taken to our heels one way the rebels were goin it t'other for what i know we should have been runnin from each other till now if they hadn't found out the game and so turned upon us but whilst of all is to come hal is dead shot right through the forehead and the ball that struck him down took off ike simpson's cap so if ike had been only a little taller hal would have lived to been hung most likely oh i wish he had i wish he had poor mrs baker moaned still waving back and forth and kissing the lock of hair while the widow involuntarily thanked her heavenly father that the two inches she once so earnestly coveted for her boy had wisely been withheld then followed bill's account of cutting away the hair he enclosed of his flight into the woods his sleep by the brook and his waking just in time to see captain carleton and isaac sims disappear beneath the trees in charge of rebel soldiers now that she knew the worst the widow sat like one stunned by a heavy blow uttering no sound as annie read bill's account of capturing his prisoner ere she reached this point however she had another auditor rose mather who had come with a second letter from her husband and who passing the weeping woman in the door came and stood by annie and listened with strange interest to the story of that captive parting so willingly with everything save the picture poor young man she sighed when annie finished reading i don't suppose it's right but i do feel sorry for him what if it had been jimmy perhaps he has a sister somewhere weeping for him just as i cried for tom dear tom will writes he is a prisoner with isaac sims i'm glad they are together tom will take care of isaac 
he had a quantity of gold tied around his waist and rose's soft hand smoothed caressingly the widow's thin light hair the widow had not wept before but at the touch of those little fingers the floodgates opened wide and her tears fell in torrents they were bound together now by a common bond of sympathy those four women each so unlike to the other and for a time they wept in silence one for her wounded husband one for her child deceased one for a captured brother the other for a son now as ever annie was the first to speak of hope and her words were fraught with comfort to all save harry's mother she could not comfort her for from reckless misguided harry's grave there came no ray of consolation but to the others she spoke of one who would not desert the weary captives neither bolt nor bar could shut him out god was in richmond as well as there at home and none could tell what good might spring from this seeming great evil for a long time they talked together and the afternoon was half spent when at last they separated rose going back to her luxurious home where she wrote to her mother the sad news concerning tom blurring with great tears the line in which she spoke of jimmy wondering what his fate had been slowly disconsolately poor mrs baker returned to her day's work so long neglected but the sud she left so hot two hours before had grown cold the fire burned out and with that weary discouraged feeling which poverty alone can prompt she was setting herself to the task of bringing matters up again when her employer touched with the sight of the white anguished face kindly bade her leave the work until another day and seek the quiet she so much needed poor old woman how desolate it was going back to the squalid house where everything even to the bootjack he had once hurled at her head reminded her of the harry who would come back no more she did not think of his unkindness now that was all forgotten and mother-like she remembered only the times when he was good and treated her like something half-way human he was her boy her first-born and as she lay with her tear-stained face buried in the scanty pillows of her humble bed she recalled to mind the time when first he lisped the sweet word mother and twined his baby arms about her neck he was a bright pretty child easily influenced for good or evil and the rude mother shuddered as she felt creeping over her the conviction that she had helped to make him what he grew to be and at times provoking him on purpose just to see him bump his little round hard head against the oaken floor then as he grew older it was fun to hear him imitate the oaths his father used and she had laughed at that until the habit became so firmly fixed that neither threats nor punishment could break it and when the sabbath bells were pealing forth their summons to the house of prayer she had suffered him to stay away offering but slight remonstrance when the robin's nest just without the door was pilfered of its unfledged occupants the mother bird moaning over its murdered young just as she was moaning now over her ruined boy poor harry there was some excuse for him some apology found in the nature of his early training but for her who reared him none she might have taught him better she might have sent him to the sunday school across the way where sunday after sunday she had heard the hymns the children sang swelling on the sabbath air harry sometimes joining in as he sat at the cottage door adjusting the bait with which to tempt the unsuspecting fish playing in the brook near by a mother's fearful responsibility had been hers she had not fulfilled it and it rolled back on her now stinging as only remorse can sting and making her wish amid her pain that the boy once so earnestly desired had never been given her or else had died in its cradle-bed and so gone where she knew the hardened in sin never could find entrance so absorbed was she in her grief as not to hear the sound of wheels stopping near her gate nor the tripping footstep upon the floor rose mather restless at home and wishing for something to do had remembered the miserable woman and knowing how desolate her comfortless house must seem that summer night she had conquered her aversion to the place and come to speak if possible a word of cheer mrs baker's howls always had the effect of making her laugh they seemed so forced so unnatural but there was something so new so real in the stillness of that figure crouching upon the bed that rose for a moment was uncertain how to act it was no feigned sorrow of which she was a witness now and advancing at last towards the untidy bed she laid her hand upon the disordered uncombed hair and whispered soothingly i am so sorry for you mrs baker and i'll do all i can to help you i'll give you money to make your cottage pleasanter and by and by you won't feel so badly maybe this was rose's idea of comfort money in her estimation was to the poor a panacea for nearly every evil 
but all her wealth could not avail to quiet the feeling of remorse from which mrs baker was suffering with a sob she thanked the kind-hearted rose and then continued tain't the poverty so much nor the knowin that he's dead though that is bad enough it's the something that tells me i ought to have to brung him up better i never sent him to meet and never went myself never had him baptized though i did try once to learn him now i lay me but he that's my man laughed me out of it he said there wasn't any god that we all come by chance but i knew better i had a prayin mother and though i forgot what she learnt me it pears to come back to me now oh harry i wish i'd done different i do i do and the repentant woman buried her face again in the scanty pillows while rose looked pityingly on here was a case she could not reach money could not cure that aching heart or quiet that guilty conscience mrs graham would know exactly what to say rose thought wishing more and more that she too possessed the wisdom which would have told her what it was poor mrs baker needed sitting down beside her rose talked to her of bill who her husband said was highly complimented for having captured a rebel will had not seen the prisoner she said or heard his name he only knew the fact and that bill was greatly praised this was some consolation to mrs baker but it did not take the pain away and as she was not inclined to converse rose soon bade her good-bye and left her there alone in her deep sorrow the following sunday just as the notes of the organ were dying away in the opening service a bent shrinking figure stole noiselessly in at the open door and rose mather recognized beneath the thin black veil the haggard face of widow baker who except on funeral occasions had never before been seen within the walls of the church annie saw her too and while rose touched with the humble attempt she had made to put on something like mourning for her child thought how she would give her an entire new suit of black annie thought how she would daily pray that the blow which had fallen so crushingly might result in everlasting good to the now stricken mother scarcely less keen but of a far different nature was the grief of widow sims there was no black upon her leghorn bonnet she would not have worn it if isaac had been dead but every expression of her stern face told how constantly her heart was going out after her darling boy her captured isaac languishing in his sultry prison sick perhaps and pining for his mother how savage she felt toward beauregard and all his clan resolving at times to start herself for richmond and beard the lion in his den she'd tell them what was what she said she'd let them know what an injured mother could do she'd turn a second charlotte corduroy if necessary and free the land from such vile monsters and she actually sharpened up her shears as a weapon of offence in case the pilgrimage were made this was the widow sims excited but the widow sims when calm was a very different woman praying then for her boy and even asking forgiveness for the stirrers up of the rebellion at annie's request she had at last come to live altogether at the cottage in the hollow and it was well for both that they should be together for the widow's stronger will upheld the weaker annie who in her turn imparted much of her own trusting childish faith to the less trusting widow greatly annie mourned as the days went on because no line came to her from george himself nothing in his own handwriting when he knew how she desired it if it were but just his name what made him always deputize mr mather to write his letters for him annie put this question once to rose but the twilight was gathering over them and so she failed to see the heightened colour on rose's cheek and the moisture in her eye rose did not now as formerly bring her william's letters and read to her every word he said of george she only told her how cheerfully george bore his illness and how will read to him every day from annie's bible choosing always the passages she had marked but the rest was all withheld and annie never dreamed the reason or of the effort it cost the talkative little rose to keep back what william said she must until the worst were known thus the august days glided by one by one until the summer light faded from the rockland hills and september threw over them her rich autumnal bloom and then one day there came a note for annie written as of old by william mather but signed by george himself poor annie how she cried over and kissed that signature to which george had added god bless you darling annie every letter was unnaturally distorted and few could have deciphered the words but to the eye of love they were plain as noonday and annie's kisses dropped upon them until they were still more blurred than when they came to her 
it was very hard for rose to keep from telling the dreadful story of what had followed the penning of those brief words god bless you darling annie but will had said she must not so she made no sign only her arms clung closer around annie's neck and her lips lingered longer upon the snowy forehead as she said good-night and went away with the secret which annie must not know then End of chapter ten chapters eleven and twelve of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain eleven the wounded soldier how those polished cruel-looking instruments sparkled and glittered and flashed and how the sick man shuddered as he glanced toward the table where they lay asking with quivering lip if there were no other alternative save the one their presence suggested none but speedy death was the response of the attending surgeon who was too much accustomed to just such scenes as this to appreciate the feelings of that poor soldier shrinking so painfully from what they told him must be if he would live none but speedy death george repeated the words slowly to himself dwelling longest upon the last as if to accustom himself to thoughts of it wait a little wait till i think the matter over he said in reply to the question are you ready and turning his face to the wall so that those about him should not see the fearful conflict going on he thought long and earnestly wasn't it better to die than go back to annie maimed and disfigured for life better die than lose a portion of the manly beauty of which he had been so proud would annie love him just the same even though the strong right arm which had toiled for her so cheerfully could never work for her again never encircle her in its embrace would the scarred stump be as dear to her as the well-moulded limb had been he did not know and the tears which all through the weary days of his sickness had been kept back now fell like rain upon the pillow as he fancied the meeting between his sweet young wife and her poor crippled husband the cottage on the hill so earnestly coveted would never be theirs now he could not earn it he could not earn much anyway with his left arm and he groaned aloud as he thought of the poor unfortunate seen so often in the rochester depot peddling daily papers would he ever come to that he who but a few months ago had so bright hopes for the future would the delicate annie he had meant to shield so carefully from every ill of life yet be compelled to earn the bread she ate it was a sad sad picture the excited soldier drew of what the future might bring and the fainting spirit had almost cried out i would rather die when there came stealing across his mind the memory of annie's parting words if the body you bring back has in it my george's heart i shall love you all the same yes she would love him just the same for as it was not her fair sweet face alone which made her so dear to him so it was not his splendid form which made him dear to her annie's love would not abate even though he went back to her the veriest cripple that ever crawled the earth but how different his going home would be from what he had fondly hoped no papers heralding his arrival no dense crowd out to meet him no fife trilling a jubilee no drum beating a welcome no bell ringing its merry peal no carriage no procession nothing but the curious gaze of the few who might come out to see how george graham looked without an arm and whisper softly to each other poor fellow how i pity him he didn't want to be pitied he would almost rather die and he did not want to die either when he thought calmly of it he was not prepared and forcing back the bitter tears he turned his white worn face to william mather bending so sadly over him and whispered tell them they may cut it off but not till you've written to annie and i have signed my name you know how she has begged for a word from me tell them to keep away they shall not intrude on my interview with annie george was growing excited but he became calm again when he found himself alone with mr mather who wrote the letter which gave annie so much joy there was nothing in it of the expected amputation nothing but encouragement that he should ere long come home to stay with her always there give me the pen he said when the letter was finished and the trembling fingers grasped it eagerly but quickly let it fall as the purple festered flesh above the elbow throbbed and quivered with the pain the sudden effort caused once more i'll do it if it costs my life he whispered nerving himself with might and main and then with mr mather guiding his hand he wrote his name and the words 
God bless you, darling Annie. It's done, and she must never know the agony it cost me, he moaned as his bandaged arm fell heavily at his side, while with his other hand he wiped away the sweat which stood so thickly upon his face. Bring Annie's Bible, he said, and lay it on my pillow. It will make me bear it better. Oh, Annie, Annie, if you could be here to pray for me. Can't you? And the dim eyes turned imploringly toward Mr. Mather, who shook his head hesitatingly. Man of the world as he had been, he had not yet learned to pray, but he could not resist that touching appeal, and bending down, he answered, I never learned to pray, but while the operation is going on, I'll do the best I can. Shall I call them now? George nodded, and William admitted the two surgeons who were growing somewhat impatient at the delay. They were not naturally hard-hearted men, but years of practice had brought them to look on amputations in a mere business point of view. Still, there was something about this case which touched a chord of sympathy, and they spoke kindly to the sufferer, telling him it would soon be over, and was not half so bad as losing a leg would be. George made no reply except to shudder nervously, as he saw the cold, polished steel so soon to cut into his flesh. "'You'll need bandages,' he said, his mind flashing backward to the day when he had looked in at Rockland Hall, where Annie, with others, sat working for just such a scene as this. "'It's here,' Mr. Mather answered, pointing to a table where lay a ball prepared for Company R. Without knowing why he did so, Mr. Mather took it up and began mechanically to unroll it, pausing suddenly as traces of a pencil met his view. There was something written there, something which made him start as he read, Annie Howard, it's your Annie, George. Try to think I'm there. Rockland, April 1861. Was it a happen so, or a special providence that this bit of linen over which Annie's prayers had been breathed should come at last to him for whom it was intended? Mr. Mather believed the latter, and pointed it out to George, who, comprehending the truth at a glance, uttered a wild, glad cry of joy as he pressed it to his lips. "'Yes, Annie, I know you are here. I can feel your presence, and it will help to ease the pain. Begin without delay. Don't wait if it must be done.' There was a moment's silence, a shutting of both William's and George's eyes, and a shriek of anguish rang through the room as George cried out, Oh, Annie, Annie, stand up closer to me. It makes me faint. It hurts me so bad. Pray, Mr. Mather, pray. And Mr. Mather did pray, the first prayer which had passed his lips since his early boyhood, not aloud, but silently. And the writhing victim grew still at last, only shivering once as the sharp saw glided through the splintered bone. Carefully they bound up the bleeding stump with the soft linen Annie had sent, speaking comforting words to the sufferer who seemed to be stupefied, for he did not notice what they said. It was done, at last, and after a few directions the operators hurried off to do for others what they had done for George. Poor George! How long and weary were the days and nights immediately succeeding the amputation, and how horrible the sensation which prompted him to fancy the severed limb was there! to feel the hot blood tingling through his fingertips, throbbing through his wrists, streaming into his elbow joints, and then to know it was all a mere delusion, for the right arm, once so full of vigor, was not now, save a putrefying mass buried away beneath the sod. He would not have Annie know it yet, he said. He would rather spare her as long as possible, and so the news was withheld from her, while day after day George waited and watched for the favorable change which should make it safe for him to undertake the tedious journey. Three times was the traveling bag packed, with the hope of going tomorrow, and as often did the doctor's stern mandate bid him wait a little longer. At last the terribly nervous sensation passed away, taking with it all the pain, and leaving no feeling save one of intense uneasiness and languor which the once strong man strove in vain to shake off, trying day after day to sit up, if only for a moment, and as often falling back upon his pillows from sheer exhaustion. He was only tired. He had never been rested since the battle, he said and if he could once go home to Annie and lie upon the lounge where he last saw her kneeling, he should get well so fast. Often in his troubled sleep he talked of her, begging her not to spurn her poor crippled husband, but to love him just the same. "'I never can work for you as I used to do,' he would say. "'Never can buy that cottage on the hill, but God won't let us starve, and I shall love you so much, so much, when I find you do not shrink away from poor mutilated George.' 
it was a sad but not unprofitable lesson which william mather was learning by that bedside at home in rockland where their positions were so different he had always respected george graham but he had learned to love him now with a brother's love and gladly would he have saved him for the sweet wife in whom with his own darling rose was so deeply interested and whose letters were silently working good in him as well as george greatly his personal friends marvelled that he should stay so closely immured within that sick room when he might had he chosen have mingled much in the world without and many were the attempts they made to drag him away but he withstood them all and clung the closer to his friend who leaned upon him with all the trustful confidence of a little child hour after hour he sat by his patient reading to him from annie's well-worn bible and when at last the heavy cloud was lifted and the pathway through the valley of death was divested of its gloom he was the first to whom the sick man imparted the joyful news that whether he lived or died all was well all was peace within in silence and in tears mr mather listened to the story of what was so strange to him and in the next letter sent to rose he told her of the new resolves awakened within him tracing them back to that humble cottage in the hollow where annie graham unknown save to a few was wielding a mighty power for good everything which he could do for george he did and annie herself could scarcely have been more gentle or kind and george oh how grateful he was to his noble friend blessing him so often for the kindly deeds god will surely let you go home unharmed he said one day when mr mather had been more than unusually attentive i pray to heaven every hour that you may never know the dreary heart-pang it costs one to die away from home and all that we hold dear for i am dying i have given up the delusion that to-morrow will find me better i shall never be better until i wake in heaven shall never go back to annie never see my old home again it is a humble home mr mather but you can't begin to guess how dear it is to me because it is the spot where i brought annie after she was mine how well i remember that first night of housekeeping how proud i felt knowing it was my home my table my wife sitting opposite that her own darling hands had made the tea and cut the bread she passed me and that i had earned it too the poor have many joys to which the rich are strangers and i have sometimes thought we love each other more because there is little else to divide our love true it is that mortal man never loved a creature better than i have loved my annie she was of gentler blood than i was far more delicately reared and i know it was an unequal match she was far above me in social position highly educated and accomplished too she was a belle and favourite everywhere while i was only george graham a mechanic and engineer she kept nothing from me and she told me of a childish fancy when she was a mere girl of fourteen but if she ever sent a regret after the handsome black-eyed boy the object of that fancy it was not perceptible to me still i think that may have had its influence that and the fact that her life was very wretched with her proud hard aunt on whom she was dependent and who wanted her to marry a white-haired millionaire but annie chose me and i have worshipped her with an idolatry which i know was sinful in the sight of heaven who will have the first place in our hearts i have told you all this because your wife has been a friend to annie and i want her to know that annie is her equal if she did marry a poor mechanic i am not blaming any one i know the distinctions there are in social life i should feel just so too perhaps if i was rich and i had been educated as you were even as it is i always was proud to think my wife was a lady born and i hoped one day to raise her to the position she ought to fill but that dream is over now it matters little what becomes of the body after the soul has left it though i should rather lie in rockland graveyard where annie can sometimes come to see me and i do so want to hear her voice once more before i go to tell her with my own lips that if in heaven i find a place she has led me there suppose we send for her mr mather said the glad thought flashing upon his mind of the joy it would be to see his own darling once more for if annie came rose he knew was sure to come also i'll send for both annie and rose at once they can come together mr graham made no objection and mr mather set himself to the task of writing the letter which he hoped was to bring not only annie but his own precious rose don't say a word about my arm i'd rather tell her myself she won't mind it so much when she sees how sick and weak i am 
George suggested, and so Mr. Mather bade Rose keep the amputation to herself as heretofore. "'You will defray Mrs. Graham's expenses,' he wrote, "'and come as soon as possible, for her husband is nearer death than you imagine.' 12. Getting ready. Oh, I've such perfectly splendid news this morning. We are going to Washington right away, you and I, for Will says so in his letter. You see, George is a great deal. George can't. Well, George isn't very well. And quite delighted with the happy turn she had given her words, Rose skipped around Annie's cottage like a bird, lighting at last upon a stool at Annie's feet and asking if she were not glad. Why, how white you are! she exclaimed as she observed the paleness of annie's cheek what makes you don't you want to go annie was not deceived by rose's abrupt turn she knew that george was worse else he had never sent for her and hence the sudden faintness which rose's gay badinage could not shake off at once did your husband write or mine she asked and rose replied will of course george has never written you know yes i know and in Annie's voice there was a tone approaching nearer to bitterness than any that Rose had ever heard from her. Where is the letter? Let me read it for myself. But Rose had found it convenient to leave the letter at home, and so she answered, I did not bring it with me. I can tell you all there is in it. But will you? And Annie grasped her shoulder firmly. Will you tell me all? Tell me what it is about my husband, and why he never writes. Is George dying? and is that the reason why he sends for me? Tell me, Mrs. Mather, for I will not be put off longer. There was a look in the blue eyes before which Rose fairly quailed, and turning her face away she answered truthfully, Yes, George is very sick. He will never come home again, and he wants you there when he dies. Softly the quivering lips repeated, When he dies, poor Annie wondering if it could be George who was meant, had the evil she most dreaded come upon her at last must she give her husband up and live without him how dark how cheerless the future looked stretching before her through many years it might be was there no hope no help it was annie's darkest hour of trial and for a moment the spirit fainted refusing to bear the load which though more than half expected had come so sudden at the last but Annie was not one to murmur long, and Rose Mather never forgot the sweet submissive smile which played over her white face as she said, Whether George lives or dies, God will do all things well. After this there was no more repining, no more bitterness of tone, nothing save humble submission to whatever might be in store for her. Rose was very enthusiastic on the subject of the Washington trip, and Annie listened eagerly to her suggestions. It is absurd for two young ladies like us to travel alone, Rose said. We must have some nice elderly woman to matronize the party. I mean to write to Mother to send up one from Boston. Miss Marthers, interrupted the widow Sims, who sat by the window knitting for some soldier boy. Miss Marthers, don't be a simpleton, a sendin' down to Boston for somebody to matronize you and Miss Graham when you can find forty of em nearer home. Let me go. Eli and John are there, you know and tain't such a great ways to richmond where my poor isaac is did i tell you i got a letter last night from a strange woman up in new hampshire whose boy was in the battle the rascals let your brother write to her because there was something between her charlie and a rebel officer who was good to the child when he was dyin there's now and then a streak of good amongst em yes but what of tom rose asked eagerly forgetting washington in her anxiety to hear from her brother of whom not one word had been known after his name had appeared in the paper as one of the prisoners at richmond together with that of a boy called isaac simpson the more humane of captain carleton's captors had repeated what the dying officer said of tom's kindness to him and for this tom had at last found opportunity for sending a note to charlie's mother telling her how her darling died and asking her to write for him to his mother his sister and the widow sims this the grateful woman had done but rose had not received her letter yet and she listened eagerly while the widow read the very words which tom had written concerning himself and isaac there was but little said of suffering or privation tom it would seem was tolerably well cared for but he told of days and nights when his heart went out in earnest longings for the loved ones at home and then he spoke of isaac saying tell his mother that he does not bear prison confinement well and she would hardly know her boy 
he is very popular among his fellow prisoners and does more good i verily believe than half our army chaplains one poor fellow who died the other day blessed isaac sims as the means of leading him to heaven oh i'm so glad he's there ain't you and the tears shone in rose's eyes as she involuntarily paid this tribute to christianity on some accounts i am and then again i ain't was the widow's reply as she wiped the moisture from her glasses and returned them to her pocket i'm glad he's doing good but i don't want him sick there alone without his mother it's hard to see why these things are so but that's nothing to do with the going to washington will you take me mrs marthers i know i'm homespun and ignorant but you may call me waitin maid or anything you like if you'll only take me the widow's voice was full of entreaty and rose could not resist it it would be grander she thought to have a woman from boston but then mrs sims wanted to go so badly while annie too preferred her she was sure so it was settled that as soon as the necessary arrangements could be made mrs sims annie and rose were to start for the federal capital had the care of an entire regiment devolved upon rose she could not have been busier or have felt a greater responsibility than she did in planning and arranging the journey and between times trying to initiate widow sims into the mysteries of travelling telling her not to be frightened and think they'd run off the track each time the whistle blew not to show undue anxiety about her baggage as she rose should hold the checks little brass pieces which they would get at the depot not to bother the conductor by asking questions or let the people know that she had never been further in the cars than rochester to all these directions the widow gravely promised compliance saying in an aside to annie it does me good to see the little critter patronize me as if she supposed i was a tarnal fool and didn't know a steam locofoco from a canal boat the day before the one appointed for the commencement of the journey came at last rose's three trunks of the size which makes the porters swear were packed to their utmost capacity for rose meant to make a winter's campaign and display her numerous dresses at parties and levees so everything which she could possibly and impossibly need even to her skating dress was stowed away in the huge boxes together with various luxuries for her husband and george and then as the afternoon was drawing to a close she started for the cottage in the hollow to see that everything there was in readiness it had not taken the widow long to pack up her three dresses and her small old-fashioned hair trunk locked and tied round with a bit of rope was standing near the door ready for the morrow's early train on annie's face there was a hopeful expectant expression which told how glad she was at the prospect of meeting her husband so soon two days more and i shall see him she thought picturing to herself the meeting and fancying what she would do what she would say and how carefully she would nurse him when once she was there with him it was a bright picture she drew of that meeting with her husband of the kisses the caresses she would lavish upon him and she was almost as impatient as rose herself to have the november day come to an end knowing that with the darkness she was nearer to the asked for to-morrow just as the sun was setting rose took her leave saying as she bade annie good-bye i mean to drive round by the depot and get the tickets to-night so as to save time in the morning annie smiled at the little lady's restlessness and after kissing her good-night stood by the window watching her as she drove down the street and thinking to herself when i see her again it will be to-morrow rapidly rose mather's iron greys bore her to the depot where but a few idlers were lounging as it was past the hour for the cars the window between the lady's sitting-room and the office was closed and rose knocked against it in vain the ticket agent had gone to his tea and with a feeling of dissatisfaction rose was turning away when a sharp clicking sound from an adjoining apartment reached her ear and stepping to the open door she stood looking in while the telegraphic operator received a communication what was it that made him start so and utter an exclamation of surprise was it bad news the wires had brought to him had there been another battle was washington in danger rose wished she knew and she was about to inquire when the operator turned upon her and asked if she knew mrs graham wife of the lieutenant yes yes has anything happened to him she answered grasping the now written message which the agent handed her saying break it to her as gently as possible he was the finest fellow in all the company and the kind-hearted man not yet accustomed to the horrors entailed by the war wiped a tear away as he muttered to himself poor george there was no need for rose to open the envelope for she knew well enough what it contained 
but her fingers mechanically tore it apart and with streaming eyes she read the fatal message which would break poor annie's heart oh i cannot tell her she cried sinking down upon the hard settee and sobbing bitterly how can i take this to her when i left her so happy half an hour ago but it must be done and summoning all her courage she bade jake drive back to the hollow shivering as she saw the cheerful light shining from the window and shrinking more and more from the task imposed upon her when as she drew nearer she saw annie's bright joyous face as she put together the garments for to-morrow pausing occasionally to speak to widow sims who sat before the blazing fire dreaming visions of what might be could she but get a pass to richmond don't you hear wheels the widow asked as the carriage stopped before the gate annie thought she did and going to the window she saw rose as she came up the walk why it's mrs mather she cried what can have brought her back to-night and hastening to the door she led rose in asking why she was there oh annie rose replied winding her arms around annie's neck i wish i did not have to tell but i must and i know it will kill you dead i'm sure it would me and i don't see why you should be served so either we shall not go to-morrow for will is going to bring him home don't you know now can't you guess and rose thrust the dispatch into the hands of the bewildered annie who clutched it eagerly and bending to the lamplight read what rose had read before her it came to her like a thunderbolt striking all the deeper because it found her so full of eager expectation and the november wind as it swept past the door and down the lonely hollow took with it one wailing cry of anguish and then all was still within the cottage save the sobbing whispers of widow sims and rose bending over the unconscious form which lay upon the bed so white and still that a terrible fear entered the hearts of both lest the stricken annie too were dead End of chapters eleven and twelve Chapters thirteen and fourteen of Rose Mather, a tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thirteen, the dying soldier. Backward now we turn and stand again in the chamber where we saw the glitter of the polished steel and heard the bitter cry forced out by pain from lips unused to give such sign of weakness they were white now as the wintry snow which covers the northern hills and the breath came feebly from between them as the sick man whispered faintly i shall not be here if annie comes for when the drum beats on the morrow calling my comrades to their daily drill i shall be far away where sounds of battle were never heard but once oh the peace the quiet the rest there is in heaven i hope you will one day come to share it with me you who have been kinder than a brother and the long white fingers grasped the hand which for so many days and weeks had soothed the aching head and cooled the fevered pillows with all a woman's tenderness never for an hour had that faithful friend deserted his post day and night had found him there ministering to every want and as far as human aid could do smoothing the pathway leading so surely down to death but his vigils were almost over now his release was just at hand for as george had said the morrow's drumbeat would only find there the body which was so worn by suffering and disease that william mather could lift it in his arms as easily as he could have lifted a little child he was greatly changed from the days when he had been aptly called the rockland hercules but as the outer man decayed the inner life grew strong and bright shining forth at the last with all the splendor which perfect faith in christ's atonement can shed around a deathbed there was no repining now no murmuring at the mysterious dealings of providence nothing but sweet childish confidence and a patient waiting for the end coming on so fast that george himself could feel the irregular beat of his wiry pulse and mark the death hue as it came creeping on settling first in purplish spots about his finger-tips and spreading its ashen colouring over his clammy hands a stormy november night had closed over washington and the rain beat dismally against the windows of the room where mr mather bent over the dying soldier listening to what he said you can't tell annie all george whispered looking fondly up into the face he had learned to love so well you must write it down so as not to lose a single word ring pen and paper and then sit where i can see you for the sight of you does me good 
you have been so kind to me the writing utensils were brought and then sitting where george could look into his face mr mather wrote as the dying man dictated my dear dear darling annie it will be days perhaps before you see this letter and ere it reaches you somebody will have told you that your poor george is dead are you crying darling as you read this do the tears fall upon the words poor george is dead don't cry my precious annie it makes my heart ache to think how you will sorrow and i not there to comfort you it's hard to die away from home but not so hard as it would once have been for i hope i am a different man from the one who bade you good-bye a few short months ago and darling it must comfort you to know that your prayers your sweet influence have led the wanderer home to god we shall meet again in heaven annie meet where partings are unknown it may be many years perhaps and the grass upon my grave may blossom many times ere you will sleep the sleep which knows no waking but at the last you'll come where i am waiting you i know i shall be there annie all the harassing doubts and fears are gone simple faith in the saviour's promise has taken them away and left me perfect peace god bless you annie darling and grant that as you have guided me so you may guide others to that home above where i am going so fast you have made me very happy since you have been my wife and i bless you for it it makes my death pillow easier to know that not one bitter word has ever passed between us nothing but perfect confidence and love i was not good enough for you darling none knows that better than myself you should have married one of gentler blood and higher birth than i a poor mechanic i have always felt this more than you perhaps and i have tried so hard not to shame you with my homespun ways had i lived i should have improved constantly beneath your refining influence but that is all past now and it is well perhaps that it is so as you grow older you might have felt there was a lack in me a something which did not satisfy the cravings of your higher nature and though you might not have loved me less you would have seen that we were not wholly congenial i am well enough in my way but i am not a suitable companion for a girl of culture like yourself and i have often wondered that you should have chosen me but you did and again i bless you for it never never was year so happy as the one i spent with you my darling darling annie and i was looking forward to many such but god has decreed it otherwise and what he does we know is right i shall never see you again and though they will bring me back to you i shall not feel your tears upon my face or see you bending over my coffin bed still i know you will do this and that makes it necessary for me to tell what perhaps has been too long withheld because i would spare you if possible annie had i lived i never could have toiled for you as i once did for where the right arm which has held your light form so often used to be there is nothing now but a scarred stump and this is why i have not written does it make you sicken and shrink away from me don't annie your crippled husband's heart is as full of tenderness now as ever i was too proud of my figure annie and the thought that you might love me less when you knew how maimed i was hurt more than the cold sharp steel cutting into my throbbing flesh and now dear annie i come to the hardest part of all i know just how you'll start and shudder at what you deem so cruel a suggestion know just how keen the pang will be for i have felt the same and my spirit well nigh fainted as i thought of the time when another's caresses than mine would call the sweet love light to your eye and kindle the soft blushes on your cheek listen to me annie you'll be glad one day to remember that i told you what i did you are young and beautiful and though you do not believe it now the time will surely come when my grave will not be visited as often as at first and the flowers you will plant above me when next spring's sun is shining will wither for want of care and the rank grass growing there will not be trodden down by your dear little feet for they will be waiting by another fireside than ours in the hollow and my annie will bear another name than mine do you discredit me darling it will surely be and i am willing that it should but you will never know the anguish it costs me to be willing it is the bitterest drop in all the bitter cup but i drank it with tears and prayers and now i can calmly say to you what i am saying 
can even from my deathbed give you to another whoever he may be you can never forget me i know never forget your soldier husband who fell in his country's cause but by and by thoughts of him will cease to give you pain and our short married life will seem like some far-off dream i cannot say how it would be with me were you taken and i left but i am much like other men and judging from their example i should do just as they do so if in after years another asks you as i once did to be his guiding star don't refuse for me think that from my low grave i bless you in your new relations and will welcome you to heaven all the same though you come fettered and bound with other links than those my love has thrown around you i am almost done now annie there is a gathering film before my eyes and i feel the death chill creeping through my veins it would be sweet to have you here as i go down the brink up which no traveller has ever come but it cannot be and i will not repine there is one with me whose presence is dearer far than yours could be one whose everlasting arm will be beneath me as i pass over jordan leaning on him i need no other stay but shall go fearlessly down to death there is another with me too an earthly friend who has been kinder than a brother and my heart clings to him more fondly than he can ever guess always respect william mather annie for what he has been to me pray that prosperity may attend him all his days and that at the last he may find a place in heaven he is thinking of these things i know and from the dreary hours spent with me there may yet spring up plants of everlasting growth my mind begins to wander darling there's a rushing sound in my ears while thoughts of you and thoughts of that terrible sabbath battle are blended together good-bye my precious one don't cry too much when you read this it is not good-bye for ever a few more years of earth to you a moment of heavenly bliss to me and then we meet again where golden harps are ringing i can almost hear them now almost see the shining throng sent out to meet me just as i once vainly dreamed the rockland people would come to welcome me home for more in fancy i put my arms around your neck just as i used to do in fancy hold you to my bosom in fancy kiss your girlish lips and smooth your pale brown hair i don't know how you'll live without me don't know who will earn your bread but the god of the widow and fatherless will surely care for my darling and keep her heart from breaking with him i leave you knowing you are safer there than elsewhere good-bye good-bye there were great tear-blots upon this letter for mr mather as he penned it had wept over it like a child forming a resolution which he wondered had not suggested itself before kneeling by the dying george he said god will care for your darling and i shall be his instrument so long as i have a home annie shall not suffer rose's love was given to her long ago and mine will follow soon she shall be a sister to us both the glazed eyes lighted up with joy and the white lips whispered the thanks which ended in a prayer for blessings on one who had proved himself so kind to the poor soldier come closer to me they said take my hand in yours and keep it there while i thank you for what you've been to me you'll forgive me i know that i ever thought you proud for i did and sometimes there was a bitter feeling in my heart when i saw your rose surrounded with every luxury and thought of annie as highly educated as she taking a far lower place in rockland because her husband was a mechanic there is more of that feeling among the working classes than you imagine and you don't know how much good a familiar word or a little notice from such as you does to those who fill the humbler walks of life women feel this more than men and again i bless you for the care promised my annie i do not ask that you should take her to your home as you suggest you'll think differently of that by and by but see that she does not want see that no winter shall find her hungry no winter morning cold oh annie annie that you should ever come to this it was a bitter wailing cry embodying all the mighty love the sick man had ever felt for his young wife george had thought himself resigned but weak human nature which clings so tenaciously to life was making one last effort for the mastery and the worn spirit fainted for a time in the fierce struggle which ensued the mind began to wander 
and was in fancy back again at the cottage in the hollow where the soldier clasped his annie to his bosom begging of her in piteous tones not to love him less because he was a cripple i have only one arm to work with now but i won't let you starve for when there's but one crust left i'll give it all to you and laugh so merrily that you will never guess how the hunger pain is gnawing at my heart i felt it once my darling i know just what it's like twas on that terrible day when our brave boys met the foe way up there at manassas there were hours and hours and hours when we neither ate nor drank and the july sun poured down so hotly drying the perspiration which dropped from my hair like rain twas my very life i sweat away that awful day fighting for the union did you hear the battle annie hear the cannon's bellowing thunder as it echoed through the virginia woods wasn't it grand the yell the highlanders gave us as with the sixty-ninth they bore down battery after battery and plunged into the enemy's midst how bravely our company played their part fighting their way through shot and shell and blood and brains wading ankle-deep in human gore hurrah for the stars and stripes my boys three cheers for the federal flag yes give us three times three and when it floats again over all the land remember the soldiers who helped defend it hurrah hurrah mr mather shuddered as the wild shout ran through the room it seemed so like a mockery that dying soldier shouting for liberty and trying in vain to wave aloft his poor scarred stump anon however the patriotic mood was changed and the voice was very sad which whispered but hush what sounds are these mingling in the glad notes of victory tis the widow the orphan the mother weeping over the slain there's mourning east and west there's weeping north and south for the dead who will return no more a crushed rebellion is hardly worth the fearful price oh annie pray for the poor soldier everybody pray honour our memory forget our faults speak kindly of us when we are gone we gave our life for freedom tis all that we can do speak kindly of the soldiers slain reason was struggling back again and bending lower mr mather said george we will honour the soldiers dead and care for the soldiers living yes yes george answered faintly they need it so much more than the people guess who stay at home and read about the war it will be long and the contest terrible the north is strong and the south determined and both will fight like fiends but right must conquer at last and the star-spangled banner shall wave again even over misguided charleston whose sons and daughters shall weep for joy as they greet the joyful sight god speed the happy day mr mather could only press the hand which lay again in his he could not speak for he knew there was a third presence now in the sick-room that its dark form was shading the bed whereon he sat and with that feeling of awe death always inspires he sat silently watching its progress and thinking it may be of the future time when william mather would be the dying one instead of george graham slowly the marble pallor and the strange chill crept on pinching the nose contracting the lips touching the forehead and moistening the soft brown hair which william smoothed caressingly as he bent down to catch the last faint whisperings of his spirit nearly gone we fought the battle bravely tell them not to be discouraged because of one defeat our cause is just twill triumph at the last don't be too bitter toward the south there are kind hearts there as well as here and its daughters weep as sadly as any at the north god help and pity them all annie darling i am almost home so near that i can see the pearly gates which stand open night and day it is not hard to die no pain no anguish now nothing but joy and gladness and everlasting rest rest perfect rest for the redeemed drearily the november wind went sweeping down the street and the sobbing rain beat against the window whilst the misty daylight came struggling faintly into the silent room which held the living and the dead the one cold and white and still his features wearing a smile of peace as if he had indeed entered into everlasting rest 
the other kneeling by his side and with his face buried in the pillows praying that when his time should come he too might die the death of the righteous and go where george had gone fourteen matters in rockland with quivering lip mr mather told the members of company r that their lieutenant was dead and strong men as they were they did not deem themselves unmanly that they wiped the big tears away and crowding around their informer anxiously asked for particulars of their departed comrade all speaking kindly of him and each thinking of the sweet girl wife at home on whom the news would fall so crushingly a soldier's dying was no novel thing in washington and so aside from company r there were few who knew or cared that another soul had gone to the god who gave it that another victim was added to the list which shall one day come up with fearful blackness before the provokers of the war the drums beat just the same the bands played just as merrily and the busy tide went on as if the quiet chamber in blank street held no stiffened form once as full of life and hope as the gay troops marching by but away to the northward there was bitter mourning and many a bright eye wept as the sad news ran along the street that rockland's young lieutenant of whom the people were justly proud lay dead in washington and many a heart beat with sympathy for the young wife who ever since hearing the fatal news had lain upon her bed more dead than alive with a look upon her white face which told better than words of the anguish she was enduring nothing could induce rose to leave her for a moment will had stayed by george she said and she should stay by annie with her sitting by annie grew stronger and could at last talk calmly of what was expected on the morrow it will be terrible she said to hear the tramp of feet coming up the walk and know they are bringing george oh mrs mather you'll stay by me won't you even if your husband is among the number annie did not mean to be selfish she was too much benumbed to realize anything fully and she never thought what it would cost rose to stay there knowing her husband would seek her at home and be so disappointed at not finding her there rose could not refuse a request so touchingly made but just as the morning broke she went home for a few moments to see that all necessary preparations were made for will's comfort then penning him a note to tell why she was not there to meet him she returned again to the cottage where widow sims was busily at work setting things to rights for the expected arrival her tears falling upon the furniture she was dusting and her chest heaving with sobs as she heard in the distance the sound of a gathering crowd and thought it may be my boy they'll go up next to meet poor annie too shuddered and moaned as she caught the ominous sounds and knew what they portended it would be better to bring him back quietly she said it seems almost like mockery this parade which he can never know i may be glad by and by that they honoured him thus but it's so hard now and covering her head with her pillow annie wept silently as she heard the mournful beat of the muffled drum and knew the march to the depot had commenced how rose wanted to be in the street and see her husband when he came but with heroic self-denial she forced down every longing to be away and sitting down by annie busied herself with counting off the minutes and wondering if the clock would ever point to half-past ten or the train ever arrive there was a great crowd out that morning to meet the returning soldier and george's dream of what might be when he came back again was more than realized there were men and carriages upon the street and groups of women at the corners while the little boys ran up and down but in the beat of the muffled drum there was a tone which made the hearts of those who heard it overflow with tears as they remembered what that dirge-like music meant around the jammed white hat of the man who played the fife there was a badge of mourning and in the notes he trilled a mournful cadence far different from the patriotic strains he played as a farewell to rockland soldiers going forth to battle with hope so sanguine of success one of that youthful band was coming back not full of life and fiery ambition as when he went away dreaming bright dreams of the glory he would win and the laurels he would wear when once again he trod the streets at home not as a conquering hero with the crown of fame on his brow though the crown indeed was won and where the golden light of heaven shines from the everlasting hills he was wearing it in glory but his ear was deaf to all earthly sounds and the tribute of respect his friends fain would bestow upon him awakened no thrill in his cold pulseless heart still they felt that all honour was due to the dead and so they had come up to meet him a greater throng than any of which he had dreamed when ambition burned within his bosom there was a carriage waiting too just as he hoped there might be a carriage sent expressly for him 
but the children on the sidewalk shrank away and ceased their noisy clamor as it went by its sombre appearance somewhat relieved by the gay coloring of the stars and stripes laid reverently upon it slowly up the street the long procession passed unmindful of the rain which mingled with the snow and sleet beat upon the pavements and dashed against the window panes from which many a tear-stained face looked out upon the gloomy scene made ten times gloomier by the sighing of the wind and the rifts of leaden clouds veiling the november sky over the eastern hills there was a rising wreath of smoke and a shrill discordant scream told that the train was coming just as the carriage sent for george drew up to its appointed place gently carefully tenderly they lifted him out and set him down in their midst but no loud cheering rent the air no acclamations of applause nothing save that dreadful muffled beat and the soft notes of the fife telling to the passengers leaning from the windows that the dead as well as the living had been their fellow-traveller the banner upon the hearse told the rest of the sad story and with a sigh to the memory of the unknown soldier the passengers resumed their seats and the train sped on its way leaving the rockland people alone with their dead reverently they placed him in the carriage which none cared to share with him carefully they wrapped around him the stars and stripes and dropping the heavy curtains followed through the streets to the cottage in the hollow which he had left so full of life and hope around that cottage there was a gathered multitude next day and though on the unsheltered heads of those without the driving rain was falling they waited patiently while the prayer was said and the funeral anthem chanted then there came a bustling moment people passing beneath the star-spangled banner and pausing to look at the dead there were sobs and tears and words of fond regret and then the coffin lid was closed and once more that muffled beat was heard as with arms reversed the rockland guards marched up the walk where leaning upon their guns they stood while strong men carried out their late companion and placed him in the hearse the carriage sent for him there was no relative to go with him to the grave none in whose veins his blood was flowing so mr mather and rose took the lead followed by a promiscuous crowd of carriages and pedestrians the very horses keeping time to the solemn music beaten by the drum and played by the man in the jammed white hat slowly through the november rain through the november sleet and through the november mist they bore him on through the streets which he so oft had trodden on past the cottage he meant to buy for poor annie whispering to herself with every note of the tolling bell george has gone to heaven onward still onward till streets and cottage were left behind and they came to where the marble columns gleaming through the autumnal fog told who peopled that silent yard just by the gate the bearers paused and stood with uncovered heads while the solemn words were uttered earth to earth ashes to ashes dust to dust then when it was all over the long procession moved through the spacious churchyard past the tall monuments betokening worldly wealth past the less imposing stones whose lettering told of treasure in heaven past the group of cedar trees and pine past the graves of the nameless dead and so out upon the highway rose mather starting in alarm as the band struck up a quicker merrier march whose stirring jubilant notes seemed so much like mockery she knew it was the custom but the music grated none the less harshly and drawing her veil over her face she wept silently occasionally glancing backward to the spot of freshly upturned earth where rockland's first soldier was buried the brave self-denying george who gave all he had for his country and died in her behalf four weeks after george's death annie left the cottage in the hollow and went to live for a time with mrs mather early orphaned and thrown upon the charities of a scheming aunt who after her marriage with george had cast her off entirely there was now no one to whom she could look for help and sympathy save rose and when the latter insisted that her home should be annie's also while william too joined his entreaties with those of his wife and urged as one reason his promise made to george annie consented on condition that as soon as her health was sufficiently restored she should do something for herself either as teacher or governess in some private family amid a wild storm of sobs and tears she had read her husband's dying message growing sick and faint just as he knew she would when first she learned of his loss and why it was he had never written to her himself but this was not compared to the horror which crept round her heart as she read what george had written of a coming time when the long grave by the gate would not be visited as often as at first or he who slept there remembered us tearfully oh george george she cried it was cruel to tell me so 
and sinking to her knees she essayed to breathe a vow that other love than that she had borne for george graham should never find entrance to her bosom but something sealed her lips the words she would have uttered were unspoken and the rash vow was not made still there was an added drop to her already brimming cup of sorrow and a sadder more loving note in the tone of her voice when she spoke of her husband as if she would fortify herself against the possibility of his prediction coming true it was a sorry day when she finally left her cottage home and only god was witness to the parting but the dim swollen eyes and colourless cheeks attested to its bitterness as with one great upheaving sob she crossed the threshold and entered the carriage where rose sat waiting for her while the motherly widow sims wrapped around her the pile of shawls which were to shield her from the cold and bade her godspeed to her new home rapidly the carriage drove away while the widow returned to the cottage to perform the last needful office of fastening down the windows and locking up the doors then with a sigh at the changes a few short months had wrought she went back to her own long deserted home and the busy tide of life rolled on in rockland just the same as if in the churchyard there was no new-made grave holding the buried love of annie who in rose mather's beautiful home was surrounded with every possible comfort and luxury and treated with as much consideration as if she were a born princess instead of the humble woman who a few months before was wholly unknown to the little lady of the mather mansion End of chapters 13 and 14chapter fifteen of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain fifteen the deserter another had taken george's place in company r and both the widow sims and susan sims shed tears of natural pride when they read that john was the favoured one and bore the title of lieutenant it more than half atoned for his long absence to the young wife who greatly to her mother-in-law's disgust was made the happy possessor of a set of furs bought with a part of the new lieutenant's increased wages better lay by for a wet day but easy come easy go they will never be worth a cent tain't like them rugglesses to save and to think of the silly critters comin round in the storm just to show em late on saturday night i'm glad i want to hum was the widow's muttered comment as on the sunday following the receipt of the furs she pinned around her high square shoulders the ten-year-old blanket shawl and tying round her neck the faded tippet of an even greater age started for church determining not to notice or speak to the extravagant susan if she appeared as she was sure to do in her new finery this was hardly the right kind of spirit for the widow to take to church but hers was a peculiar nature and the grace which would have sufficed to make annie graham an angel would hardly have kept her from boiling over at the most trivial matter this the widow felt and it made her more distrustful of herself more careful to keep down the first approaches of her besetting sin but the furs had seriously disturbed her particularly as they were said to have cost thirty-five dollars more than she had spent on her mortal body in half a dozen years she thought as with her well-worn prayer-book in hand and a pair of eli's darned blue socks upon her feet to keep them from the snow which had fallen the night before she walked rapidly on in the direction of st luke's there was an unusual stir about the doors a crowd of eagerly talking people and conspicuous among them was susan looking so pretty in her neatly fitting collar and holding her little muff so gracefully that the widow began to relent at once and to feel a kind of pride that john's wife was as genteel looking as the next one if she did come off them shiftless ruglesses but inasmuch as it was sunday she shouldn't flatter susan by speaking of the furs but the first chance she got on a weekday she'd tell her she was glad she got em if they didn't make her vain though i know they will she added it's ruggles nature and she's standin out there now just to show em to the folks in the street goin to the methodist meetin but the widow was mistaken for susan had scarcely thought of her furs so absorbed was she in throwing what little light she could upon a mystery which was troubling the people and keeping them outside the door while they talked the matter over it seemed that the sexton when at about ten o'clock on the previous night he came to see that the fire kindled in the furnace at sunset was safe had stumbled over a human form lying upon the pile of evergreens gathered for the christmas decorations and placed for safe keeping in the cellar of the church there was a cry between surprise and terror and a muttered oath and then the ragged frightened intruder sprang to his feet 
and bounding up the narrow stairway fled through the open vestry door ere the sexton had time to collect his scattered senses this was his story corroborated by susan sims who said that when at about seven o'clock the previous night she was passing the church she saw a dark-looking object which she at first mistook for a woman but as she came nearer she saw it was the figure of a man who at the sound of her steps dropped behind a pile of rubbish and thus disappeared from view that feeling timid she did not return home that way but took the more circuitous route past her mother-in-law's where she stopped for a moment and repeated the circumstance to the neighbour she found staying there then she didn't come half a mile out of the way just to tell of her finery thought the widow coming nearer to susan and even smoothing the soft fur which half an hour before had so provoked her ire various were the surmises as to who the man could be and why he had entered the lonesome cellar and the morning services had commenced ere the knot of talkers and listeners at the door disbanded and took their accustomed places in the church rose mather was there as usual but she knelt in her handsome pew alone for will had been gone from her two whole weeks and annie was still too much of an invalid to venture out with others at the door she heard of the intruder and after asking a few questions she had passed into the aisle with a certain wise air about her as if she knew something which she should not tell as one after another came in it might have been observed that she turned often and curiously toward the door glancing occasionally at the spot where mrs baker now a regular attendant was in the habit of sitting she was not there to-day a fact which no one observed save rose and the widow sims the latter of whom only noticed it because annie she knew was deeply interested in the repentant woman she's sick most likely the widow thought while rose too had her own opinion as to what kept harry's mother from church that sunday morning meantime the object of their solicitude sat crouching over the fire of wet green wood she had succeeded in coaxing into a blaze now looking nervously toward the half-closed door of the small room her boys used to occupy and again congratulating herself that it was sunday and consequently no one would be coming there to pry into the secret she was guarding as carefully as ever tigress guarded its threatened young the half-frozen famished wretch fleeing from the shadow of the church out into the wintry storm which had come up since nightfall had gone next to the tumble-down shanty of a house which mrs baker called her home it was late for a light to be there for mrs baker kept early hours but through the driving snow the wanderer as he turned the corner caught a friendly gleam shining out from the dingy windows and waking in his breast one great wild throb of joy such as some lost mariner feels when he spies in the distance the friendly bark and knows there's help at hand it was a desolate dreary home but to the wanderer hastening toward it and glancing so timidly round as if behind each rift of snow were bristling bayonets sent to stop his course it seemed a splendid palace could he gain that shelter he was safe his mother would shield him from the dreaded officers he fancied were on his track and so the sick fainting man kept on until the old board fence was reached where leaning against the gate he stood a moment and with his feverish hand scooped up the grateful snow to cool his burning forehead the tallow candle was burning yet within the cottage but the fire was raked together on the hearth and the stranger could see the glow of the red embers and the broken shovel lain across the andiron i wonder what she's doing up so late he whispered and moving cautiously up the walk to the uncurtained window he started suddenly at the novel sight which met his view years before when he lived in new england he remembered that one day when playing in the garret he had found in a chest of rubbish a large square book which hal had said was their grandmother's bible afterward he had seen it standing against a broken light of glass to keep out the snow which sometimes beat in upon himself and hal and that was the last he could remember concerning that bible or any other belonging to his mother how then was he astonished to see it lying on the old round stand the dim tallow candle casting a flickering light upon the yellow leaves and upon the figure of his mother bending over them and loudly whispering the words she was reading it was not an entirely new business to mrs baker the reading of the bible for after the news of harry's death she had hunted up the long neglected volume which had given her aged mother so much comfort it might bring consolation to her she thought and so with tearful eyes and aching heart she had tried to read and understand the sacred pages pencil marked some of them by a sainted mother's hand and fraught with so many memories of the olden time when she was not the hard wrinkled desolate creature people knew as mrs baker 
the way of life was still dark and dim to that half heathenish woman but she was determinedly groping on following the little light she had and each night found her bending over the bible ere she sought the humble bed standing there in the dark corner just where it stood that morning when her two boys went away it was far more comfortable looking now than then for there was a nice warm blanket on it while the outer covering was clean and new rose mather had kept her promise given in the hour of the poor woman's bereavement and scattered about the room were numerous articles which once did duty in the servants apartments at the mather mansion but the intruder did not notice these he was too much absorbed with the stooping figure whispering a part of the fourteenth chapter of john and occasionally wiping away a tear as she came to some passage more beautiful than the others there were tears too in the eyes of the rough man outside but he forced them back and pressing closer to the window watched the lone woman inside as sinking down upon her knees with the flickering candle shining on her wrinkled face she prayed first for herself and then for him the boy standing without the door and listening while his heart beat so loudly that he almost feared she would hear and know that he was there but she paid no heed and the tremulous voice went on asking that god would follow and bless and care for the billy boy far away and bring him back to the mother who had never been to him what she ought the name billy boy touched a tender chord and stretching out his hands toward her the man who bore that name sobbed out oh mother mother i'm here i'm here there was a sudden pause and turning her head the startled woman listened was it the wind moaning round her lonesome dwelling or was it poor dead harry calling to her as in her superstitious imagination she sometimes believed he did when she was praying for billy reproaching her that no prayer had ever been said for him the lost one again the sobbing cry and a rustling movement by the door it could not be the wind for that only shook the loosened timbers or screamed through some gaping crevice while this whatever it might be called mother mother come was it a warning from the other world a summons to follow her first-born annie graham had said there were no such messages sent to us and annie was always right so the frightened woman listened again until the rattling of the latch and a feeble timid knock told her there was more than the winter wind or spirits of the dead about her house that night there was a human being seeking to gain entrance and tottering to the door she asked who it was and what they wanted there mother mother let me in i'm your billy boy come from the war the words were hardly uttered ere the door was opened wide the frantic woman dragging rather than leading in the worn-out man who staggering forward fell into her arms sobbing piteously i'm so sick and tired i've been weeks on the road hiding everywhere for mother shut the door tight so nobody can hear i've run away i've had enough of war and so i left one night you know what they do to deserters they hang them neck and heels oh mother mother don't let them find me will you i've done my best in one dreadful battle they mustn't get me now will they think and billy cast a searching glance around the room to see that no officer was there with power to take him back would they get him from her she'd like to see them do it she said as she led the childish deserter to the hearth he leaning heavily upon her and falling rather than sitting upon the chair she brought weary of a soldier's life and satisfied with one taste of battle he had stolen away one night when the rain and the darkness sheltered him from observation greatly magnifying the value put upon himself as well as the chances for detection he had not dared to take the cars lest at every station there should be one of the police waiting to secure him so he had made the entire journey from washington on foot travelling by night and resting by day sometimes in barns but oftener in the woods where some friendly stump or leafless tree was his only shelter he had reached his home at last but his haggard face his bloodshot eyes his blistered feet and tattered garments bore witness to his long painful journey with streaming eyes the mother listened to the story then opening the bed of coals she warmed and chafed his half-frozen limbs handling tenderly the poor blistered feet from which the soles of the shoes had dropped leaving them exposed but all in vain did she prepare the cup of fragrant tea sent her that afternoon by mrs mather billy could do little more than taste it he was too tired he said he should be better in the morning after he had slept 
so with eager trembling hands his mother fixed the bed in the little room which had not been used since he went away bringing her own pillows and the nice rose blanket given by mrs mather together with a strip of carpet which she spread upon the floor so as to make it soft for billy's wounded bleeding feet how sick he was and how he moaned in his fitful sleep now talking of hal now of being shot and again of the bible on the stand and the prayer he heard his mother make mrs baker was not accustomed to sickness but she knew this was no ordinary case and she suggested sending for the doctor but billy started up in such dismay telling her no one must know that he was there unless she wanted him killed that he succeeded in communicating a part of his terror to her and she spent the entire sunday by her child's bedside doing what she could to allay the raging fever increasing so fast and keeping watch to see that no one came near to drag her boy away the next morning it became absolutely necessary for her to leave him for a time as she must procure the few necessaries he needed and taking advantage of the heavy sleep into which he had fallen she stole noiselessly out hoping to return ere he should wake scarcely however had she left the lane and turned into main street when rose came tripping to the gate drawn thither by a curiosity to see if her suspicions were correct she had learned from her husband of bill's exit from washington and for some days had been expecting to hear of his arrival in town that he had come she was certain and telling annie where she was going she had started rather early for mrs baker's as her knock met with no response she entered without further ceremony and passing on through the low dark kitchen came to the door of the little room where bill lay breathing heavily and muttering about camps and guard-houses and deserters the sight of suffering always awoke a chord of sympathy in rose mather's bosom and without a thought of danger she bent close to the sick man and involuntarily laid her soft cool hand upon his burning forehead the touch awoke him but in the wild eyes turned upon her there was no glance of recognition or look of fear he evidently fancied himself back in washington and asked the name of her regiment oh i know he continued still keeping his eyes fixed upon her you're the chap i took but you fell away mightily since then yankee fare don't set well on your rebel stomach i guess and a wild coarse laugh rang through the room making rose shudder and draw back for she felt intuitively that billy was mad she was not however afraid of him and standing at a little distance she tried to reason with him telling him she was not a rebel she was mrs mather come to do him good bill only laughed derisively couldn't cheat him guess he knew them eyes and them hands white as cotton wool i'll bet i've got a ring that'll fit em he continued and reaching for his pantaloons which he had insisted should lie behind him on the bed he took from the pocket the costly diamond once worn by his rebel captive and confiscated by him as contraband try it on he said to rose who mechanically obeyed wondering why it should look so familiar to her it was too large for her slender fingers and dropping off rolled upon the floor rose at once set herself to finding the missing ring and had just returned it to its owner when mrs baker came in terribly alarmed at finding mrs mather there rose however quieted her fears at once by telling her she had known for some days past of bill's desertion and had kept it from every one but annie because her husband thought it best she did not believe he would be followed she said for will wrote that he had become so reckless and discontented that his absence was no loss to the army but for a while it might be well that his presence should not be known in rockland as the people might be indignant at a deserter and perhaps in their excitement do him some injury he ought to have medical advice though she added for i think he's very sick mrs baker knew he was and fear lest he should die overcame every other feeling making her consent that rose should call their family physician it was nearly noon ere he arrived and in the meantime rose had reported the case to annie and then returning to mrs baker's took her place by billy who called her his little rebel and ordered her about as if he had been a commanding officer and she his subordinate the novelty of the thing was rather pleasing to rose and notwithstanding that the physician pronounced the disease typhus fever in its most violent form she persisted in staying saying some one must help mrs baker and she was not afraid so day after day found her in that comfortless dwelling while the frequent callers at the mather mansion wondered where she could be 
it came out at last that she was nursing william baker lying dangerously sick of typhus fever in his mother's dilapidated home and then as villagers will the rockland people wondered and gossiped and wondered again how the aristocratic rose mather could sit hour after hour in that poverty-stricken cottage ministering to the wants of despised bill baker rose hardly knew herself and when questioned upon the subject could only reply i guess it's because he's a soldier and i must do something for the war will knows it he says i'm doing right and annie graham too and so with her heart kept brave by thinking that will and annie approved her course rose went every day to mrs baker's doing more by her cheerful presence and the needful comfort she supplied to arrest the progress of the disease and effect a favourable change than all the physicians in the county could have done bill owed his life to her and it was touching to witness his childish gratitude when reason resumed her throne and he learned who it was he had sometimes called his little rebel and again had fancied was some beautiful angel sent to cure and comfort him he had often seen mrs mather in the streets before he went away but never as closely as now and for hours after his convalescence he would lie looking into her face which seemed to puzzle him greatly occasionally too he would take from his pocket a picture which he evidently compared with something about her person then with a sly wink which began to be very annoying he would return it to its hiding-place and ask her sundry questions which under ordinary circumstances she would have resented as being too familiar at last one afternoon as she was sitting by him while his mother did some errands in the village he suddenly surprised her by dropping upon her lap an elegant gold watch which rose knew at a glance must have belonged to some person of taste and wealth what is it whose is it she asked and bill replied twas his'n the chaps i took you know he's down to the old capital now shut up didn't you never hear of him you mean the young man you captured rose replied tell me about him please who was he and where was his home you tell bill answered with one of his peculiar winks he gave it as john brown but a chap who knowed him said twas something else he want a rebel neither that is it want his nature for he came from yankee land a traitor then rose suggested and bill replied you needn't guess again and you and i are to be glad that no such truck belongs to us rose coloured scarlet but made no response for recreant jimmy flashed across her mind and she shrank from having even the vulgar bill know how intimately she was connected with a traitor bill watched her narrowly and thinking to himself i'm on the right track i'll bet he continued i hain't no relations in the confederate army i know and i don't an atom believe you have no answer from rose except a heightened bloom upon her cheek and her inquisitor went on have you any friends there rose could not tell a lie and after a moment's silence she stammered out please don't ask me oh jimmy jimmy i wish i knew where he was and the great tears trickled through the snowy fingers clasped over her flushed face i'll be darned if i ain't cryin too bill said wiping his eyes with his shirt-sleeve but bein i'm in for it i may as well see it through what might be your name before it was miss marthers carleton and rose looked up quickly at bill who continued you came from boston i believe yes from boston and rose leaned eagerly forward while bill with his favourite nuff said plunged his hand into his pocket and taking out the picture passed it to rose quick as thought the bright colour faded from her cheek and with ashen quivering lips she whispered it's i it's mine taken for jimmy just before he went away how came you by it oh tell me and in the voice there was a tone of increasing anguish tell me was it was it jimmy my brother whom you took prisoner and carried to washington if james carleton is your brother i suppose it was bill said and that's the very picture he stuck to like a chestnut burr begging for it like a dog and offering everything he had if i'd give it up why didn't you then and rose's eyes blazed with anger making bill shrink from their indignant gaze twas rotten in me i know he said timidly but they was contraband according to law and i felt so savage at the pesky rebels then i didn't know twas you he teased so for actually cryin when i wouldn't give it up i'm sorry i be i swore and i'll give you every confounded contraband you've got the watch and there's the ring the spectacles 
the tobacco box and the thingamabob for cigars the sum total of his traps except a chaw or so of the weed that i couldn't very well bring back and bill's face wore a very satisfied expression as he laid in rose's lap every article belonging to her brother she knew now who the prisoner was in whom she had felt so strange an interest it was jimmy and the mystery concerning his fate was solved he was a captive at washington and her heart ached to its very core as she thought of both her brothers languishing so many weary months in prison very minutely she questioned bill eliciting from him little or nothing concerning jimmy's present condition he only knew that he was a captive still that he was represented as maintaining the utmost reserve seldom speaking except to answer direct questions and that he seemed very unhappy poor boy he wants to come home i know and rose sobbed aloud as she thought how desolate and homesick he must be i can't stay any longer to-day she said as she heard mrs baker at the door and bidding bill good-bye she hurried home where after a long passionate flood of tears wept in annie's lap she wrote to her mother and husband both telling them where jimmy was and begging of the former to come at once and go with her to washington End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 16. News Direct from Jimmy That night, as Rose sat alone in her cheerful boudoir musing upon the strange events which had occurred within the last few months, a letter was brought to her bearing her mother's handwriting. It had passed hers on the road, and Rose tore it open, startling as a soiled, tear-stained note dropped from the inside upon the floor intuitively she felt that it was from jimmy and catching it up she read the homesick heartsick remorseful cry of penitence and contrition which the weary rebel boy had at last sent to his mother stubbornness and proud reserve could hold out no longer and he had written confessing his error and begging earnestly for the forgiveness he knew he did not deserve i am not all bad he said and on that quiet morning when beneath the cover of the virginia woods i lay watching the union soldiers coming so bravely on there was a dizziness in my brain and a strange womanly feeling at my heart while a sensation i cannot describe thrilled every nerve when i saw in the distance the stars and stripes waving in the summer wind how i wanted to warn them of their danger to bid them turn back from the snare so cunningly devised and how proud i felt of the federal soldiers when contrasting them with ours i fancied i could tell which were the boston boys and there came a mist before my eyes as i thought how your dear hands and those of little rose had possibly helped to make some portion of the dress they wore you know about the battle you read it months ago and wept perhaps as you thought of jimmy firing at his own brother it mightn't be but mother i did not i scarcely fired at all and when i was compelled to do so to avoid suspicion it was so high that neither the wounded nor the dead can accuse me as their murderer and i'm glad now that it is so it makes my prison bed softer to know there is no stain of blood upon my soul poor tom i dare say has written to you of our encounter in the woods but he does not know the shock it was to me to meet him there and know i could not help him dear tom my heart aches more for him than for myself for the richmond prison guards are not like those who keep watch over us there are humane people there kind tender hearts which feel for any one in distress but the jailers the common soldiers and the rabble are not i fear as considerate as they might be many of them have been made to believe the war entirely of the north's provoking that hamlin is a mulatto and lincoln a foul-hearted knave whose whole aim is to set the negroes free but enough of southern politics it will all come clear at last and the star-spangled banner wave again over every revolted state write to me mother say you forgive your rebel boy say that when i am exchanged as i hope to be i may come home and that you will not turn away from your sinful erring jimmy there was a message of love for rose and then the letter closed with one last touching entreaty that the mother would forgive her child and take him back again to her confidence and love of course she'll do it rose said vehemently and seizing a pen and paper she wrote to will enclosing a note to jimmy full of pardon and tender love bidding him when he should be released come directly to rockland where their mother should be waiting for him and where she forgetting all the past would nurse him back to health 
nearly a week went by and then there came a letter from will telling how he had visited the rebel jimmy in his prison and rose wept frantically as she read the particulars of that interview when her brother first met the sister's husband of whom he had never heard i found him sitting apart from the others william wrote apparently absorbed in disagreeable reflections for there was an abstracted look upon his face and deep wrinkles upon his forehead if he had not been pointed out to me i should have known him by his striking resemblance to your family the carleton features could not be mistaken particularly the proud curve about the mouth and the arching of the eyebrows while i recognized at once the soft curling hair and brilliant complexion which you will remember once attracted me toward a certain little girl who is now all the world to the old bachelor will but this isn't a love letter darling i'm only going to tell you how sorry your brother looked sitting there alone in that noisy multitude whose language and manners are not the most refined that could be desired and how my heart warmed toward the solitary being and forgave him at once for all his errors past very haughtily he bowed to me when i was introduced and then in silence awaited to hear my errand the proud curve around his mouth deepening as he surveyed me with a hauteur which under ordinary circumstances would have annoyed me exceedingly as it was i could almost fancy myself the prisoner and he the free man he seemed so cool so collected while i was embarrassed and uncertain how to act is your visit prompted by curiosity to see how a so-called rebel can bear confinement or did you come on business he asked and then all my embarrassment was at an end i came i said partly at your sister's request and partly to ascertain how much you are willing to do toward the attainment of your freedom i do not think he understood the last he only caught at the words your sister and grasping my arm he whispered hoarsely what of my sister have you seen her do you know her and does she hate me now i told him i was your husband and with quivering lip he asked me is she well my precious little rose whom i remember almost as a child and mother has she cast me off oh if she only knew how i am punished for my sin she would forgive her wayward boy here he broke down in such a wild storm of sobs and tears that the inmates of the prison gathered in groups around him their looks indicative of their surprise at witnessing so much emotion in one who up to that moment had appeared haughtily indifferent to everything around him with an authoritative gesture he waved them off and then passing him your note i too walked away leaving him alone while he read it but even where i stood i could hear the smothered sobs he tried in vain to suppress i am inclined to think he is right in saying that joining the confederate army was the best lesson he ever learned i am sure he must be greatly changed from the reckless daring boy whose exploits you have described so often he is very anxious to swear allegiance to the stars and stripes even though he should be doomed to prison life for five more weary months and as i am not a mere private now and i have considerable influence in washington i hope ere long to write that he is free and on his way to rockland whither he will go first jimmy expresses the utmost sympathy for tom and says he would gladly take his place if that could be for he fears the inmates of those richmond tobacco houses are not always cared for as he has been at washington poor tom i hope he will be among the list of the exchanged and if so you may expect soon to welcome both your brothers no wonder rose wept tears of joy over his letter while her thoughts went after her rebellious but repentant brother nor tarried there for farther to the south another weary captive pined and every fibre of her heart bled with sympathy for tom poor tom she always called him and as the days of sickening suspense went by she grew so nervous and so ill that her mother came up from boston to attend her while annie shook off her own feelings of weary languor and did for rose the same offices which rose had once done for her i do so wish you had been my sister rose said to her one day when she had been kinder than usual i know i should be a better woman and so would all of us annie made no reply except to twine around her fingers the coil of chestnut hair lying in such profusion upon the pillows for a few moments rose lay perfectly still with her eyes fixed upon the paper bordering as if counting the fanciful flowers but her thoughts were intent upon a far different subject turning to her mother she suddenly asked how old is jimmy twenty-three or twenty-four twenty-three last may was the reply and with a rather troubled expression upon her face rose continued will is thirteen years older than i am and the little curly head shook doubtfully what are you talking about 
mrs carleton asked but rose did not answer at once there was another interval of silence and then starting quickly rose called out mother don't you remember that affair of jimmy's ever so long ago when he was a boy at school in new london there was a little girl that he fancied and you took him home for fear of what would come of it when you found she was poor and nobody glancing quickly at annie who was attentively examining the hemstitch of the fine linen pillow-case mrs carleton said reprovingly you should not parade our family matters before strangers my daughter oh annie is no stranger rose answered laughingly she is one of our folks now besides she is not enough interested in the love affair of a seventeen years old boy ever to repeat it love affair mrs carleton rejoined a little scornfully not very much love about it i imagine she was stopping with her aunt at the pequot house and jimmy saw her a few times passing himself off by another name than his own if he had cared for this child he would never have done that he seems to have a penchant for assuming names rose rejoined playfully he called himself john brown at washington while to this little pequot girl he was let me see what was it can't you think mother rose was bent on talking about jimmy and his pequot girl and knowing that she could not stop her mrs carleton replied richard lee or something like that oh yes dick i remember now and her name was what was it mother it makes my head ache so trying to recall it if ever i knew i've forgotten mrs carleton said and after trying in vain to think rose dismissed the name but not the subject how angry jimmy was she continued when you brought him home and how awfully he swore it makes you shudder don't it and she turned to annie who had shivered either with cold or horror at jimmy's profanity he was a bad boy once but i most know he's better now maybe mother this was a real nice girl and if you'd let jimmy alone he might have become attached to her and she have been his wife by this time then he would not have joined the rebel army don't you think you and tom were a little too severe on jimmy sometimes perhaps so was the faint response as mrs carleton looked out upon the wintry landscape seeing there visions of a handsome boyish tearful face flushed with anger and entreaty as its owner begged of her not to take him back to boston which he hated but leave him where he was saying that the little girl at the pequot house had already done him more good than all the sermons preached from the pulpits of the bay state capital but she had disregarded jimmy's wishes and from that time forward he had pursued a course of recklessness ending at last in prison with a half regretful sigh mrs carleton thought of all this and in her heart she blamed herself for some of her boy's disobedience but it could not now be helped and with another sigh she turned toward rose still speculating as to what the result might have been had jimmy been suffered to follow up his first and so far as she knew only fancy what do you suppose would have happened if jimmy had stayed in new london and this scheming aunt whom mother feared far more than the pequot had stayed there too she asked of annie forgetting that the particulars of the affair had not been repeated but it did not matter for annie answered all the same she was sitting now with her back to mrs carleton while so far as rose was concerned her face was in the shadow consequently rose could not see its expression as she replied nothing probably would have come of it i imagine the pequot as you call her was not more than fourteen and you know how easily we forget the fancies of that age she was undoubtedly pleased with the evident admiration of your handsome brother and watched anxiously it may be for the evenings when with others of his comrades he came to the hotel but a closer acquaintance would have resulted in her knowing the deception about the name and after that she would not have cared for him if he really liked her he would not have imposed upon her thus she's forgotten him ere this and is probably a married woman perhaps so rose replied i wish i knew jimmy didn't mean to deceive her long he took the name dick lee partly in sport and partly because he didn't wish his teacher to know how often jim carleton was at the pequot house when he thought him somewhere else after he began to like her and saw how pure and good and truthful she was he hated to tell her but had made up his mind to do so when mother took him away he might have written annie said and she may have been silly enough to cry over his abrupt and unexplained departure mother wouldn't let him write rose rejoined laughingly she watched him closely and got tom interested too poor jimmy i wonder if that girl ever thinks of him now 
she may but i dare say she is glad your mother took him home she has outlived all that fancy and annie's white fingers on one of which the wedding ring was shining worked nervously together as if bent on tormenting both her auditors by talking of jimmy rose kept on wondering how he looked if she should know him what he would say how he would act and if he ever would come i'm so glad you are here annie she said for you do everybody good to come in contact with and i want you to talk to jimmy will you annie only smiled but her cheeks burned with excitement and rose was about asking her if her head didn't ache when a letter was brought in bearing the washington postmark eagerly rose broke it open screaming with joy as she read that jimmy had been released had taken the oath of allegiance and was coming home to rockland he'll be here let me see thursday on the three o'clock train that's to-morrow oh i'm so glad and in her delight the little lady forgot that for the last week she had been playing sick and leaping upon the carpet danced about the room kissing alternately her mother and annie and asking if they were ever so pleased in their lives oh i forgot she suddenly exclaimed as she saw the great tears dropping from annie's eyes and guessed of what she was thinking i did not mean to make you sorry contrasting jimmy's coming home with that of poor george dear annie don't cry and the chubby arms closed coaxingly round the now sobbing annie's neck don't cry you'll like jimmy i know and if you don't i know you'll like dear tom he's perfectly splendid and he gave his place to george you know yes annie knew but it only made her tears flow faster as she thought of rose so full of hope her husband yet alive and her brothers coming home while she without a friend on whom she could lean was alone in her desolate widowhood excusing herself from the room she sought her own pleasant chamber and there alone poured out her grief into the ear of one who almost since she could remember had been the recipient of all her sorrows and annie had far more need for help than rose suspected she could not stay there and meet jimmy carleton face to face after what she had heard while a return to the lonely cottage seemed impossible widow sim's home suggested itself to her mind but if the prisoners were exchanged and isaac came home she might be an intruder there and besides what truthful reason could she give to rose for her strange conduct it was a sad dilemma in which annie found herself so suddenly placed and more than an hour of solitary and prayerful reflection found her still uncertain as to the course duty would dictate in the present emergency it seemed expedient that she should go away and when in the evening she joined rose who chanced to be alone she suggested leaving her house at least during jimmy's stay and going either to the cottage in the hollow or to stay with widow sims in the utmost astonishment rose listened to the proposal and then replied you go away because jimmy is coming preposterous why i want you here on his account if nothing more besides where will you go widow sims has taken susan to live with her at john's request and that little teeny place will not begin to hold three women with hoops you forget the widow does not wear them annie suggested her heart beginning to sink notwithstanding her playful words yes i know rose replied but you are not going there if you are in the way here with jimmy you'd surely be more in the way there with isaac don't you see and rose looked as if this argument were altogether conclusive i can go home annie said faintly the cottage is mine till the first of april rose coloured and hesitated somewhat as if a little uncertain how what she had to say on this subject might be received then resolving to put a bold face upon it she said i ought to have told you before i suppose don't you remember the day you had the sick headache more than a week ago well while you were asleep a man came to know if you'd let him into the cottage till spring as he was obliged to leave where he was and could find no other place i did not wish to wake you and as i knew you would not care i said yes on my own responsibility and sent bridget down to pack all your things in the chamber as he only wanted the lower rooms she put them away real carefully bridget did for i've been to see myself rose added quickly as she saw the colour mounting to annie's cheeks and feared she might be indignant at the liberty and is he there annie asked conquering all emotion and speaking in her natural tone yes he's there rose answered you are not angry are you he's a nice man and so is his wife i am not angry annie replied 
but more sorry than i can express though had i been consulted i should undoubtedly have done as you did oh i'm so glad for it has bothered me a heap wondering what you'd say rose cried throwing her arms around annie's neck and now you'll stay with us for you see you have nowhere else to go shan't she mother and she appealed to mrs carleton who had just come in of course mrs graham will stay was mrs carleton's reply for during the few days of her sojourn at rockland she had become greatly interested in the sweet young annie and already foresaw the benefit she would be to rose who needed some such influence to keep her in check mrs carleton was proud and at first her daughter's growing intimacy with the wife of a mechanic had given her pride a pang but a closer acquaintance had dispelled the foolish prejudice for she saw in the gentle annie unmistakable marks of education and refinement while she was not insensible to the charm thrown around the beautiful stranger by the lovely christian character which shone so brightly now in the dark hour of affliction coming nearer to her and laying her hand in a motherly way upon her pale brown hair she said we all want you mrs graham and as rose by an act which i will admit was too presuming has virtually closed your own doors against you i see no alternative but for you to stay with us rose needs you and as she says you may do jimmy good while tom if he ever comes will be glad to meet the wife of one in whom he was greatly interested after this annie offered no further remonstrance though in her heart she hoped jimmy's residence in rockland would not be very long of tom she had no dread she rather wished to see him than otherwise for he had been so kind to george and in fancy she had enshrined him as a middle-aged grayish-haired man stooping a little perhaps and withal very fatherly and venerable in his appearance this was tom but jimmy handsome saucy-eyed mischievous jimmy putting angle-worms in rose's bosom and frightening the little pequot with a mud-turtle found on new london beach was a very different thing and though trusting much to the lapse of years and change of name annie shrank nervously from the dreaded to-morrow which was to bring the rebel home End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain seventeen the confederate soldiers welcome to rockland rose had fretted herself into a headache and as mrs carleton could not think of meeting her returning prodigal in the presence of strangers there was no one to go up to meet him unless annie should consent to do so but greatly to rose's disappointment annie obstinately refused while mrs carleton too said it would not be proper for mrs graham to go alone and meet a stranger whom she had never seen couldn't she tell him she was annie my adopted sister rose said half poutingly what will he think when he finds nobody there but jake who i verily believe looks upon him as half a savage for having joined the southern army i heard him myself tell bridget that ben arnold was coming to-day meaning that horrid traitor that gave up yorktown or something and having thus betrayed her ignorance of revolutionary history rose bathed her aching head in eau de cologne and lay back upon her pillows wondering what jimmy would say and how he would manage to brave the gaping people who were sure to stare at him as if he were some monster she hoped there would not be many there and of course there wouldn't for who knew or cared for jimmy's coming more cared for jimmy's coming than rose suspected and the streets were full of men and boys of a certain class hastening to the depot to see the rebel as they persisted in calling him in spite of billy baker's repeated suggestions that they soften it down somewhat by prefixing the word reformed bill was very busy very important very consequential that day and quite inclined to be very patronizing and do the agreeable to the man he had captured in manassas folks are to overlook him he said and treat him half way decent or the best was apt to stumble and there should neither be hootin nor hissin if he could help it indeed so impressed was bill with the idea that the responsibility of jimmy's reception was spending upon himself that he deliberately knocked down two of the ringleaders who announced their intention to hoot and to hiss as much as they pleased bill's warlike propensities were pretty generally understood in rockland and this energetic demonstration had the effect of quelling to a certain extent the babel which would otherwise have reigned when at last the train stopped before the depot and the expected lion appeared upon the platform his identity proven by bill who whispered that's him with the rowdy hat that's the chap 
then with a proud air of self-assurance he stepped forward and offered his hand to the embarrassed stranger who was looking this way and that in quest of a familiar face hello corporal he called out with the utmost sang-froid you recognize me i suppose i'm the critter that took you in the virginny woods i've gin all them contrabands to your sister miss marthers she and i has got to be considerable intimate i think a sight on her he continued as jimmy showed no signs of reciprocating the coarse familiarity other than by rather haughtily offering his hand but bill was not to be put down for wasn't he as good as corporal carleton hadn't they sustained to each other the relation of captor and captive and if there were any preference wasn't it in his favour he thought so and nothing abashed by jimmy's evident disgust he was about announcing to him that a carriage was in waiting when jake made his way through the crowd to the spot where jimmy stood the sight of him suggested a new idea to bill and bowing first to one and then to the other he said ah mr jacob sullivan allow me to introduce you to my friend corporal carleton late of the confederate army supposed to be fitten for just such goods and chattels as you the african's teeth were plainly visible at this novel introduction while the good-humoured smile which broke over the hitherto cold haughty features of the stranger changed into a general laugh the muttered groans and imprecations which the words confederate army had provoked it was strange what a difference that smile made in the looks of jimmy's handsome face removing its haughty sarcastic expression and softening to a great extent the feelings of the crowd many of whom instinctively dropped the brickbats stones and bits of frozen mud with which they were prepared to pelt the rebels carriage so soon as they should be in the rear still they must have some fun even if it were at bill's expense and just as the latter was buttonholing the persecuted jimmy and escorting him to the carriage one more daring than the others proposed three groans and a tiger for the deserter instantly hats caps and fists were flourished aloft and the air resounded with the most direful sounds imaginable as groan after groan came heaving up from the leathern lungs of the crowd with a fierce gesture of impatience jimmy turned upon them his black eyes flashing fire at what he deemed an insult offered to himself whatever his faults had been desertion was not among the number and he was about to say so when bill with imperturbable gravity whispered to him they don't mean you now corporal it's me they're hittin a dig you see i did leave washington in a hurry don't mind em an atom they're the off scorins of the town and having piloted jimmy safely to the carriage door bill took off his own cap and swinging it around his head shouted aloud three cheers for corporal carleton for an instant there was a silence the crowd a little uncertain as to how far their loyalty might be impeached by cheering for a rebel but when the dark handsome face with its winning smile was again turned toward them and they saw in it a strong resemblance to the patriotic little lady whom even the lowest of them had learned to regard with respect their doubts were given to the winds and the ringleader who carried in his pocket a quantity of questionable eggs designed for use as the occasion might require let off the cheers making the depot ring with the loud huzzas interlarded here and there by a groan or hiss from those not yet won over to the popular party lifting his hat gracefully jemmy bowed in acknowledgment and his lips moved as if about to speak while cries of hear hear give us a speech let's have your politics ran through the excited throng standing close to jemmy who would fain have dispensed with his suggestive presence bill whispered in his ear let her slide corporal go in strong for uncle sam if you don't want this new coat of yourn spilt there ain't a rotten hen's nest in town but what was robbed this morning on your account and if they once get fairly to work it'll take more'n me and mr sullivan to stop em pitch in them to your sarmon jimmy's natural disposition prompted him to brave the purloined contents of rockland's hen's nests but he would not endanger his sister's carriage and besides that he felt that submission to people so infinitely beneath him was a part of his merited punishment so forcing down his pride he in a few well-chosen words told his breathless audience that though he had once proved faithless to his country none regretted it more than himself or was now a firmer friend to the stars and stripes the brief speech ending with the proposal of three cheers for the star-spangled banner in a trice the whole crowd responded with might and main prolonging their yells with the cries of carleton carleton forever and promises to make him police justice in the spring should he want to run for that very agreeable office couldn't a done much better myself said the delighted bill 
hovering about the window of the carriage in which jimmy had now taken his seat thoroughly tired of the scene jimmy intimated to jake his wish to go home and the iron grey sprang quickly forward but not until jimmy had caught bill's parting words call round and see a feller won't you i'll show you the old gal you know you asked me about her in the virginny woods it seemed like a new world to jimmy when after they had left the noisy crowd they turned into the pleasant quiet street which wound up the hill to where the handsome mather mansion stood every blind thrown back and wreaths of smoke curling gracefully from every chimney for rose wishing to do something in honour of her brother's return had ordered the whole house to be opened as if for a holiday while every flower which could possibly be spared from her conservatory had been broken from its stem and fashioned into bouquets by annie's tasteful hands wouldn't it be splendid rose said as she lay watching annie at her task wouldn't it be splendid to hang the stars and stripes in festoons across the hall where jimmy will pass under them annie did not think it would in her opinion jimmy was not deserving of such an honour and she said so as delicately as possible adding that were it tom it would be a very different thing rose knew that annie was right and so the stars and stripes were not brought out to welcome the young man now rapidly approaching annie was the first to catch the sound of the carriage wheels and when rose turned to ask if she really supposed jimmy was there she found herself alone she's gone to meet him of course she said but i most wish she had stayed here for i wanted to introduce her myself i hope she won't dislike him meantime in the parlour below mrs carleton sat waiting for her boy not as spartan mothers were wont to wait for their sons returning from the war but with a yearning tenderness for the loved prodigal blended with loyal indignation for his sin he was not coming to her as a hero who had done what he could for his country but with a traitor stain upon his fair name which she would gladly have wiped out she heard the carriage as it stopped and heard the step on the piazza not rapid and bounding as it used to be but slow and heavy as if uncertain which way to turn i must go out to meet him she said but all her strength forsook her and sinking upon the sofa she could only call out faintly jimmy my boy he heard her and almost before the words had left her lips her jimmy boy was kneeling at her feet with his face buried for an instant in her lap then with one burning kiss upon her forehead the proud james carleton who in his early boyhood was scarcely ever known to acknowledge that he was wrong asked to be forgiven and restored again to the confidence and love he had forfeited and with her hand upon his bowed head the mother forgave her boy bidding him look up that she might see again the face she had once thought so handsome it was tear-stained now and worn and mrs carleton sighed as she detected upon it unmistakable marks of reckless dissipation still it was jimmy's face and it grew each moment more natural as the flush of excitement deepened on the cheeks and lent an added brightness to the saucy laughing eyes the lines upon the forehead and about the mouth would wear away in time mrs carleton hoped and parting the soft black curls clustering around the broad white brow she told him why rose was not there to meet him and asked if he would go up then to see her rose heard them coming and at the sound of the familiar voice calling her name the tears flowed in torrents and with her face buried in her pillows she received her brother's first embrace very gently he lifted up her head and taking in his the little hot hands kissed again and again her childish face and wiping her tears away asked half seriously half playfully if they met in peace or war oh in peace in peace rose answered and winding her arms around his neck she hugged and cried over him asking why he had been so naughty when he knew how badly they would feel and why he had not interfered to save poor tom from a prisoner's fate he explained to her how that was impossible but for his treachery he had no excuse he could only answer that he was sorry and ask again to be forgiven i do not now believe the south all wrong he said many of them sincerely think they are fighting for their firesides others hardly know what they are fighting for while others again are impressed into the army and cannot help themselves as for me i would gladly blot out the past for which i have no apology but as that cannot be i would rather talk as little of it as possible try rose to forget that you ever had a rebel brother will you rose's kisses were a sufficient answer she was too happy just then to remember aught save that he had always been the dearest brother imaginable besides that annie taught that we must forgive as we would be forgiven 
Annie bore no ill will toward the South. She prayed for them as well as for the North, and cried most as hard over the sick, suffering soldiers captured by our army as over our own prisoners, and if she could forgive, Rose surely ought to do so too. You have not seen Annie yet, she said. She ran away the moment she knew you had come. I thought she might be going to meet you, but it seems she did not. You must love her a heap, and I know you will. She's so beautiful in her mourning and bears her trouble so sweetly. I wish everybody was as good as Annie Graham. She has never been heard to say one bitter thing against the South. She only pities and prays and says they are misguided. And pray, who is this paragon of excellence that I must love a heap? Jimmy asked when Rose had exhausted the list of Annie's virtues and paused for a little breath. Who was she? Hadn't he heard of Annie? Had Will failed to tell him of her adopted sister? Rose asked in some astonishment. Will had proved remiss in that one particular duty, and never until this moment had Jimmy heard that Rose had an adopted sister. And if Rose, why not himself? Wasn't he Rose's brother? Certainly you are, Rose replied. But I'm not sure Annie will let you call her sister because you're, you're, well, you see Annie is real good and, as I told you, prays just as hard for southern soldiers as for ours, that is, prays that they may be Christians, and that their sick and wounded may be kindly cared for, but of course she wants us to beat, and knows we shall, but I guess she does not think of you just as she does of Tom, though she never saw either. She would not go up to the depot to meet you, and I wanted her to so much. She said, too, it was not good taste, or something like that, to hang out our banner on a rebel's account, and she acts so funny generally about your coming home that I hope you'll do your best to be agreeable and make her like you. Will you, Jimmy? And Rose looked up at her brother in such a comical, serious way that he laughed aloud, promising to do his best to remove all prejudice from Miss Graham's mind and asking who she was and where she came from. I'm sure I don't know where she came from, Rose replied a little uncertain how to grapple with the Carlton pride which existed in Jimmy as well as the rest of them. She's a lady as any one can see, and possessed of much refinement as we often find in Boston. She can't help it, Jimmy, if she is poor. It don't hurt her one bit, and I'm getting over those foolish notions cherished by our set at home. Will says she came of a good family and might have married a millionaire, old enough to be her father, but she wouldn't. She preferred a mechanic, George Graham, the most splendid-looking man you ever saw. He's dead now, poor fellow. Will took care of him and brought him home. That's why Annie lives with me. Rose's explanations were not the plainest that could have been given, but Jimmy extracted from the medley of facts a very prominent one. It was not a miss, but a missus to whom he was to be agreeable. It had not seemed a very unpleasant duty to change a beautiful young girl's opinion of himself, but a missus was a very different affair, and for the first time since his arrival his old merry half-sarcastic laugh ran through the room, as with a mocking whistle he said, A widow, eh? How many children does she boast? Not a single bit of a one, Rose answered, feeling that Jimmy had said something very bad of Annie. He saw it in her countenance and hastened to make amends by asking numberless questions about Annie, whose history from the time of Rose's first acquaintance with her up to the present hour he managed at last to get, the result being that he was not as much interested in the widow Graham, as he mischievously called her, as he might have been in Miss Annie. The easily disheartened Rose gave him up as incorrigible, and, mentally hoping Tom would not prove as refractory as Jimmy had done, she turned the conversation upon Will, whose goodness she extolled until the supper bell rang and Jimmy arose to leave her for a time, as she was not prepared to go down that night and do the honors of the table. The gas was lighted in the dining room and the heavy damask curtains were dropped before the long French windows. A cheerful coal-fire was blazing on the marble hearth, while the table, with its snowy linen, its china, silver, and cut glass, presented a most inviting appearance, making Jimmy feel more at home than he had through all the long years of his voluntary exile from the parental roof. "'This is nice,' he said, with a pleasant feeling of satisfaction, not unmingled with a certain degree of self-reproach, which whispered that after what had passed he was hardly worthy to be the recipient of so much luxury." Thoughts like these were about shaping themselves into words when he caught sight of a figure he had not before observed, and became aware that he was not alone with his mother as he had first supposed. It was a delicate little figure, 
not as petite as his sister's but quite as graceful with its sloping shoulders and rounded waist almost too small to suit the theorems of a water-cure but looking vastly well to jimmy whose first thought was that he could span it with his hands around the well-shaped head the heavy bands of pale brown hair were coiled forming a large square knot which falling low upon the neck gave to the figure a more girlish appearance than jimmy had expected to find in his sister's protege the widow graham he knew it was annie by the morning robe fitting so closely around the slender throat and for an instant he wished she were not there as he preferred being alone with his mother but one glance at the sweet face turned toward him as mrs carleton repeated his name dispelled all such desires and with a strange sensation which he attributed to pleasant disappointment he took the soft white hand which annie extended toward him it was a very small a very pretty hand and trembled perceptibly as it lay in jimmy's broader warmer one while on the pale cheek there was a deep rich bloom which mrs carleton herself had never observed before i have heard of mrs graham from my sister jimmy said bowing to her with his usual gallantry while annie tried to stammer out some reply making a miserable failure and leaving on jimmy's mind the impression that she was prejudiced against him and so would not welcome him home a dozen times in the course of the supper jimmy assured himself that he did not care what was the opinion held of him by such as an annie graham while he as often changed his mind and knew that he did care wondering what it was about her face which puzzled him so much she looked a little like tom's wife mary he thought that is as mary had looked just before her departure for charleston when she bade him good-bye whispering to him timidly of a world where she hoped to meet again the friends she loved so well and as whenever he thought of mary he felt that her angel presence was around him still he now felt that another angel spirit looked out at him from the soft eyes of blue raised to his so seldom and when raised withdrawn so quickly what did she think of him he would have given something to have known but he was far from suspecting the truth or guessing what annie felt as she saw upon his face the lines of dissipation and thought of the debasing scenes through which he must have passed since the days of old lang syne when with the little pequot of new london he sat upon the rocks and watched the tide come in telling her how on the morrow night his own fanciful little boat named for her should bear them across the placid waters of the bay to where the green hill lay sleeping in the summer moonlight the pequot's reply had been that the morrow was the sabbath and not even the pleasure of a sail with him could tempt her to steal god's time and appropriate it to such a purpose he had called her a little puritan then asking where she learned so strict a creed and adding but i believe you're right and if i'd known you sooner i should have been a better boy then kissing her blushing cheek he had led her from the rocks over which the waves were breaking now and that was the last the pequot ever saw of him there was no sail upon the bay no more watching for the ebb and flow of the evening tide no walks on the long piazza or strolls upon the beach nothing but news one night that the handsome saucy-eyed boy was gone to his home in boston leaving no message or word of explanation for her the little pequot whose step was slower for a few days and whose headache was not feigned as the harsh aunt said it was when she refused to join the revellers in the parlour and dance with the grey-haired man four times her age who sought her for his partner they had not met since then till now and annie struggled hard to keep back the tears as she remembered all that had come to her since that summer at new london remembered the childish fancy which died out so fast and the later love which crowned her early girlhood finding its full fruition at the marriage altar and twining itself so closely around the fibres of her heart that when it was torn away it left them sore and bleeding with pain at every pore surely with this sad experience annie young and beautiful though she was could feel for jimmy carleton not save the deference she would have felt for any stranger who came to her as the brother of her patroness and still she was conscious of a deeper interest in him than if he had been a perfect stranger and his presence awoke within her an uncomfortable feeling making her wish more and more that she was away where she would not be obliged to come in daily contact with him under these circumstances it is not strange the conversation flagged until for rose's sake annie felt compelled to make an effort suddenly remembering isaac sims she asked if anything was ever heard at washington of the richmond prisoners yes jimmy replied and eager to show his own willingness to talk of the war and the federal army he told how only the day before he left for rockland news had come from tom saying he was well as could be expected considering his fare 
but the boy captured with him would surely die if not soon restored to purer air and better care than those tobacco prisons afforded oh it will kill mrs sims that they should bring him back to her dead and the hot tears gushed from annie's eyes as she heard in fancy the muffled drum beating its funeral marches to the grave of another rockland volunteer the tears once started could not be repressed and mrs carleton and jimmy finished their supper alone for annie excused herself and hastening to her room poured out her grief in tears and prayers for the poor sick boy pining in his dreary prison home while mingled with her tears was a note of thanksgiving that to her had been given the comfort of knowing that the death pillow of her darling was smoothed with friendly hands and that no harsh discordant sounds of prison riot or discipline had disturbed his peaceful dying meantime jimmy had returned to his sister whose first question was for annie what did he think of her wasn't she sweet and hadn't she the prettiest blue eyes he ever saw i hardly saw them for she is evidently coy of her glances at a rebel jimmy answered half playfully half bitterly for annie's manner of quiet reserve had piqued him more than he cared to confess she's bashful rose replied and then jimmy you can't expect her to forgive you as readily as your own sister for you know she never saw you till to-night and she's a true patriot but say did you ever see so sweet a face one that made you think so much of an angel rather too pale to suit my taste i like high colour better and jimmy pinched rose's glowing cheek until she screamed for him to stop it's all going wrong i know rose began poutingly you don't like annie a bit and she's so good too you can't begin to guess how good and there's nothing blue about her either why she's a heap more cheerful than i could be if will were dead as george is i'd die too i know i should but annie's a real christian and that does make a difference it seems to be all through her and she lives it every minute i honestly believe i'm better than before she came she has actually persuaded me not to get up big dinners on sunday as i used to do but to let all the servants go to church and every night she goes for half an hour into the kitchen and teaches old black phyllis how to read the bible she's so truthful too why she said she presumed that little pequot girl would not have liked you anyway after she heard that dick lee was not your name the pequot girl how came mrs graham to hear of her jimmy asked his face flushing crimson oh i happened to ask mother something about her one day right before annie and so of course explained a little it would not have been polite if i hadn't rose replied adding as she saw her brother's evident chagrin you need not mind one bit for annie never tells anything it was not the fearing she would tell which affected jimmy unpleasantly it was the feeling that he would rather annie graham should not know of all his delinquencies and so despise him accordingly how unfortunate it was that she was there and yet he would not have sent her away if he could though he did wish she were not so well posted with regard to his affairs both past and present what made rose tell her of the pequot and why had the pequot haunted him ever since he came into that house something had brought her to his mind and as the servant just then came in bringing her mistress's supper he left his seat by rose and walking to the window looked out upon the starry sky wondering within himself where she was now the little girl who had sat with him upon the rocks and told him it was wicked to break god's fourth command the scene which annie saw at the supper-table was present with him now remembered for the first time since the battle at bull run then as he lay waiting for the foe he had in fancy heard again a sweet girlish voice bidding him keep holy the sabbath day and the tear which dropped upon his gun was prompted by the thought of all he had passed through since the happy schoolboy days when the pequot preached to him her gentle sermons in the hall there was a rapid footstep and rose called out annie annie come here why where are you going to-night she continued in much surprise as annie looked in hooded and shawled as for some expedition going to mrs sims it is not far you know was annie's answer and the door closed after her in time to prevent her hearing rose's reply it's dark as pitch and slippery too jimmy do please see her to the gate but don't go in for the widow is awful against rebels the next moment jimmy was half way down the stairs calling to annie who held the doorknob in her hand mrs graham allow me to be your escort rose is not willing you should go out alone thank you i am not at all afraid and prefer going alone as mrs sims might not care to meet a stranger 
annie replied with an air of so much quiet dignity that jimmy knew there was no alternative for him save to return to his sister's chamber which he did feeling far more crestfallen than he had supposed it possible for him to feel just because a widow had refused his escort it was wholly owing to the taint of rebeldom clinging to him he knew for he was not accustomed to having his attentions thus slighted by the ladies to whom they were offered and all unconsciously the manner of reserve which annie assumed toward him was punishing him for his sin quite as much as anything which had yet occurred making him feel keenly that by his traitorous act he had for a time at least built a gulf between himself and those whose good opinion was worth the having why haven't you gone rose asked as he came into the room she wouldn't let you i don't believe you asked her just as you should dear dear it's all going wrong between you two and if tom don't act any better when he comes home what shall i do send mrs graham away trembled on jimmy's lips but knowing from what he had seen that so far as rose was concerned annie's tenure at the mather mansion was stronger than his own he wisely kept silent and sitting down by the open grate he went off into a fit of abstraction mingled with sad regrets for the past and occasional thoughts of the little white-faced annie now essaying to comfort the widow sims who had extorted from her the intelligence brought by jimmy of her boy and who with her hard hands covering her face was weeping bitterly and sobbing amid her tears my poor poor boy it's the same to me now as if he was dead i'll never see him any more oh isaac my darling End of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this librivox recording is in the public domain eighteen the richmond captives how close and dirty and terrible it was on that third floor of the dingy tobacco house where isaac as a private was first confined and as the summer days glided by and the august sun came pouring into the great disorderly room how the young boy panted and pined for a breath of sweet pure air such as swept over the far-off eastern hills and how full of wistful yearning were the glances he cast toward the grated windows seeking to catch glimpses of the busy world without in which he could not mingle not very near those windows did he dare approach for more than one had already paid the penalty of such transgression and in his dreams isaac saw yet the white death agony which stole over the face of the fire zouave shot by the inhuman guard while looking from the window no wonder that the homesick boy grew sadder wearier each day amid such horrors as these praying sometimes that he might die even though he must be buried far from the quiet rockland churchyard where the cypress and the willow were growing so green and fair and where a mother could sometimes come and weep over her soldier boy's grave it would matter little where he slept he thought or what indignities were heaped upon his lifeless form for his soul could not be touched that would be safe with him whom isaac in his captivity had found to be indeed the friend which sticketh closer than a brother the saviour honoured since early childhood did not desert the captive and this it was which made him strong to bear through the long summer days during which there came to him no tidings of his home and his eye was greeted with no sight of a familiar face for captain carleton was yet an inmate at the hospital neither did any friendly message come to tell he was remembered by the man whose fortunes he had voluntarily shared when he might perhaps have escaped for though tom thought often of the generous lad and sent to him many a word of comfort through mistake or negligence only one brief message had ever reached its destination and so forsaken by every human aid poor isaac looked to heaven for help finding there a peace which kept his heart from breaking but as the summer days glided into september and the heat grew more and more intense until at last september too was gone and the virginia woods were blazing in the light of the october sun and still there was no token of relief oh who save those who have felt it can tell of the loneliness the dreary despair which crept into the captive soul driving out all hope and making life as it existed in those walls a burden which would be gladly shaken off how isaac paled and drooped as the weary hours stole on how he loathed the sickening food and how at night he shuddered with horror and shrank away from the vermin-covered floor his only pillow unless he substituted the coat now scarcely less filthy than its surroundings 
as tom wrote to the new hampshire woman mrs sims would scarcely have recognized her son in the haggard emaciated boy who on one october afternoon sat crouching in his corner grasping the little testament given by the rockland ladies and repeating its precious truth to the poor sick worn-out youth whose head lay on his lap and whose eyes blistered with homesick tears were fastened with a kind of hungry wistfulness upon the girlish face above him the face of isaac sims pointing the dying soldier to the only source of life it was thus tom carleton found him tom just released from the hospital and transferred to the first floor of that dark prison with tom it had fared better for yankee-like in his precautions he had gone into the battle with a quantity of gold fastened securely around his person and gold has a mighty power to unlock the hardest heart as a commissioned officer and a man of wealth and rank many privileges were accorded to him which were denied the common soldiers and his first act after entering the tobacco-house was to seek out his late companion and ask after his welfare he did not know him at first though directed to that locality as the one where the preacher would probably be found he could not think he had ever seen either of these famished miserable-looking creatures but touched by the impressive scene he stood a moment listening while isaac read i am the way the truth and the life no man cometh to the father but by me yes but how shall i go to him where is he the sick boy asked and bending lower isaac answered he's here he's standing close by you he hears all i say he knows you want him and he will not cast you off for he has said he wouldn't only believe and take him at his word that's all there was an evident lifting up of both souls to god and tom felt that even in that horrid place there were angels dwelling he knew now that one was isaac and the great tears rolled down his cheeks as he saw the fearful change wrought in little more than two short months isaac he said softly isaac my boy don't you know me not till then had isaac observed the tall figure standing near but at the sound of the well-remembered voice he looked quickly up and putting gently from him the head of his comrade sprang to his feet with a scream of joy and threw himself into the open arms of tom who held and soothed him while he sobbed out his delight oh captain carleton he cried with his body quivering with emotion i am so glad i thought you had i didn't know oh why haven't you come before i'm so sick so sick and tired that i almost want to die will we ever be exchanged have they forgotten us at washington shall we never go home again these were questions which more than one poor captive had asked and which none could answer tom however did the best he could and hushing isaac as he would have hushed and quieted a grieving child he spoke to him many a word of comfort promising to care for him as a younger brother and speaking of various ways in which his forlorn condition should be bettered now that he was an inmate of the same prison it was a blissful interview and its good effects were seen in the brightness of isaac's face and the cheerful smile which played around his mouth even after tom had gone to his quarters below softer than downy pillows seemed the hard bare floor that night as with his arm thrown round his invalid friend isaac lay dreaming of the frost-tipped trees at home and the brown nuts ripening on the hill where he perhaps might pick them yet for tom had given some encouragement that an exchange would ere long be effected and as each believed his own name would be upon the list so isaac hoped his would and in slumber's fitful fancy he was at home again and saw his mother come softly in to tuck the bedclothes around him or see if he were sleeping just as she used to do how still he lay to make her think he was asleep how real seemed the vision how lifelike the kiss pressed upon his lips and the teardrop that came with it in a corner of the room there were groans and imprecations and with a nervous start the dreamer woke to find it all a horrid delusion that stifling fetid atmosphere had in it no odour of rockland's healthful breezes and the star shining on him through the iron bars though familiar to him was not the same which he used to watch from the window beneath the caves facing to the north no home no mother no soft feathery pillow for his head or blanket for his body nothing but the feverish hand still upon his forehead and that tear on his cheek for these were real and the sick soldier at his side who gave the kiss and tear was whispering in his ear that the way so tearfully sought was found at last that the gloomy desolate prison was like the gates of paradise and death disarmed of all its terror 
if mother could only know it he said i should be so glad and you'll tell her won't you when you get home again tell her it wasn't very hard to die even in this dingy hole that heaven and jesus are as near to me here on the floor as if i were lying on my own bed at home with her standing by tell her i'm glad i fought for the stars and stripes but sorry i ran away without her consent for i did i got out on the woodshed roof and so came off unseen she's prayed for me every day and every night and god has heard her prayers he sent you here to lead me in the way and after i am gone he'll let you go back again there were a few more whispered words on either side and then the exhausted but happy youth fell away to sleep while isaac wept with thankfulness that his confinement there had not been all in vain faithful to his promise tom as far as was possible alleviated the hardship so long and so meekly borne by isaac and with his gold bought many a delicacy for isaac's end the poor sick massachusetts boy who one night ere the physician had fairly decided that he was in need of medical care laid his head on isaac's lap as he was wont to do and with another whispered message for the mother far away and another assurance of perfect peace went where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest while he lived there had been something to take isaac's mind something to excite his sympathy and in ministering to henry's wants he had more than half forgotten his own but now that he was gone and the corner where he had sat or lain was empty isaac too faded rapidly and not all tom's efforts had power to save him from the apathy which came stealing over him so fast touched with pity at his forlorn dejected appearance his comrades made him a little bed in the corner where the dead boy had been and there all the day long he lay rarely noticing any one except tom carleton who came often to his side and whose own warm blanket formed the pillow for his head from the first floor to the third there was not one who was not more or less interested in the pale invalid bearing his pain so patiently never complaining never repining but thanking those about him for any kindness rendered with such childlike touching sweetness that even the rough jailer regarded him with favour and paused sometimes to speak to him a word of encouragement in this state of feeling it was not a difficult matter for tom to obtain permission for isaac to be removed from the dirty corner above to his own comparatively comfortable cot in the officer's apartments below but this did not effect a cure nothing could do that save a sight of home and mother could i see her isaac said one day or even stand again beneath the federal flag i might get better but here i shall surely die and if i do oh captain carleton you'll get them to send me home won't you i don't care for myself where i am buried but my mother it would break her heart to hear i was put with the negroes she's a rough woman and folks who don't know her much think she's cross and queer but she's been so good to me and i love her so much oh mother mother i wish she was here now and the sick boy turned his white face to the wall sobbing out choking sobs which seemed to come from the lowest depths of his heart cries for home and mother were not uncommon in that prison house but there was something so piteous in his childlike wail that other officers than tom bent over the poor lad trying to comfort him by telling of an exchange which it was hoped would ere long be effected and by painting happy pictures of the glad rejoicing which would greet the returning captives for an instant the great tears dropping so fast from isaac's lids were stayed in their course and a smile of hope shone on his pallid face but quickly passed away as he suggested yes but who knows if i will be on the list no one could tell him that all would not go they knew and they could only wait patiently each hoping he would be the favoured one at last there came a day never to be forgotten by the inmates of that tobacco house a day on which was read the names of those who were to be released and breathe again the air of freedom oh how anxiously the sick boy listened as one after another was called captain thomas carleton was among the number and a deep flush stole to the young man's face as uncertainty was thus made sure he was going home and like waves upon the beach the throbs of joy beat around his heart making him glad as a little child when returning to its mother after a long separation but oh who shall tell isaac's emotions as name after name was called and none that sounded like his would they never reach it never say isaac sims could it be he was not there 
larger and thicker grew the drops of sweat quivering about his mouth and standing upon his forehead whiter more death-like grew his face heavier sadder more mournful the eyes fixed so wistfully upon the collar of that roll growing less so fast there could not be many more and the head drooped upon the heaving bosom with a discouraged disheartened feeling just as the last was read not his not isaac sims he was not there and with a moan which smote painfully on tom's ear the disappointed boy turned away and wept bitterly while his pale lips moved feebly with the prayer for help he essayed to make to be left there alone with no kind captain carleton to soothe the weary hours to be returned most likely to the noisy floor above to die some night when nobody knew or cared it was terrible and widow sims would have shrieked in anguish could she have seen the look of despair settling down on her darling's face but though she did not see it there was one who did and guessing at the thoughts which prompted it he walked away to be alone and gather strength for the sacrifice he must make tom carleton could not desert the boy who had clung so faithfully to him and as isaac had once stayed by him in the virginia woods when he might have gone away so he now would stay with isaac still it was hard to give up going home and for a moment he felt as if he could not there was a fierce struggle between duty and inclination a mighty combat between tom's selfishness and his better nature and then the latter conquered he must stay it would not be difficult to find some person to take his place clandestinely for already were the unfortunate ones seeking to buy such chances and offering every possible inducement to any who would accept a young lieutenant about his age and appearance and whose wife and child were suffering from his absence was the one selected by tom as his substitute and the matter soon arranged then with a forced cheerfulness he did not feel tom went back to isaac who was still weeping silently on his couch and whispering to an unseen presence you'll never leave me will you and when i die you'll take me up to heaven here was a faith a trust to which tom carleton was a stranger and wishing himself more like that sick boy he bent over the cot and said cheerily isaac are you asleep in the tone of his voice there was something so kind and sympathetic that isaac started up and winding his feeble arms around tom's neck sobbed out forgive me captain carleton i'm glad you are going home but i wasn't at first the bad hard lumps kept rising in my throat as i thought of staying here alone without you but they're gone now i prayed them all away and i am glad you are going i shall miss you dreadfully but god will not forsake me and captain carleton if you ever do see my my isaac's voice was choked with tears and he could not at first articulate that dear word but soon recovering he went on see my mother you'll tell her about me tell her everything except how i've suffered that would do no good twould only make her cry and when she hears as she may be willed that i am dead tell her i wasn't afraid for the saviour was with me i'd rather you shouldn't say good-bye at the last it would make me feel so bad only some time before you go i want to tell you how much i love you for your goodness and to ask you to be a he did not finish the sentence for tom knew what he would say and wiping both sweat and tears from off the worn face looking so lovingly at him he answered i will try to be a better man i never felt the need of it so much till i came here and isaac i am going to stay till you two are exchanged did you think i would desert the boy who but for me would not have been a prisoner isaac did not reply only the soft blue eyes lighted up with sudden eager joy the lips trembled as if they would speak there was a perceptible shudder and then tom held in his arms a fainting unconscious form the revulsion of feeling was too great and for many minutes isaac gave no sign of life but when at last he was restored again he tried to dissuade tom from making so great a sacrifice but all in vain tom silenced every objection and when the third of january came and prisoners were released another than tom carleton answered to his name and marched from richmond in his stead tom had once spent several months in richmond and in the higher circles he numbered many personal friends who until quite recently were ignorant of the fact that he was a prisoner in their midst of these the more loyal to the new confederacy ignored him entirely 
others remembering his genial humour and quiet gentlemanly manner which had won their admiration for the elegant bostonian and his gentle wife threw their prejudice aside and respecting him because he had stood firmly by his own state visited him in his prison while others sent playful messages that though they denounced him as an intruder upon their rights they owned him as a friend and would gladly ameliorate his condition to these acquaintance it was soon known how great a sacrifice tom had made for the sake of a young boy and the result was a gradual abatement of the surveillance held over tom while many privileges hitherto denied by the strict jail discipline were accorded to him isaac too was benefited through him and more than one fair lady visited the invalid growing strangely interested in the gentle yankee boy and bringing many a delicacy with which to tempt his capricious appetite but no amount of kindness could win him back to health so long as he breathed the atmosphere of prison walls to go home was all he desired and day after day the flesh shrivelled from his bones and the blue veins stood out round and full upon his wasted hands until there came a night when the physician told the jailer whom he met upon the stairs that the yankee boy was dying there were not many now in prison and ere long the sad news was known throughout the building causing the riotous ones to hush their noisy revels and tread softly across the uncovered floor lest they should disturb the sufferer below the jailer too remembering his own son afar in southern tennessee wiped a tear from his rough face and drew nearer to the humble cot where tom sat watching the panting and seemingly dying boy there were moments of feverish delirium when the prison with its surrounding horrors faded away and isaac was at home bathing his burning brow with the snow covering the northern hills or talking to his mother of all that had transpired since the april morning when followed by her prayers and tears he left her for the battle then reason came back again as clear as ever and with tom carleton's hand pressed between his own he dictated what tom should say to the mother when he went back to her alone and left her boy behind i shall never go home any more he said and i've built such bright castles about it too fancying how nice it would seem to lie on mother's soft warm bed and watch the sun shining through the windows or the grass springing by the door the snow will melt from the garden before long and the flowers i used to tend come up again but i shan't be there to see them i shall be lying here so quiet and so still that i shall not even hear the cannon's roar or the loud huzzas when peace is at last declared and the cruel war is ended oh if all the dead ones could know it would be something worth fighting for but when the troops are marching home and the bells ring out a welcome there'll be many a one missing in the ranks and almost every graveyard both north and south will hold a soldier's grave but you will not forget us will you and the sunken eyes turned pleadingly on tom when the bonfires are kindled at the north and the glad rejoicings are made you will think of the poor boys who fought and died that you might enjoy just such a holiday tom could only answer by pressing the thin hands he held and isaac continued tell mother not to fret too much for me i guess she did love me best because i was the youngest but eli and john will comfort her old age tell them too how much i love them and how proud i was of them that day at bull run they used to plague me sometimes and call me a girl baby but i've forgiven that for i know they did not mean it i hope they'll both be spared it would kill mother to lose us all tell her how i bless her for the lessons of my childhood the prayers said at her knee before i knew their meaning the sunday school she sent me to and the bible stories told in the winter twilight tell her i was not afraid to die only i wanted her so much but everybody's been good there are kind folks here in richmond and god will bless them for it oh captain carleton i'm a poor ignorant boy and you a proud rich man but you will heed me won't you and when i'm gone you'll take my little testament and read it every day read it first for isaac's sake but it won't be long before you'll read it for its precious truths and you will come to heaven where we can meet again promise won't you there was a moment's silence during which tom choked down the tears he could scarcely suppress so strongly this scene reminded him of another when he sat by mary's side and heard her dying voice urging him to meet her four years the southern sun had shone upon her grave and he had made no preparation yet but now he would put it off no longer and bending over isaac he replied i promise 
and if you see my darling in the better land tell her god helping me i'll find my way to where she has gone the white lips feebly murmured their thanks and then suddenly asked do you think mother's got the letter you sent and knows how sick i am if so she's praying for me now and maybe her prayers will save i'm not afraid to die but if i could go home to rockland first it would not seem so bad pray mother pray 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 hard and too much exhausted to talk longer the half delirious boy turned upon the pillow furnished by some kind lady and fell into a heavy sleep from which the physician said he would never waken midnight in richmond and tom counting off the strokes bent lower to watch for the expected change there was no colour in the parted lips and about the nose there was a pinched contracted look which tom remembered to have seen in mary's face when by her bedside he had sat just as he sat by isaac's but where mary's hands were cold and dry isaac's were moist and warm while the rapid pulses were not as wiry and irregular as hers had been there was hope and falling on his knees tom carleton asked that the life almost gone out might be restored and promised that if it were he would not forget this lesson as he had forgotten the one learned by mary's deathbed he would be a better man he said and god as he sometimes does took him at his word gradually the sharp expression passed away the hair grew damp with a more healthful moisture the pulses were slower the breathing more regular and when at last the heavy slumber was broken and isaac looked up again tom knew that he would live there was a murmured prayer of thanksgiving a renewal of his pledge and then he bent every energy to sustain the life coming so slowly back softly the morning broke over the prison walls and they who had expected to look on isaac dead rejoiced to hear that he was better it may be i shall see mother yet he whispered faintly when tom told him that the dreaded crisis was past and if i do i'll tell her of your kindness would you like very much to go home to your mother tom asked and with a quivering lip and chin isaac answered yes oh yes if i only could i was willing to die but i guess we all cling to life at the last don't you tom did not reply to this but spoke instead of a rumour that all were soon to be discharged and sent back to washington we'll go together then he said you and i for i shall visit rockland first and see my sister rose the prospect of release was meat and drink for isaac who rallied so fast that when the joyful news of an exchange did come he was able with tom's help to walk across the floor of what had been his home so long haggard wasted weary and worn were those prisoners as they filed down the stairs and out into the streets but with each moment which brought them nearer home their spirits rose and when at last they stood again on federal soil and saw the stars and stripes waving in the morning breeze long and deafening were the huzzas which rent the air as one after another gave vent to his great joy at finding himself free once more isaac however could neither shout nor laugh nor speak and only the large eyes brimming with tears told of joy unutterable but when arrived at washington his two stalwart brothers took him in their arms hugging and crying over him as over one come back to them from the grave his calmness all gave way and laying his tired head on eli's bosom while john held and caressed his wasted hands he sobbed out the happiness too great to be expressed in words to him a full discharge from service was readily accorded while to tom a furlough of several weeks was given and after a few days at washington both started northward to join the friends waiting so impatiently for their arrival End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of rose mather a tale by mary jane holmes this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 19. Tom's Reception The people of Rockland had become somewhat accustomed to the rebel lion as they had playfully called Jimmy Carlton, and the latter could now go quietly through the streets without attracting attentions which at first had been vastly disagreeable to the sensitive young man gradually as he mingled more with the people they had learned to like him and were fast forgetting that he had ever joined the ranks of the foe and struck at his mother country 
with the rabble who had met him at the depot on his first arrival at rockland he was vastly popular for forcing down his pride he had been very conciliatory toward them and they still adhered to their olden promise of making him their next police justice provided he would consent to run with his usual impudence bill baker continued to annoy the proud bostonian with his good-humoured familiarities some of which jimmy permitted while others he quietly repulsed for bill's constant allusions to the past were exceedingly disagreeable and as far as possible he avoided his quondam associate who without the least suspicion that his manner was disgusting in the extreme would hail him across the street addressing him always as corporal and if strangers were in hearing inviting him to call round and see a feller once in a while for old acquaintance sake at the mather mansion matters remained about the same as when jimmy first came home mrs carleton was still there waiting for her son and rose as usual was ever on the alert seeking ways and means by which the soldiers might be benefited compelling jimmy to be interested in all her plans dragging him from place to place sending him on errands and once when in a great hurry to get a box in readiness for the hospitals at washington actually coaxing him into helping tie a comfortable which was put up in her back parlour and which she must send immediately for some poor fellow was sure to need it jimmy could learn to tie as well as herself she said when he pleaded his ignorance as an excuse for refusing his services she didn't know how once but widow sims and annie had taught her a heap and annie would teach him too all he had to do was to put the big darning needle through twice tie a weaver's knot cut it off and the thing was done besides that twas a real pretty quilt made from annie's calico dress which she used to wear last summer and looked so sweetly in annie was tying on one side and jimmy must tie on the other he needn't be so lazy he ought to do something for the war by the time rose had reached the last points in her argument jimmy had closed the book he was reading and concluded that there might be duties required of him a great deal worse than tying a soldier's comfortable with annie to oversee it was strange how much teaching he needed and how often annie was called to the rescue the needle would stick so in the cotton and he could not remember just how to tie that knot so annie never dreaming that he knew how to tie the knot as well as she would come to his aid her hands sometimes touching his and his black curls occasionally brushing her pale brown braids as he bent over her to see how she did it so as to know himself next time there was a world of mischief in jimmy's saucy eyes as he demurely apologized to mrs graham for the trouble he was giving her but annie never once looked up neither did the colour deepen in the least upon her cheek and when jimmy on purpose to draw her out suggested that he was more bother than help she answered that he had better return to his reading as she could get on quite well alone after this jimmy thought proper to learn a little faster and soon outstripped his teacher who rewarded him with no word of approval save a cool thank you when the comfortable was done and taken from the awkward frames and this was a fair specimen of the nature of the intercourse existing between jimmy and annie secure now in the belief that she would never be recognized as the pequot of new london annie regarded jimmy as an ordinary stranger in whom she had no particular interest save that which her kind heart prompted her to feel for all mankind she could not dislike him and she always defended him from the aspersions of the widow who could not quite conquer her repugnance to a rebel and who frequently gave vent to her ill-will toward jimmy whom she thought so proud stuck up critter she said struttin round as if he was good as anybody and feelin above his betters of course he felt above her and susan and annie she knew he did and if she's annie she bummed if she'd stay there and be looked at as jim looked at her although making due allowance for the widow's prejudice these remarks were not without their effect upon annie who imperceptibly to herself began to feel that probably jimmy did regard her as merely a poor dependent on his sister's bounty and she unconsciously assumed toward him a cool reserved manner which led him to fancy that she entertained for him a deep-rooted prejudice on account of his past error twenty times a day he said to himself he did not care what she thought of him and as many times a day he knew he did care much more than was at all conducive to his peace of mind where this caring might end he never stopped to consider he only felt now that he respected the quaker like annie more than he ever respected a woman before and coveted her good opinion more earnestly than he ever remembered to have coveted anything in his life unless indeed it were his freedom when a prisoner in bill baker's power in this state of affairs it required all rose's tact to sustain anything like sociability between her brother and annie and the little lady was perfectly delighted when the joyful tidings was received that tom was coming home annie would like tom for everybody did 
besides tom had written as if he were almost a good man himself and annie was sure to be pleased with that they at least would be fast friends and secure on this point rose with her usual impulsiveness plunged into the preparations for tom's reception even annie did not think any reasonable honour too great for him particularly after isaac wrote from washington to his mother telling her of tom's generous sacrifice and how he might have been home long before if he had not chosen to stay and care for a poor sick boy how the widow's heart warmed toward the carltons taking the whole family into its hitherto rather limited dimensions even jimmy was not excluded the widow admitting to mrs baker between whom and herself there had been many a hot discussion touching the so-called rebel that when he laughed he was uncommon handsome for a secessioner and she presumed that at the bottom he was as good as they would average but if the widow were thus affected by tom's kind act how much more were the mother and sister pleased to know how noble and good he was while annie amid the tears she could not repress said to rose you should be so proud of such a brother there are few like him i am sure how jimmy envied tom as he heard on all sides praises for his noble unselfishness and the resolution to welcome him and isaac with military honours once more in his element bill baker industriously drilled his clique who were to answer no earthly purpose save to swell the throng and prolong the deafening cheers bill began to feel related to the carltons and regularly each day he called at the mather mansion to keep rose posted with regard to the progress of affairs they were to bring out the new gun he said and as it was minus a name the villagers had concluded to call it the thomas carleton asking how she thought the square would like it and how many times it ought to be fired the band would serenade tom in the evening he said and we shall have bonfires kindled in the streets talking as if instead of being merely a cannon tender he were head manager of the whole and that all the responsibility was resting on himself rose understood him perfectly and with the utmost good nature listened to his suggestions and scolded jimmy for calling him her prime minister and confidant from the cupola of the mather mansion the stars and stripes were to be hung out and on the morning of tom's expected arrival jimmy and annie climbed the winding stairs and fastened the staff securely to its place there were tears in annie's eyes as the graceful folds shook themselves to the breeze for she remembered the coming of another soldier when this same banner was wrapped around a coffin across the valley and beyond the confines of the village she could see where that coffin with its loved inmate was buried and as the past came rushing over her she suddenly gave way and sitting down beneath the flag wept bitterly while jimmy with a vague idea as to what might have caused her tears stood looking at her wishing he could comfort her but what should he say as yet they had scarcely passed the bounds of the most scrupulous politeness to each other and for him to attempt to comfort her seemed preposterous while to leave her without a word seemed equally unkind perhaps it was the beautiful glossy braids of hair which brought him at last to a decision causing him to lay his hand involuntarily upon the bowed head while he said i am sorry for you mrs graham for i know how much the contrast between my brother's return and that of your husband must affect you and gladly would i spare you the pain if i could i am not certain but the good people of rockland in their intended kindness to tom are doing you an injury and surely lieutenant graham having been a resident of this place should receive their first thought with all pertaining to him there was no mistaking the genuine sympathy which thrilled in every tone of jimmy's voice and for a moment annie wept more passionately than before it was the first time he had ever spoken to her of her husband and his words touched a responsive chord at once it is not that so much she answered at last i am glad they are honouring your brother thus he richly deserves it for his noble adherence to his country in her hour of peril and for his generous treatment of poor isaac sims i would do much myself to show him my respect but oh george george i am so desolate without him and covering her face with her hands annie wept again more piteously than before here was a point which jimmy could not touch and an awkward silence ensued broken at last by annie who resuming her usual calm demeanour frankly offered jimmy her hand saying i thank you mr carleton for your sympathy it has made me believe you are my friend and as such i would rather consider you your friend did you ever deem me other than that jimmy replied in some surprise involuntarily pressing the little hand which only for an instant rested in his and then was quietly withdrawn just as rose from the foot of the stairs called out to know what they were doing up there so long 
it was strange how differently jimmy felt after this incident and how fast his spirits rose the few words said to him by annie up in his sister's cupola had made him very happy for he felt that a better understanding existed between himself and annie that she did not so thoroughly despise him as he had at first supposed and that the winning her respect was not a hopeless task as early as two the crowd began to gather in the streets and half an hour later rose's carriage with jimmy in it was on its way to the depot mrs carleton did not care to go and so rose too remained at home and mounting to the cupola watched for the first wreath of smoke which should herald the approach of the train i see it he's coming she screamed as a feathery mist was discernible over the distant plains and in a few moments more the car swept round the curve while a booming gun told that bill baker was faithful to his duty there was a swaying to and fro of the throng at the depot a pushing each other aside a trilling of fife a beating of drums and then a deafening shout went up as tom carleton and john sims appeared upon the platform carefully supporting the tottering steps of the weak excited boy who stood between them at sight of isaac there was a momentary hush and then with a shriek such as a tigress might give when it saw its young in danger the widow sims rushed frantically forward and catching the light form of her child in her arms tried to bear him through the crowd but her strength was insufficient and she would have fallen had not jimmy relieved her of her burden which he sustained with one hand while the other was extended to welcome the stranger who came near half bewildered tom looked around upon the multitude asking in a whisper what it meant he could not think that they had come to welcome him and when assured by jimmy that such was the fact his lip quivered for an instant and his tongue refused its office then in a few well-chosen words he thanked the people for the undeserved surprise so far as he was himself concerned isaac was more worthy of such welcome he said and more than half of it was meant he knew for their townsman who had shown himself equally brave in camp in battle and in prison while had they known that lieutenant sims too was coming he was sure they would not have thought of him a stranger to them all the brief speech ended and rose listening at home clapped her hands in ecstasy as she heard the terrific cheers and caught the name of carleton mingled with isaac sims poor boy she said i wonder how he'll get home i wish i had told jimmy to drive that way and take him in the carriage she need have given herself no uneasiness for what she had forgotten was remembered by jimmy who after a hurried consultation with tom insisted that both isaac and his mother should take seats in the carriage while he and tom mingled with the crowd and your other son there's room for him he said looking round in quest of john who at the last moment had obtained permission to visit his bride and so came on with isaac at a glance his eye had singled out susan and the young couple were now standing apart from the rest exchanging mutual caresses and words of love the tall lieutenant kissing fondly the blushing girl who could not realize that she stood in the presence of her husband after a little it was decided that tom and jimmy mrs sims and isaac should occupy the carriage while john and susan walked and so from her lofty standpoint rose watched the long procession winding down the streets amid the strains of music and the cannon's bellowing roar it was very exciting to isaac and by the time the cottage was reached he was glad to be lifted out by jimmy who bore the tired boy tenderly into the house and laid him down on the soft warm bed he had dreamed about so many nights in the dark filthy prison corner how faint and weak he was and how glad to be home again winding his arms around his mother's neck he sobbed out his great joy saying amid his tears god was so kind to let me come back to you it was a very happy group the villagers left behind in that humble cottage and neither john nor susan thought it out of place when the mother called on them to kneel with her and thank the giver of all good for his great mercy in granting them this blessing meantime the procession passed on until it reached the mather mansion where with three cheers for captain carleton the crowd dispersed leaving tom at liberty to join the mother and sister waiting so impatiently for him one on the steps and the other in the parlor just where she had welcomed jimmy if will were only here it would be the happiest day i ever knew rose said as seating herself on tom's knee with her chubby arm around his neck she asked him numerous questions concerning her absent husband then as she saw in him signs of weariness she said you are tired i know suppose you go to your room till dinner-time it's the one right at the head of the stairs she continued and glad of an opportunity to rest tom went to the room where annie graham just then chanced to be 
she had discovered that the servant had neglected to supply the rack with towels and so she had brought them herself lingering a moment after they were arranged to see if everything were in order she did not hear tom's steps until he opened the door upon her and uttered an exclamation of surprise and apology he had no idea who the little black-robed figure was for though he knew the wife of george graham was an inmate of his sister's family he had her in his mind as a very different person from this one before him mrs graham was young he supposed and possibly good-looking but she did not bear the stamp of refinement and elegance which this graceful creature did and fancying he had made a mistake and stumbled into the apartment of some city visitor he was about to withdraw when annie came toward him saying excuse me sir i came in to see that all was all right in your room mr carleton i presume this last annie spoke doubtingly for in the tall handsome stranger before her there was scarcely a vestige of the grayish-haired oldish father-looking man she had in fancy known as captain carleton and but for the eyes so much like mrs mathers and the unmistakable carleton curve about the mouth she would never have dreamed that it was tom to whom she was speaking as it was she waited for him to confirm her suspicions which he did by bowing in the affirmative to her interrogation mr carleton i presume then holding the door for her to pass out he stood watching her till she disappeared at the extreme end of the hall wondering who she was and why a mere visitor should take so much interest in his room once he thought of annie graham but this could not be a widow though the deep mourning dress told of recent bereavement still annie graham was a different personage he knew and thus perplexed tom instead of resting commenced his toilet for dinner determining as soon as it was completed to go down and have the mystery unravelled restless and impatient to know just what his brother thought of his late treachery to the federal flag jimmy paced the parlors below until he could wait no longer and knowing by the sounds which came from the chamber above that tom was not trying to sleep he finally ran upstairs and knocking at the chamber door was soon closeted with tom it was an awkward business to speak of the past but jimmy plunged into it at once stating some reasons which had led him to abjure his own government expressing his contrition for having done so and ending by saying he hoped tom if possible would forget that he ever had a rebel brother it had taken tom a long time to recover from the shock of meeting his brother in the virginia woods and knowing he was a traitor to his country but the same generous feeling which led him to refrain from any allusion to that meeting in the messages sent to his mother and sister from his richmond prison now prompted him to treat with kind forbearance the brother whom he had loved and grieved over since the days of his mischievous boyhood i should have found it very hard to forgive you if you had stayed in the southern army he said but as it is we will never mention the subject again jimmy knew by the warm pressure of tom's hand that he was forgiven and with a burden lifted from his mind he was about leaving the room when tom with a preliminary cough said Ahem. by the way jimmy who has rose got here what visitor i mean and tom tried to look vastly indifferent as he buttoned his vest and hung across it the chain made from mary's hair but the ruse did not succeed jimmy knew he had seen annie and with a sudden uprising of something undefined he answered in apparent surprise visitor what visitor he must have come to-day then where did you see him i saw her in here tom replied and jimmy laughingly rejoined a pretty place for a her in your quarters pray what was she like some like mary as she used to be when i first knew her a little body dressed in black with large handsome blue eyes interrupted jimmy while tom without suspecting that his brother's object was to ascertain how closely he had observed the figure in black replied yes very handsome dreamy eyes and pale brown curls was the teasing jimmy's next query to which tom quickly responded curls no the hair was braided in white plaits and twisted around the head falling low in the neck not a very white neck was it jimmy continued with imperturbable gravity indeed it was tom said industriously scraping his thumb-nail with his penknife white as snow or looked so from the contrast with her dress who is she one question more had she big feet or little slippers or boots and this time jimmy's voice betrayed him tom knew he was being teased and bursting into a laugh he answered i confess to having observed her closely but not enough as to tell the size of her slipper come now who is she 
some lady you spirited away from secessiondom tell me you know you've nothing to fear from steady old tom for an instant the eyes of the two brothers met with a curious expression in each both were conscious of something they were trying to conceal while a feeling akin to a pang shot through jimmy's heart as he thought how much more worthy of annie graham's respect was steady old tom than a rollicking young scapegrace like himself from your rather minute description i think you must have stumbled upon the widow graham he said rose has taken her up you know and as a word of brotherly advice let me say that if you wish to raise rose to the seventh heaven you have only to praise her protege we that is the widow and i do not get on very well for she is a staunch patriot and until this morning i verily believe she looked on me as a kind of monster she's a perfect little puritan too and if she stays here long will make a straight-laced methodist of rose under the garb of an episcopalian of course as she is the strictest kind of churchwoman i shall not esteem her less for that tom said and in rather a perturbed state of mind as far as the widow graham was concerned he went with jimmy to the parlour half hoping his brother had mischievously misled him and that the stranger would prove after all to be some visitor from boston but the first object he saw in entering the parlour was the dainty figure in black standing by the window and on the third finger of the hand raised to adjust the heavy curtain glittered the wedding ring tom knew now that jimmy had not deceived him and with a feeling of disappointment he addressed mrs graham when introduced by jimmy making some playful allusion to their having met before but saying nothing to her then of george for remembering his own feelings when mary died he knew that annie would not thank him a stranger to bring up sad memories of the past by talking of her husband still in his manner toward her there was something which told how he pitied and sympathized with her and annie grateful always for the smallest kindness threw off her air of quiet reserve and talked with him freely asking many questions concerning isaac sims and the condition of the richmond prisoners generally she was going round after dinner to call on isaac she incidentally said whereupon tom rejoined that wishing to know how isaac bore the journey and the excitement he had intended going there himself and would with her permission time his visit to suit her convenience and so accompany her instantly jimmy's black eyes flashed upon annie a look of inquiry which brought the bright colour to her cheeks for she knew he was thinking of the night when she had refused his escort and she felt her present position a rather embarrassing one still the circumstances were entirely different there was a reason why tom should call on widow sims while with jimmy there was none and bowing to captain carleton she replied that she presumed mrs sims would be glad of an opportunity to thank him for his kindness to isaac and that though not in the least afraid to go alone she had no objection to showing him the way what going off the first night and they are coming to serenade you too you must not go tom shall he mother cried rose who at first had been too busy with her duties as hostess clearly to comprehend what tom was saying to annie it will look as if you do not appreciate the people's attention mrs carleton replied while jimmy vehemently protested against the impropriety of the act and so tom was compelled to yield thinking the while that a walk to the widow sims might possibly afford him quite as much satisfaction as staying at home for a serenade i always surrender to the majority he said playfully while jimmy's spirits rose perceptibly and annie had never before seen him so witty or gay since he came home from washington as he was during the dinner it was joy at his brother's return she thought never suspecting that tom's decision had anything to do with it and jimmy hardly knew himself that it had he only felt relieved that tom was not to receive a favour which had once been denied to himself and glad also that annie was to spend the evening with them but in this he was mistaken there was no necessity for annie's deferring her visit the serenade was not for her and with that nice sense of propriety which prompted her to shrink from anything like intrusion she felt that on this first night of their reunion the carleton family would rather be alone this rule would also apply to mrs sims but annie knew she was always welcome to the widow and wishing to see the boy who had led her husband from the battlefield she went to her room and throwing on her cloak and hood stood quietly downstairs just as jimmy was crossing the hall he guessed where she was going and coming quickly to her side said i suppose you'd had given up that call but if you persist in going it must not be alone this night of all others when the streets are likely to be full of men and boys you accepted my brother's escort you cannot of course refuse mine and seizing his hat from the hall stand he led her out upon the steps and placed her arm in his with an air of so much authority that annie had no word to offer in remonstrance 
it was not a very comfortable walk to either party or a very sociable one either but ere it was ended and he had reason to be glad that she was not alone for as jimmy had predicted the streets were full of men and boys following the band up to the mather mansion and as they met group after group of the noisy throng annie timidly drew closer to her companion who pressed more tightly the arm trembling in his own i am glad you came with me she said when at last the friendly gleam of the widow's candle appeared in view but if you please i think you had better not go in to-night you are so much a stranger to the family and mrs sim's boys have but just returned john will see me safely home and i'll excuse you now you must feel anxious to rejoin your brother but jimmy was not to be disposed of so easily he had no intention of entering the house but he should wait outside he said until annie's visit was over and he had no alternative save submission and parting from jimmy at the gate she hurried up the walk and was soon bending over the couch of the sick boy whose eyes beamed the welcome his pale lips could scarcely speak how many questions she had to ask him and how much he had to tell her of that day when her husband received his fatal wound altogether it was a sad interview and annie's eyes were nearly blistered with the hot tears she shed while listening to isaac's touching account of george ere the woods were gained and tom carleton generously giving up his seat to the bleeding man thereby becoming himself a prisoner much too was said in praise of tom and annie felt that she could not do too much for one who had shown himself so generous and brave talking of tom reminded her of jimmy stalking up and down the icy walks waiting patiently for her and when at last the music of tom's serenade had ceased she arose to go wishing to get away ere the band came there as she knew they were intending to do as john arose to accompany her she had to say that jimmy carleton was waiting for her by the gate instantly the sharp eyes of the widow shot at her a curious glance which brought the hot blood to her cheek while john and susan exchanged a smile the meaning of which she could not fail to understand poor annie her heart throbbed with pain as she guessed of what they were thinking could they for a moment believe her so heartless and cold the mere idea made her dizzy and faint and scarcely articulating her good-night she hastened out into the cool night air feeling half tempted to refuse outright the arm offered for her support if she only dared tell him to leave her there alone leave her to flee away through the dark lonely streets to the still more lonely yard where on george's grave she could lay herself down and die but not thus easily could life's heavy burden be shaken off she could not lay it down at will and conquering the emotions which each time she thought of john sim's significant smile threatened to burst out into a fierce storm of passionate sobs she apologized for having kept jimmy waiting so long and taking his arm left the cottage gate just as the throng of serenaders turned into that street jimmy knew she had been crying and conjecturing that she had been talking of her husband he too began to speak of george asking her many questions about him and repeating many things he had heard in his praise from the rockland citizens it seemed strange that this should comfort her but it did the hard bitter feeling insensibly passed away while listening to jimmy and by the time the mather mansion was reached the tears were dried on annie's cheeks and outwardly she was cheerful and patient as ever after that night rose had no cause for complaint that jimmy was rude to annie or annie cool toward him for though annie talked to him but little she did not forget the sympathy so delicately manifested for her and treated him with as much respect as she awarded tom who grew each day more and more interested in the black-robed figure reminding him so much of his lost mary jimmy knew he did and watched narrowly for the time when she would know it too but such time did not come for annie had no suspicion that either of the brothers regarded her with the shadow of a feeling save that of ordinary friendship as much of her time as possible was spent with the widow sims and a great part of isaac's visible improvement was owing to her gentle care and the sunshine of her presence john's furlough had expired and now that he was gone the disconsolate susan turned to annie for comfort while isaac watched daily for the sound of the little feet coming up the walk and bringing with them so much happiness to the lonely cottage i wish you'd stay home more we miss you so much and it's so dismal without you mother nods over her knitting tom just walks the floor or reads some stiff presbyterian book while jimmy thrums the piano and teases my kitten awfully rose said to annie one night when the latter came in from a tour of calls the last of which had been on mrs baker now a much happier better woman than when we first made her acquaintance it's so different when you are here rose continued as annie came and sat down by her side 
tom is a heap more entertaining while jimmy is not half so mischievous and provoking i did not suppose my absence could affect your happiness or i would certainly have stayed with you more annie replied and rose continued well it just does and now that both tom and jimmy are going so soon i shall need you to oversee the things i must get ready for them captain carleton and jimmy going away soon annie repeated in some surprise where are they going the captain's furlough has not yet expired i know it rose continued but as he is perfectly well he thinks it's right to go back and has fixed on one week from to-day yes but jimmy you spoke of his leaving too annie said and rose rejoined jimmy is going with tom to join the federal army on the potomac and as he says retrieve if possible the character he lost by turning traitor once oh i am so glad and i like him so much for that annie exclaimed her white face lighting up with a sudden animation which made it seem very beautiful to the young man just entering the door i would brave the cannon's mouth for another look like that was jimmy's mental comment as he stepped into the room and advanced to the lady's side so you are glad i'm going he said half playfully to annie who answered frankly yes very glad and won't you miss me a bit folks like to be missed you know if they are ever so bad it makes one think better of himself and consequently do better if he knows that his absence will cause a feeling of regret however slight to the friends left behind jimmy remarked while in his eyes there was a peculiar expression which annie failed to see as he stood looking down upon her she would miss jimmy she knew for she had become accustomed to his merry whistle his ringing laugh his teasing jokes at rose's expense and his going would leave them very lonely and so she frankly admitted adding that it was not because she wished to be rid of him that she was glad it pleased her to see him in the path of duty even though that path led to danger and possible death oh don't annie don't talk of death to jimmy rose cried with a shudder you can't begin to guess how it makes me feel or how terrible it would seem if either he or tom should die can't i annie asked with such a depth of mournful pathos that rose's tears flowed at once of course annie knew how it felt and every fibre of her heart was bleeding now as she remembered one who left her as full of life and hope as either tom or jimmy but who came back no more save as the dead come back shrouded and coffined for the grave but annie would not give way to her own feelings then she would comfort rose and encourage the young man who she felt shrank from the perils spread out before him so she told how few there were comparatively who died on the battlefield while the chances for life in the hospitals were greater now that better care and skill had been procured annie excuse me mrs graham and jimmy spoke vehemently while his eyes kindled with a strange gleam why don't you go as a nurse you might be the means of untold good to the poor fellows who need such care as you could give i have thought of it said annie while rose exclaimed you turn hospital nurse ridiculous you never shall so long as i can prevent it shall she tom and she appealed to the latter who had just come in shall annie go into those horrid hospitals i am not mrs graham's keeper tom replied but i should be sorry to see her acting in the capacity of hospital nurse even though i know that some of our noblest best women are engaged in that work yes old chap and jimmy laughed a merry laugh it's mighty easy talking that way now but suppose you captain carleton are some day among the terribly wounded thigh shot through arm splintered above the elbow jawbone broken and all that wouldn't the pain be easier to bear if the nurse should happen to be mrs graham or somebody just like her undoubtedly it would tom answered still i should be sorry to have her there amid the sickening horrors please stop i can't bear to hear about it rose exclaimed i know it would be nice to be a florence nightingale and annie would make a splendid one but i'll never let her go unless you or jimmy or will are wounded and then we'll come together won't we annie there was no response from annie until jimmy said say mrs graham if i am ever wounded and you hear i am suffering in some dismal hole will you come and care for me he did not join will's or tom's name with his own it was jimmy carleton whom annie was to nurse but it did not matter lifting up her head so that her soft blue eyes looked into his annie answered unhesitatingly 
providence permitting i will and i would do the same for any brave fellow who follows as my husband did where duty to his country leads so you see you will fare no better than i after all tom laughingly rejoined while jimmy thought within himself why need she always bring that husband in it's bad enough to know she's had one without eternally hearing about him foolish jimmy it was folly for him to lie awake so long as he did that night or to dream when at last he slept of hospital walls expanding into a palace as an angel form with hair and eyes like annie's bent over his feverish pillow while soft white hands dressed some gaping wound where the enemy's bullet had been sheer folly too was it for dignified old tom to watch from his window the young moon until it set in the western sky thinking of mary as he tried to make himself believe wondering why it was that annie reminded him so much of her and why he should be so deeply interested in one who until a few weeks past had been to him a stranger to annie captain carleton and jimmy were nothing more than friends and if during the week preceding their departure she was quite as busy as rose and apparently as much interested in the various preparations for their comfort it was only because they were soldiers and not as widow sims once suggested to susan because they were carletons and handsome and rich and well there's no tellin what will happen when a widder's young and handsome but this i know i've never married and my man's been dead this nineteen years nobody need tell me she'd be so busy for anybody but them carletons if twas the captain i wouldn't mind but that sassy face jeems ugh and in her ire at annie's supposed preference for sassy faced jeems the widow spilled more than half of the spiced chocolate she was carrying to isaac never was the widow more mistaken annie graham would have done for eli john and isaac sims or possibly william baker the same offices she was doing for the carletons and her voice would have been just as sweet and hopeful when she bade them farewell as it was that bright spring morning when in the parlour of the mather mansion tom and jimmy were waiting to say good-bye at the very last moment bill baker had announced his intention of going too thirteen dollars a month in dog's fare was better than layin around home he said and livin on the old gal who was gettin most too straight and blue for his notions besides that he felt kind attached to the corporal and wanted to be where he could see him and wait on him like any other nigger jimmy would gladly have dispensed with such a singular attache but bill could not be shaken off and as he did in various ways evince a strong regard for his former captive jimmy was forced to submit to what he termed his thorn in the flesh giving from his own purse money for billy's outfit and furnishing the mother with means to repair her dwelling and make it far more comfortable than at present this he was sure pleased annie and no sacrifice was too costly if it won her regard she had prayed for him he knew for rose had told him so and prayers like hers though they did not avail to save her george's life would surely shield him from danger he should come back again when the war was over come back to find an older grave by rockland's churchyard gate while the wife who daily watered that grave with tears would be as young as beautiful and far more girlish looking than now when in her widow's weed she offered him her hand at parting bidding god speed to him and the noble tom who stood beside him there were tears and kisses and blessings from rose and her mother a few low-spoken words of sympathy and goodwill from annie and the two young men were gone half an hour later and the eastern train thundered through the town bearing away to the fields of bloody carnage three more young vigorous lives and leaving desolate two homes one the lonely cottage where bill's mother wept alone the other the mather mansion where mrs carleton and rose sobbed bitterly while annie strove in various ways to comfort them End of chapter nineteen Chapters twenty and twenty one of Rose Mather, a tale by Mary Jane Holmes. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Twenty at the Mather Mansion. It was very lonely at the Mather Mansion after the departure of the soldiers, and it required all Annie's tact to keep Rose from sinking entirely under the sense of desolation which crept over her as she began more and more to realize what the war meant and to tremble for the safety of her husband and her brothers they were still in washington but they might be ordered to advance at any moment and in a tremor of distress rose waited and watched for every mail which could bring her tidings of them next to her husband's letters jimmy's did her the most good for jimmy had in his nature a world of hopefulness and humour 
and his letters were full of fun and quaint description of the life he was leading and still of the three young men will mather tom carleton and jimmy the latter suffered the most acutely for in addition to his dislike of military life he was compelled to endure the jokes and jeers which the coarser and more unfeeling of his comrades heaped upon him when from bill baker they heard that his first experience in arms-bearing had been learned in the army of the enemy to one of bill's instincts it seemed a great thing that he had captured and brought to washington so illustrious a prisoner as the corporal as he persisted in calling him and the story was repeated with such wonderful additions that jimmy when once by accident he was a listener to the tale failed utterly to recognize himself in the chap who had run so many miles from and then fought so many hours with the redoubtable bill who while annoying his quondam captive so terribly still under all circumstances evinced for him an attachment as singular as it was sincere everything which he could do for jimmy he did becoming literally his servant and drudge and thus saving him from many a hardship which as a private he would otherwise have encountered it was a fancy of jimmy's that by serving as a private in the army against which his hand had once been lifted he should in some way expiate his sin and perhaps be sure of winning favour from annie graham whose blue eyes were constantly before him just as they had looked when in her dress of black she stood in the spring sunshine bidding him good-bye soon after his arrival in washington he had been offered a second lieutenancy in captain carleton's company but he steadily declined the office giving no explanation to any one except his brother and sister rose to whom he wrote perhaps i was foolish to decline the offer and for a moment i was horribly tempted to accept it especially when by doing so i could to some degree escape my thorn in the flesh who notwithstanding that he does me many a kindness annoys me excessively but i could not feel that i deserved that post it ought to belong to someone who had never spurned the old flag and so i stood firm and suggested as a substitute that other sims chap from rockland hophney or phineas or eli hanged if i know what his name is anyway he is that crabbed widow's son that used to pucker her mouth so when she saw that young reb of a carleton and snatch away her gown for fear it should hit me i reckon he'll get the office with its twelve hundred a year which he can use for his mother's support one of her sons you know is married and as good as lost to her while that boy isaac is not long for this world prison life at richmond did the business for him or i'm mistaken so let eli be lieutenant and james carleton only a private do you think i did right and will that paragon of yours mistress graham think so too this was what jimmy wrote to rose after he had been gone for three or four weeks and what rose with her usual impetuous thoughtlessness read to her mother and annie who were both in her room when the letter came annie had made an attempt to leave but rose had insisted that there could be no secret in jimmy's letter if there was she would skip it she said and she read on stumbling dreadfully and mispronouncing words for jimmy's handwriting was never very plain and this letter written with a soft lead pencil with a bit of slate stone for a table was his very worst she made out however that he had declined the office of second lieutenant because he thought he did not deserve it that he had named eli sims as a fitter person for it than himself and that he had called the widow a crab-apple or something like it all this was very clear and after exclaiming against jimmy's morbid sense of justice in one breath and pronouncing him perfectly splendid in another she kept on till she reached the paragon which she rendered pequot making the sentence read will that pequot of yours mistress graham think i did right what did he call me annie exclaimed her face turning very white as she leaned toward rose who startled at her vehemence tried again to make out the word which was strangely distorted from the fact that just as jimmy was writing it his shadow bill had struck him familiarly upon the shoulder saying with a laugh writin to your gal i s'pose give her bill baker's regrets it looks like pequot and some like patagonian rose said deciding at last that it was paragon and adding by way of an explanation to herself of annie's evident surprise you did not like the idea of his calling you a pequot did you annie it wouldn't have meant anything if he had and it was natural that i should make the blunder for that's the name he gave the young girl at the pequot house the one he liked and to whom he passed himself off as dick lee you remember i told you about her yes i remember and annie's voice was a little husky the little girl who was not happy with her aunt and so listened the more willingly to the boy's kind winning words annie did not know why she said that unless it were wrung from her by some sudden and bitter memory of what had been a bright sunspot in her cheerless childhood 
when the pequot girl was mentioned in her presence once before she had gathered that it was mostly mrs carleton's pride which had taken the boy away from any more rambles on the beach or moonlight sails upon the bay and perhaps it was a desire to defend and excuse the girl which prompted her to advance a reason why dick lee's attentions had been so acceptable she would have given much to recall her words which made mrs carleton dart a quick curious glance at her while rose exclaimed how do you know she was not happy with her aunt did jimmy ever tell you about her never annie replied feeling glad that a servant appeared just at that moment telling rose a little girl was in the kitchen asking to see her it was a daughter of one of the soldiers whose mother was sick and had sent to mrs mather for some little delicacy such calls were frequent at the mather house for the soldiers did not receive their pay regularly and there was much destitution among their families who but for rose's liberality would have suffered far more than they did as freely as water her money was used to relieve their wants and now forgetting jimmy and his pequot she entered at once into the little girl's story and when told that the sick woman had expressed a wish to see her she said i'll go now there's jake just come in i'll have him harness the horses and take you home it must be a mile or more to your house rose usually acted upon her impulses and was soon in her carriage with a huge basket at her feet and the little girl opposite enjoying her ride so much and enjoying it the more for the unmistakable signs of envy and wonder which she detected in the faces of her companions as she neared her humble home in the hollow rose had asked both her mother and annie to accompany her but they had declined and for a time after rose's departure they sat together in perfect silence while a curious train of thought was passing through the minds of each annie's agitation when rose read pequot for paragon had surprised mrs carleton while what she had said of the girl and her aunt had awakened a feeling of disquiet and suspicion mrs carleton was proud of her own and her husband's family proud of her wealth and proud of her position not offensively so but in that quiet assured kind of way so natural to the highly bred bostonian it was this pride which had prompted her to resort to so extreme measures with the boy jimmy when she found how much he was interested in the little pequot and when during jimmy's brief stay in rockland she with a mother's quick intuition detected in him signs of interest in annie graham her pride again took fright and she was half glad to have him go from the possible temptation something in the nobler part of the woman's nature told her how wrong the feeling was while each day some new development of annie's gentle christian character made the desolate young creature dearer to her that she was superior to most people in her rank of life mrs carleton knew and she had more than once wondered how one like her had ever become the wife of a mechanic she was not thinking of this however on the afternoon when she was alone with annie while rose was away on her errand of mercy she was thinking rather of the suspicion which had just found a lodgment in her mind and was devising some means of testing its reality to this end she at last made some casual remark about rockland and its people asking if annie had always lived there only since i was married was the reply and mrs carleton continued you seem more like eastern people than like a new yorker were you born in new england yes in connecticut annie said and then mrs carleton made a great blunder by asking next were you born in or near new london i have been there several times and may know your family at mention of new london annie's eyes flashed upon mrs carleton with a startled look as if she felt that there was a deeper meaning in the questioning to which she was being subjected than appeared on the surface and her voice trembled a little as she replied i was born in hartford and lived there till i was eight years old when my parents both died of cholera in one day and i went to live with my aunt in new haven yes mrs carleton answered slowly thus far there was quite as much to prove as there was to disprove the correctness of her surmise and thinking to herself i may as well go further now i have commenced with being rude she continued pardon me mrs graham if i seem inquisitive but i cannot help feeling interested in one to whom rose is so greatly attached and i do not remember that i ever heard any of your history before your husband went to war i do not even know your maiden name annie's heart beat almost audibly and her cheeks were very red as she replied my father was dr howard and i was annie louise howard excuse me mrs carleton if i cannot talk much of my girl life after my parents died it was not a happy one 
i was wholly dependent upon my aunt who while giving me every advantage in the way of education kept before me so constantly the fact that i was an object of charity that it embittered every moment of my life and when george offered me his love i accepted it gladly finding in him the only real friend i had known since the day i was an orphan annie was crying now and excusing herself she left the parlour and repaired to her own room where her excitement spent itself in tears and sobs as she recalled all the dreadful years when she was subject to the caprices of the most capricious of women who had attempted to force her into a marriage with a millionaire of sixty and had driven her to accept the love which george graham had offered her george had not been her equal in an intellectual point of view and none knew this fact better than annie herself but he was the kindest tenderest of husbands and she had loved him devotedly for the manly virtues which made him the noble and selfish man he was captain carleton and jimmy both could sympathize with her tastes and inclinations far better than george had done but never once during her brief married life had she allowed herself to wonder what her lot might have been had it been cast with people like the carletons and since her husband's death anything which looked away from that grave by the churchyard gate seemed so terrible to her that now as she recalled mrs carleton's questionings and guessed what had prompted them every nerve quivered with pain which could only be soothed by a visit to george's grave there on the turf which covered him she had wept out many a grief and she started for it now the villagers watching her as she passed their doors and curiously speculating as people will upon the time to come when the long black dress and graceful girlish form would not be so often seen among the rockland dead already the gossips of the town were coupling her name with the carletons the majority giving her to tom the elder and more worthy of the two a whisper of this gossip had been borne to mrs carleton who while pretending to ignore it had felt troubled as she recalled all the incidents of jimmy's visit at home then when the suspicion came to her that the woman whom rose had taken into her household was possibly identical with the girl of new london whose name she could not remember she felt for a moment greatly disturbed there was a fierce struggle with her pride a close reasoning with herself and then her better nature triumphed and her heart went out very kindly toward poor annie at that moment standing by her husband's grave and wondering why her thoughts would keep straying away to the wayward young man who had been a traitor to his country but was trying to atone by voluntarily bearing the hardships of a private's life when a better was offered him he had asked if she would think he did right and the question had shown that he cared for her good opinion yes she did think he was right and she resolved to send him a message to that effect when rose wrote to him next there was no wrong to the dead in the thought and her tears dropped just as fast upon the marble as she stood to kiss the name cut upon it and then left the silent graveyard meantime rose had visited her sick woman in the hollow had fed the hungry children and dropped upon the floor the six weeks baby which she tried to hold then gathering her shawl about her and holding up her skirts just as she always did when in the homes of the poor she re-entered her carriage and bade jake drive her next to widow sims everything there was neat and clean as soap and sand and the widow's two hands could make it while susan made a very pretty picture in her dark stuff gown with a scarlet velvet ribbon in her black hair there was a saucer of english violets on the round deal table and their sweet perfume filled the room into which rose came dancing her eyes shining like stars and her cheeks so brilliant a colour that the widow began directly to wonder if there wasn't some paint there the widow was not in her best mood for she was very tired having done a heavy washing in the morning before rose mather had thought of opening her bright eyes then after the coarser larger pieces were dried and ironed she had tried to spin a work to which she clung as tenaciously as if on every stream in new england there was not a cotton or woollen factory capable of doing the work so much easier and better than herself the widow was fond of spinning and she had turned the wheel with a right good will until isaac had complained that the continuous humming hurt his head and made him think of the wind as it howled so dismally around the dreary prison in richmond libby they called it now and isaac always shuddered when he heard the name and thought of what he suffered there isaac was very weak and pale and his face looked like that of some young girl as he lay among his pillows in the pretty dressing-gown which rose had bought and annie had made for him he was sleeping when rose came in and the widow's sh came warningly as a greeting but came too late for rose's blithesome voice had roused him and his glad welcoming smile more than counterbalanced the frown which settled on the widow's face when she saw her boy disturbed 
rose was accustomed to the widow's ways and throwing off her shawl and untying her hat she sat down on the foot of isaac's bed and drawing jimmy's letter from her pocket she began i've got such splendid news for you mrs sims at least i think i have yes i know it's sure to come true eli is going to be a lieutenant with twelve hundred dollars a year such a heap of money for him and it's all jimmy's doings too he would not have the office because he did not think he deserved it listen to what he says both the widow and susan were close to rose now the frown all gone from the widow's brow and the pucker from her mouth but both came back in a trice as blundering rose read on about huffney and phineas and eli till she came to the crabbed which she called crab-apple and then stopped short her face a perfect blaze as she tried to apologize tain't worth while to soap it over the widow said fiercely i be a crab-apple i s'pose and a gnarly one at that but i am as i was made and i'd like to know if crabs wasn't as good as secessioners please mother never mind isaac said pleadingly and his voice always quieted the fiery woman who listened while rose read of eli's good fortune and made another terrible mistake by stumbling upon jimmy's opinion of isaac's sickness she only read he is not long for this world but that was enough to bring a flush to his brow and blanch his mother's cheek while with a gush of tears rose hid her face in susan's lap and sobbed i wish i had not come i'm always doing wrong when i mean to do the best oh i wish the war had never been and i don't believe isaac is so sick jimmy has no right to judge he don't know rose's distress was too genuine not to touch the widow who tried to appear calm and unconcerned and even said something kind of jimmy who had so generously preferred eli to himself but there was a restraint over everything and after a few awkward attempts at something like natural conversation rose bade a hasty good-bye and went out from the house to which she had brought more sorrow than joy twenty one not long for this world the sick boy whispered the words a great many times to himself as with his face to the wall where neither his mother nor susan could see it he thought of what rose had read and wondered if it were true he was not afraid to die he had been very near death once before and had not shrunk from meeting it as death it was only the dying from home he had dreaded so much asking to live till he could see his mother again and the grass growing by the cottage door and the violets by the well and god had taken him at his word he had lived to see his mother to feel the touch of her rough hands upon his hair to hear her voice always kind to him calling him her ikey boy to see the green grass by the door and the violets by the well but this alas did not suffice he wanted to live longer live to be a man like eli and john live to do good live to take care of his mother live to hear the notes of victory borne on the northern breeze as the federal flag floated again over land and sea all this was worth living for and isaac was young to die only nineteen and looking three years younger it was very hard and the dark eyelashes closed tightly to keep back the tears as the white lips tried to pray thy will be done that was what they meant to utter but there came instead the first words of the prayer the saviour taught our father that was all but the very name of father brought a deep peace into isaac's heart god was his father and he had nothing to fear living or dying it would be well with the boy who would not tell a lie even for promotion and so while the mother whose heart ached and throbbed with this new fear and still found time to fill a thrill of pride in lieutenant eli moved softly around the room preparing the dainty supper for her child isaac slept peacefully nor woke until the delicate repast was ready and waiting for him on the little table by the bed there was spiced chocolate to-night and nice cream toast with grape jelly and a bit of cold baked chicken and the highly seasoned cucumber pickles isaac had craved so much since his return and which the physician said were good for him and the best china cup was brought out and the silver spoons marked with the widow's maiden name and a white napkin was on the tray and isaac who enjoyed such things knew why it was all done that particular night just as the widow knew why at bedtime he asked susan to read from revelation chapter seven verse sixteen they shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat 
for the lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters and god shall wipe away all tears from their eyes he was thinking of his heavenly home while the mother was thinking of the time when he who jimmy carleton had said was not long for earth would be gone and she could no longer do for him the little offices which gave her so much comfort since the dreadful days when she knew her boy was in prison the widow had not felt so keen a pang as that which stirred her heart-strings now when alone in her room she dropped in her quick defiant way into the high-backed chair and sitting stiff and straight tried to face the future it could not be that isaac had only come home to die god would not deal thus harshly with her he had spared eli and john he had promoted them both and he would not take isaac from her the boy was getting better he was mending every day or at least she had thought so until rose mather came with her message of evil why could not rose have stayed at home why need she come there and leave such a sting behind the widow was growing very hard and wicked toward poor little thoughtless rose and her heart lay like a stone in her bosom as for an hour or more she sat in her high-backed chair thinking of the boy whose low breathing she could hear from the next room he was sleeping she thought and she would steal softly to his side and see if it was written on his face that his days were numbered but isaac was not asleep and he knew the moment his mother bent over him and turning toward her he whispered i know why you are up so late mother and what you are here for you are thinking of what mrs carleton said and wondering if it is true i guess tis mother for i don't get any stronger and my cough hurts me so but i'm not a bit afraid to die now with you beside me up to the very last minute in richmond it was different and i prayed so hard that god would let me come back if only to drink from the well and then die on the grass beside it he did let me come and now we mustn't say anything if he does not let me stay but a little bit of a while i've been thinking it over since mrs mather went away and at first it seemed hard that eli and john should have such good luck and only stub to be the one to suffer he said this last playfully using his old nickname stub because he saw by the dim light burning on the table the bitter look of anguish upon his mother's face and he would fain remove it at the mention of the name which her more stalwart sons had given to her baby the widow's chin quivered and her rough hand smoothed the thin light hair but she did not speak and isaac went on then too i want to live till the war is over i want to hear the joyful shouts and see the bonfires they will kindle in the streets there's a big box in the barn i hid it there the morning i went away and i said when the peace comes we can burn that box and mother will look out from the window and the church bells will ring and there'll be such rejoicings now i most know i shan't be here to see it but mother you'll burn the box you and susan with eli and john and you'll think of me who did what i could to bring the peace there was a choking sound like the swallowing of a great sob and that was all the answer the widow made only her hands moved faster through the threads of light brown hair and her rigid form sat up straighter more rigid than ever she was suffering the fiercest pang she would ever know for she was giving isaac up she was coming to the knowledge that he was really going from her that jimmy carleton was right and isaac was not long for this world when at last her mind reached that point the tension of nerve gave way for a little and her hot tears poured over the white face she kissed so tenderly the moon was looking in at the low west window ere the widow went back to her own bed and isaac nestling down among his pillows fell away to sleep dreaming of the bonfire in the street when the hidden box was burned and dreaming too of that other world which lies so near this that he could almost see the loving hand stretched out to welcome him after that night the widow's mouth shut together more firmly than ever and the frown between her eyes was more marked and decided while her manner to all save isaac and annie graham was sharper and crisper than before when eli's letter came telling of his promotion and lauding jimmy carleton whose generous act was a byword in the company her face relaxed a little and she said to annie graham the lord is good to my two oldest boys but if he'd give me isaac i wouldn't care for all the titles in christendom as the warm weather came on isaac did not get up any more to sit by the open door but lay all day on his bed sometimes sleeping sometimes thinking and sometimes listening while annie read to him from the bible 
Isaac was very fond of Annie. She had been George Graham's wife, and he evinced so much desire to have her constantly with him that at last she stayed altogether with Mrs. Sims, only going occasionally to the Mather mansion where they missed her so much. Rose was nothing without her, and at first opposed her going to the widow Sims. If help was needed, she said, she would hire someone, for Annie must not tire herself out just as she was beginning to grow plump and beautiful again. But when Isaac said to her, Please let Mrs. Graham come. It will not be long she'll have to stay, and she is so full of hope and faith that it makes me more willing to die and to go away alone across the Jordan. She withdrew her opposition, and Annie was free to go and come as she liked. It suited Annie to get away from the Mather mansion just then, for she could not help feeling that there was a purpose in Mrs. Carleton's questioning her of her early history, and she hailed any excuse which removed her from the scrutiny with which since that conversation touching her early home and maiden name Mrs. Carleton had evidently regarded her. Jimmy had written to her once, enclosing the unsealed note in a letter to Rose, and Annie's cheeks had been all ablaze as she read it, for she knew the mother's eyes were fastened upon her it was nothing but a simple acknowledgment of some article annie had made and sent to him in a box filled for all three of the soldiers will mather tom and jimmy there was also mention made of annie's kindly message to the intent that she did think he was right in giving the office to eli and a wish expressed that she would write to him you don't know how much good letters from home do such scamps as we privates are or how we need something from the civilized world to keep us from turning heathens Tom, too, had sent thanks to Annie Graham for the needle-book made for him, but he did not write to her, though every letter had in it more or less of Mrs. Graham, and Mrs. Carleton, while saying to herself, Both my boys have fallen under the spell, felt her pride gradually giving way and her heart growing warmer toward the woman whom she missed so much during the week spent at Isaac's bedside. They were not many, for when the dry days of August came on and the grass withered by the door, and the flowers drooped for want of rain and the sun rose each morning redder hotter than on the previous day the sick boy began to fail rapidly and one night just as the wind was beginning to blow from the west where a bank of dark clouds was lying he whispered to annie call mother and susan for i know i'm going now the widow was in the back yard putting out the barrels and tubs to catch the rain if it came for the well and the cistern were nearly dry just as her dim eyes were when a few minutes after she bent over her boy and saw the change coming so rapidly she could not weep and susan's sobs annoyed her twas like them rugglesses to go into hysterics and make a fuss she thought with a kind of bitter scorn for her daughter-in-law who loved isaac as a brother and wept that he was leaving them Perhaps the dying boy detected the feeling, for he said feebly, Go out, Susan, and Mrs. Graham both. I want to be alone with Mother a minute. Then, when they were alone, he said, I am dying, Mother, and I know you won't be angry at what I say. I want you to be kind to Susan, and pet her some and love her for John's sake. She is a good girl, and Mr. Carlton's good, too, the one they call Jimmy, I mean. Don't say harsh things of him because he was once a rebel. Don't speak against him to Mrs. Graham. Maybe she will like him sometime, and if so, help her mother instead of hindering it. Jimmy Carleton, on his lone picket watch that night on the banks of the Potomac, and thinking, alas, more of a black-robed figure with braids of pale brown hair than of a lurking foe, little dreamed of the good words spoken for him by the dying boy, whose eyes turned lovingly to Annie when she came back to him and held his clammy hand. It is not dark, it is not hard. I am not afraid, for the Saviour is with me, he kept repeating, and then he sent messages to his absent brothers to captain tom carleton who had been so kind to him in prison and to jimmy too and all the boys who had been with him in battle and then just as the wind began to roar down the chimney and the refreshing rain to beat against the windows isaac's spirit went out into the great unknown expanse beyond this life and only the pale emaciated body was left in the humble room where the lone woman stood looking upon the boyish face which seemed so young in death the widow uttered no sound when she knew he was dead, and it was her hand which drew the covering decently about him, and then picked up from the floor a loose feather which had dropped from the worn pillow. Susan must speak to their next-door neighbors, she said, and ask them to care for the body. 
then when the men came in she remembered an open window in the back chamber where the rain must be driving in and stole up there on the pretence of shutting it but she did not return till the men were gone and isaac was lying on the calico-covered lounge with a look of perfect peace upon his face and the damp night air blowing softly across his light hair kneeling at his side and laying her hard cheek against the icy face of her last-born the mother gave vent to her grief in her own peculiar way there were no tears or sobs but loving tender cooing words whispered over the boy as if he had been a living baby instead of a soldier dead and yet the fact that it was a soldier lying there before her was never lost sight of and the bitter part of the woman's nature was stirred to its very depths as she remembered what had brought her boy to this it was the war and fierce were the mental denunciations against those who had stirred up the strife while with the bitterness came pitying thoughts of the poor boys who died in the lonely hospitals or on the battlefields and with her cheek still resting against the pale clammy one and her fingers threading the light hair the widow vowed that all she was and all she had should henceforth be given to the war she would work for the soldiers give to the soldiers deny herself food and raiment for the soldiers i even die for them if need be and whispering the vow into her dead boy's ear she left him there alone just as the early summer dawn was breaking and when next morning her friends came in to see her they found her sitting by the body and working upon the shirt she had a few days before taken from the aid society to make for some poor wretch she should not wear mourning she said she had other uses for her money and so the leghorn of many years date with the old faded green veil followed isaac sims to the grave and the widow's face was still and stony as if cut from solid marble they made him a great funeral too though not so great as george graham's had been for isaac was not the second nor the third nor the fourth soldier buried in rockland's churchyard but he was isaac sims little ike stubb whom everybody liked and so the firemen came out to do him honour and the rockland guards and the company of young lads who were beginning to drill and the boys from the academy and rose mather was chief directress and her carriage carried the widow and susan and annie and herself up to the newly made grave where they left the boy who once had sawed wood for the little lady now paying him such honour the war was a great leveller of rank bringing together in one common cause the high and the low the rich and the poor and in no one was this more strikingly seen than in the case of rose mather who utterly forgetful of the days when as rose carleton of boston she would scarcely have deigned to notice such as the widow sims now sought in so many ways to comfort the stricken woman going every day to her humble home and once coaxing her to spend a day at the mather mansion together with susan whom rose secretly thought a little insipid and dull susan's husband was alive and in the full flush of prosperity so susan did not need sympathy but the widow did and rose got her up to the great house as the widow called it and ordered a most elaborate dinner with soups and fish and roasts and salads prepared with oil which turned the widow's stomach and ices and chocolate and charlotte russe and nuts and fruit and coffee served in cups the size of an acorn the widow thought as very red in the face and perspiring at every pore she went through the dreadful dinner which lasted nearly three hours and left her at its conclusion weak as water and sweatin like rain as she whispered to annie who took the tired woman for a few moments into her own room and listened patiently to the comments upon the grand dinner which had so nearly been the death of her susan on the contrary enjoyed it it was her first glimpse of life among the very wealthy and while her mother-in-law was wondering how annie could stand such doin's every day and especially that bombable soup and still was salute susan was thinking how she should like to live in just such style and wondering if when john came home with his wages all saved she could not set up housekeeping somewhat on the mather order at least she would have those little coffees after dinner though she doubted john's willingness to sit quietly until the coffee was reached it was a long day to the widow and the happiest part of it was the going home by the cemetery where she stopped at isaac's grave and bending over the turf murmured her tender words of love and sorrow for the boy who slept beneath there was a plan forming in the widow's mind and it came out at last to annie who was visiting her one day the hospitals were full to overflowing and the cry all along the lines was for more help to care for the sick and dying and the widow was going as nurse either in the hospital or in the field she would prefer the latter she said for only folks with pluck could stand it there 
and annie encouraged her to go and even talked of going too but the first suggestion of the plan brought such a storm of opposition from rose that for a little time longer annie yielded resolving however that ere long she would break away and take her place where she felt that she could do more good than she was doing in rockland End of chapters twenty and twenty one